This is Audible. Dragon Emperor Three: Human to Dragon to God, written by Eric Vall, narrated by Alex Peron and Marissa Parnes. Chapter One. You're almost fully recovered from the death curse, Valera. I pulled my hand back from the forehead of the dangerously beautiful woman lying on the bed in front of me. Still, you shouldn't be fighting anyone or anything for a few weeks. We don't know if there will be any after effects or complications from removing the curse, and that's not just coming from King Rodion and me. Even the princess agrees. No transforming back or straining yourself until we give you a clean bill of health. Valera was the only other dragon I'd met after coming to the world of Anati, and her human form showed evidence of her true nature. The features of her face were sharp and almost exotic, and the pupils of her amber eyes were cat-like as they glowed in the room. Scales dotted her skin, exposed by the simple nightgown she wore, and they were the same crimson color as her hair. The tips of two pointed fangs poked out between her luscious lips, and her hands were tipped by razor-sharp claws. How annoying you all are! Valera breathed out, and strands of crimson hair fluttered around her face. This is one of the reasons why I never left my canyon. People are annoyances. Yeah, well, you're going to have to deal with it. I leaned back in my chair and suppressed a laugh at the petulant expression painted over her face. You're going to stay here with us, and I'm going to make sure nothing happens to you or your egg. Valera rolled her eyes and opened her mouth to respond, but then she froze, and her amber gaze zeroed in on a point past my shoulder. The little princess approaches, she murmured. Perhaps something is troubling her. Before I could answer, I was distracted by the sound of almost feather-light footsteps running up the stairs and toward the doorway of the suite of rooms I was in. Then the door swung open, and a calming swirl of purity filled the room. Aliona. The princess and divine maiden of Rama stood panting in the doorway of the room. As always, she was an image of otherworldly beauty in her white dress and had a slight glow emanating from her. White hair, the color of starlight, fell down her back in loose waves, except for her raven-colored forelocks. Those were pinned back and away from her delicately flushed face. "What's the rush?" I asked as I rubbed the crick out of my neck and sauntered over to her. The Oracle Mine is under attack," Aliona replied, and anger shone from the depths of her amethyst eyes. "I just received the message." "How many people are at the mine today?" I demanded as I narrowed my own eyes. "Did they take any guards with them? Did any of the guild warriors accompany them?" "Lyka, Anton, and Natalia are the only ones at the mine." The princess began to respond before she was cut off. "I will aid you." Valera suddenly declared as she shifted behind me on the bed and made an almost silent noise of pain. You will need all the help you can get, and if you fall, then there will be no one to protect my sister's egg since I am still injured. No, you'll stay here. I turned to glance at the recovering dragon and pointed at her to not move. You're still recovering. There's no way I'm going to allow you to undo all of the work we put into healing you. If you want to thank us, be grateful and stay in the damn bed. I am not a weak hatchling. The other dragon made an affronted noise that was close to being a growl, but she laid back down on the bed. You are quite the bossy whelp. Remember who chased you out of the canyons. Just stay there and rest. You can threaten me later. I muttered before I stalked out of the room and made my way to the staircase that would bring me to the rooftop. Lyka's message said they'd been attacked by creatures from the sky. Aliona said as she trailed quickly behind me. "Is it demons?" I asked, and rapid-fire questions fell from my mouth as my mind shifted from healer to warrior. "Where are the king and my father? What about the warriors from the guild?" Lyka isn't sure what the creatures are, but she thinks they're demons. The priestess replied, and she had to take two steps at a time in order to keep up with my pace. Father is with Ruslan by the aqueducts. I've sent a message to them, and Father has replied. They're on their way back to Hatra in order to defend the city in case of an attack. Daya has left with a squad, but Lyka, Anton, and Natalia won't be able to hold off the demons long enough for the guild warriors to arrive. But we'll make it in time. I growled out just as I shifted from my human form into my dragon body. Guide me to the mine. Aliona gracefully climbed onto my back, and once she was securely astride me, I opened my wings and soared into the sky.
The city of Hatra el Shamash grew small beneath us as the land stretched out to the horizon. On one side were the glistening sands of the desert, and on the other was the sprawling green canopy of a forest bordered by distant snow-capped mountains. Head to the Azurin village in the center of the forest, Aliona's clear voice rang out around me, amplified by her magic. The Orichalum mine is east of the village, and there's a small clearing right before the entrance. Hold on, I snarled as I soared over the forest with Aliona on my back, and I kept my senses alert for any hint of an attack. There's something odd in the distance. It feels like miasma, but not quite. Almost like the demons who came out of the gate by the canyons. It's like someone is ripping my scales off one by one. You're right, Aliona replied, and there was a spike of purity from the princess as her power fanned out around us and then darted off in the direction of the mine. It feels slimy and almost acidic as it grates on my senses, but it's not miasma. Nor is it exactly the corruptive presence of a demon. It's close, but not quite there. We didn't have to wait long to find out exactly what was attacking the mine and our senses. There was a swarm of monsters right above a dip in the forest canopy, right where the clearing to the Orichalum mine was supposed to be. The creatures didn't look like the putrid insect-like demons I'd seen before. In fact, they all seemed to be women. They had feathery wings and humanoid bodies, but that was where things got strange. Dark blue blood oozed from their eyes and mouths, and they screeched into the air while they dove back down through the dip in the forest canopy. There must have been twenty of them. What are those things? I growled out to the princess on my back. Are those demons? Harpies, Aliona answered as she formed a glimmering barrier of purity around the two of us. But they aren't themselves. It's as if they've begun to become demons. Become demons? I tilted my head back so I could glance at her. That can actually happen? Rarely, but yes, Aliona responded, and her voice was tense as she tightened her grip on my spikes. There is also a species similar to them within the demon world, but they wouldn't be able to stand direct sunlight. This is something different. Even if a harpy had managed to fall and become a demon, there shouldn't be this many, especially during the day. Whatever they are, they're going down. I growled as I picked up speed. They attacked what's mine, and they're going to pay for it. My immense wings brought us quickly to the edge of the fighting, but Aliona's barrier kept the demonic harpies at bay. I peered down at the clearing, and I easily picked out two wolf demihumans and one Azurin fighting off the mutated harpies. The Azurin was the blacksmith Natalia, with the trademark horns of her people and shoulder-length pale blue hair that fanned out around her as she slashed at the harpies. Her dark gold eyes glinted angrily and reflected the light from the two oracalum blades she wielded with ease. The harpies kept aiming for the stone entrance of the mine, but Natalia was able to keep them at bay. Anton and Laika were the two wolf demi-humans, members of the Blue Tree Guild who had vowed their loyalty to my city. Anton's gray hair and fur was tinted crimson by flames as he launched fireballs at the harpies. His tail bristled and swished behind him and it almost moved in tune with the crackling of the fire in his hands. Laika was the fearless leader of the Blue Tree Guild and all of its clans. Her stormy gray eyes were alight with the excitement of battle, and her long gray hair whisked behind her like a second tail. She had an enormous broadsword in her hands, and she wielded it easily as she launched attack after attack on the harpies above them. Dark blood, clearly not her own, dripped from the planes of her leather armor and smudged the blue stitching of her gorget until it was barely noticeable. Evan! Laika called out to me as she pulled her broadsword from the stomach of a harpy and cleaved its head off with one sure swing. They won't stay down. They're like the corrupted corpses. We need fire, Anton added as he covered the fallen harpy with his flames. Burn them to ashes. That way they won't get back up. What a pity you don't have any firepower, Asher's sardonic voice rang out through my mind. Oh, wait, but you have my lightning. I'd say that's far more useful than any old fire. He has a point, Mariah, the spirit of the Sword of Healing, chimed in. You know, for a former enemy, you're not quite as useless as I thought you'd be. I ignored the two bickering voices inside of my mind as the proverbial light bulb went off. I didn't need fire to burn something. My lightning would work just as well, if not better. With one release of my lightning, I would be able to strike down all the harpies. 
I just needed to lure them away from my friends first. Aliona, I need you to trap all the harpies inside of a barrier with us, I ordered as I dove into the swarm of creatures and lashed out at them. We'll take them out in one blow. Take this barrier down and then make another one on my signal. We're going to lure them up into the sky. The princess on my back didn't reply, but the barrier around us vanished. The demonic harpies took that as a sign of victory, and all of them went in for the kill around us. The creatures were single-minded and even turned away from my comrades on the ground. I flew higher up into the sky, and the harpies clamored after us. I didn't even need to be able to see them. I could sense their grating presence as they followed us higher and higher into the clouds, and their shrill shrieks stabbed at my ears. They almost surrounded the two of us at this point, so I had to time this perfectly. Three more seconds, and I would be able to give Aliona the signal. I began to gather my power, and it crackled along the spiritual sea deep inside of me. It was begging to break free and run amuck, but not yet. Just one more moment. Now! I called out to the princess on my back, and then I spun around in the air to face the demonic harpies. A shimmering and multicolored barrier came to life around us and every single one of the harpies. They screeched in confusion as the immense purity of the barrier began to choke the very demonic essence from their bodies. They coughed up globs of black blood, and some of them clawed at their own flesh desperately. For a moment, I thought I heard the harpy closest to my head cry out, Please! Confused, I held back on my lightning power and summoned a status check on them. Classification? Demonic Harpy, formerly Harpy. Condition? Infected by demonic essence, incapable of feeling physical pain. Priority. Body falling apart due to rejection of demonic essence. Demonic essence incompatible with original body. Danger. Susceptible to permanent destruction by fire. Status. Reanimated dead. That explained it. They were just like the corrupted corpses that had overrun Hatra once. Their bodies weren't their own anymore, and their minds were barely there. These harpies were just tools for someone in the war that had been ravaging this world for thousands of years. I'll put you all out of your misery, I promised the demonic harpies as their shrieking reached an ear-splitting crescendo. Your bodies won't be defiled any longer. The anger inside of me grew, but it wasn't directed at the demonic harpies anymore. A raging inferno burned inside of me for whoever controlled these poor creatures, and I let it fuel the strength of my lightning. You cannot bring them back, Mariah whispered from deep inside of my mind. Even if we combine our powers, they have already passed from this world. I couldn't do anything to heal them, but I could do something to ease the pain inside of what remained of their minds. So I pulled forth my healing magic and poured it into my lightning. Then I let my power loose, and white lightning scattered all around us and struck each harpy in the chest. There was no smell of burning flesh, the lightning was almost a comforting light, and the harpies felt nothing but the gentleness of falling asleep. I could give them a peaceful end, and I would get revenge against whoever had desecrated them like this. The ashes of all the harpies scattered all around us and down into the forest. A wind swirled up against my wings, and I thought I heard a soft voice whisper, Thank you, in my ear. They've been freed, Aliona murmured mournfully to herself as the wind carried her voice to me. They were suffering so much, and now they're free from whatever was controlling them. I hated to hear the princess sad, and suddenly an idea struck me that would hopefully cheer her up. Aliona, we're going to fall, I called out to the princess on my back as I swooped toward the ground. Get ready for me to catch you. Fall? She echoed in puzzlement, and I could almost hear the way she tilted her head to the side. What do you mean? Just hold on to me, I urged. It'll be fun, I promise. There wasn't quite enough space in the clearing for me to land, so there was really only one thing I could do. And if it made Aliona laugh in the process, then, well, hey, two birds with one stone. So I shifted from my dragon to my human form in midair and quickly wrapped my arms around Aliona. It was a short drop to the ground, maybe 15 feet, but I wasn't worried about our descent. Aliona had an immortal body, and I had the strength of a dragon. Besides, if, by any chance, either of us got hurt... I would be able to heal both of us. Not that I would allow even a scratch to find its way onto Aliona's body, though. I was more than sure of my physical abilities, and this wouldn't be the first time I'd changed from flying to falling. 
Aliona laughed joyfully in my ear as we plummeted toward the ground, and I wrapped my healing power around the two of us as the forest floor rose up to meet us. A moment later, we touched down gently on the ground, unlike my crash into the top of the stone tower where I'd fought Asher. That was fun. Aliona giggled gently into my neck before she let go of me. There's something freeing about falling like that. Told ya. I grinned at the princess and allowed my hands to linger on her waist before I turned to our waiting comrades. Is everyone okay? I didn't sense any wounds on anyone when I was up there. My lord, I thank you. Natalia bent her head forward and strands of her pale blue hair covered her face from view. Although we are unharmed, the demons were too many. We may not have been able to hold them back for much longer. I'll always protect my people, I promised as I placed my hand on Natalia's shoulder and brushed away some of the ash from her tunic. Where did the demons come from? Was it a demon gate or a magical array? No. Natalia blinked at me and tilted her head. They came from the skies above the forest near the eastern half, toward the mountain range. How far can they usually fly? I looked over my shoulder at Aliona and quirked an eyebrow. Do you know if they need to rest while flying long distances, or is it something they can easily do? Harpies do travel from their territories occasionally, Aliona replied, and her amethyst eyes shifted with the sunlight as she glanced in the direction of the mountain range. But they do not have the endurance for long-distance attacks. They prefer to lure and entrap, not outright attack like in this instance. Not even if they were turned into demons. So they definitely need to have a home base. I frowned as I looked over the clearing in front of the Orichalum mine. This feels like a very orchestrated attack. They would have had to scout out the mine and figure out a day when there would be the least amount of people here. Once they figured out a pattern, they attacked the mine, either to destroy it or to steal the Orichalum. We need to figure out what they were trying to accomplish with this attack. I was meant to be here alone. Natalia tilted her head as she frowned. Laika and Anton came with me when I ran into them at the gate. I do not think I would have been able to hold them back long enough for help to arrive. Lucky that we did, Anton muttered as he wiped some of the harpy guts off his leather armor. Otherwise, you would have been a snack for them. Not to mention, no one would have known you were under attack until it was too late. Ah, you're right. Natalia blinked back at Anton as she moved a strand of hair behind her ear. Perhaps I should no longer come alone in the future. You don't say, I replied dryly. Oracallum is pretty important to us, but remember, Natalia, it's definitely not worth your life. I will keep that in mind. Natalia nodded her head sharply in agreement. Demonized harpies wouldn't have been able to touch a holy metal. Aliona mused as she tapped her finger against her chin and let out a small sigh. So it would only make sense that their goal was to destroy our access to the mine. And how would they accomplish that? I asked as I crossed my arms over my chest. We would be able to dig out and find a way back to the Oracallum even if they buried all the entrances. Unless, and this is a long shot, but is there any way that they would be able to permanently destroy the mine, either by moving it all elsewhere, or a type of magic that would stop us from getting anywhere near it? Even as I spoke, I was already imagining the magical equivalent of a nuclear bomb being set off, either in the mine or above that. I hadn't checked to see if there was anything similar to uranium or plutonium in the soil underneath our feet, but I bet there was some type of destructive magic in this world that could take its place. They could have opened a gate into the demon world, Aliona muttered as she paced in front of us and crossed her arms in front of her generous chest. Such an opening would have the potential of swallowing up the entire area if, and only if, it had the backing of a demon lord or more than one. Much like the land that has been swallowed up by the breach, it no longer exists in our world. Someone definitely doesn't want us to get our hands on this oracallum, I laughed dryly. If someone's trying this hard to stop us, that means we're definitely on the right path. You all right? Natalia tapped her booted foot on the ground and frowned at the clouds. But I am unsure about something. Why would they only attack from the sky? Well, we know the harpies couldn't have come from far away, I explained as I paced in front of them and tilted my face to look up at the sky. So maybe the ones we fought were scouts, since we know they had to fly here from their home base. Maybe they were just testing our defense of the Oracallum mine and our fighting abilities. 
But that runs the risk of us knowing. Laika argued as her tail twitched back and forth. They would lose the advantage of surprise over us with such an attack. Maybe they hadn't expected any of us to be here. I stopped pacing inside. We aren't going to know what they expected to find, but we're going to have to be prepared in the future for this. The mine has to be under constant guard, no exceptions. A sound plane. Natalia nodded just as she lifted a hand to point at the hollowed-out trunk of a large tree. Shall we sit down? We have had a most strenuous day, after all. I stepped forward to follow after the Azurin and the others, but something hit the tip of my boot. It didn't feel like a stone or a twig or even a piece of bone, so I bent down to try and find what exactly I'd touched with my foot. The ground was covered in an almost kaleidoscopic glitter that shifted hues in the sunlight, and it was actually quite mesmerizing. It was funny to think this glittery ash was the remains of the demonized harpies when it was so beautiful. It didn't take long for me to find the object underneath all of the ash. I picked it up and stood as I brushed off the excess dirt from the object. In my hand was a green jade charm, beautifully carved and in the shape of a leaf. It was just like the one worn by Olivier when he'd appeared outside of Hatra a few weeks ago. Anger pulsed through me as I clenched the jade pendant in my hand. I wasn't quite sure what finding this meant, and if there was a link between Olivier and these harpies, but this seemed to indicate that there could be. Last time, when the corrupted corpses had rained down on Hatra through a magical array and attacked my city, Olivier had been inside of the walls. This time, no one had seen Olivier or even caught his scent. Evan? Laika came to a stop in front of me and pulled me out of my thoughts. What do you have in your hand? Is that a piece of bone? No, it's a piece of jade. I glanced up at Laika as I showed her what I'd found. Do you remember Olivier? Yes. Laika scowled and the fur on her tail bristled. How could I forget the bastard who attacked our city? He had a piece of jade just like this one, I said as I tilted the small jade charm so it caught the sunlight. I think it was tied around his hair. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but this is twice now I've seen this when we've been attacked. Do you think it could be an emblem or something? Maybe it's their symbol, like how the blue tree is the symbol of your own guild. A symbol of the green glass sect? Laika plucked the piece of jade from my hand and brought it close to her eyes. It could be. We should hand this over to Daya or Tion and see what their informants have discovered. Sounds like a good plan. I rubbed the back of my neck as I tilted my head to the side. Get them to make a list of questions and things we'd need to know to get more information about the sect. I'll make some time to visit the prisoners this week, too. They should be more comfortable now and willing to talk to us, or at least to me. Should we look for more of these things? Anton pointed at the jade charm and frowned as he turned to look at the heaps of ash in the clearing. Through all of that. Thank you for volunteering! I laughed as I thumped Anton on his back and stepped toward the entrance of the mine. Try and find them all. There might be more clues in there for us to find. Should have kept my mouth closed, Anton muttered to himself as he walked over to one of the ash heaps. I will help you. Natalia stoically walked over and crouched in front of a heap with a slender branch in her hand. I shall sweep away the ash. Only the heaviest things will remain. I shook my head in amusement at Natalia's composed manner. It was like nothing was capable of shaking her resolve. Then I turned my attention back to the entrance of the mine to figure out how we could defend it in the future. It was pretty much just like any basic mine entrance back on Earth, but instead of wood timber framing the opening, stone pillars and a long slab of stone decorated the entrance. It was large enough that I was sure I would be able to fit through, even if I was in my dragon form. What are you thinking of? Aliona asked as she placed her hand on my elbow and glanced over the mine entrance. I'm not sure, I admitted to the princess by my side. There's a lot of options, but I don't know which one would be the right one. What options are you thinking of? Laika walked over to where we stood and placed her chin on my shoulder. Would you place a gate over it? No, that wouldn't exactly work. I frowned as I tilted my head to the side. The entrance would still be exposed. We need to have guards here, but there's always the chance of someone sneaking past them with magic and getting through the gate. And closing this entire area might be the better option. That way, no one would be able to get into the mine without us knowing. It's better to have a foolproof plan from the beginning instead of finding flaws in the midst of a fight. 
Lyca nodded sharply, and one of her furry ears brushed against my cheek. We should place as many defenses here as possible before we leave. Well, I guess that's my cue to get to work. I chuckled as I pulled away from the two women and stepped close to the entrance. Hey, Aliona, could you make a warning system to let us know if something gets close to the mine, especially if it isn't anyone from Hatra? Of course. Aliona replied sweetly as silver light glowed in her hands. I can create a barrier that will keep them out. Will that be better? That'll be perfect. I smiled fiercely as I gathered my power inside of myself. Wait until I encase the mine's entrance in stone, then place it. I called on the stone all around us, and it eagerly answered my call, ready to be molded and shaped into whatever I desired. The stone listened to the power deep inside of my spiritual sea and rose up in a great wall around the entrance. Then I made sure it was entirely seamless so there would be no opening for anyone to get into it. O oh, stars of day and night, those who answer my call, Aliona intoned beside me, and silver light erupted all around her and the mine. Protect this place with your great authority and virtue. Let none but those bound to us enter this place. Aliona's power seeped into the earth surrounding us and into the stone I had summoned. It was like her power had merged into mine for a moment, and I felt it so deeply inside of my spiritual sea that it was like she was in my mind. Then everything settled, and the world found its equilibrium again as a steady hum of power and life filled the air. Nothing seemed out of place, not even the new rock face where there once had been a mine entrance. Well, we should head back to Hatra now, I sighed and rubbed at my sore neck. We're going to have to iron out these plans for protecting the mine and setting up a watch around the entrance. Once we have a more permanent defense system worked out, I can come back and reopen the mine. Everyone seemed satisfied with my plan, but all I could think about was the looming threat of Olivier's reemergence. I tightened my fist around the jade pendant again. That bastard was going to pay, one way or another. And soon. Chapter 2 Laika, let everyone know we'll be on our way back to the city soon, I ordered as I turned away from the now-sealed mine. Of course, Laika replied as she placed her hand on the gorget at her throat. I frowned at the small amount of space in the clearing and tapped my foot in thought. We're going to have to head to the old Azura village first, I sighed. I can't change back into my dragon form here. That is perfect for me, Natalia nodded as she folded her arms over her chest. I want to see if I can salvage more objects. More objects? I asked and turned to face her. Like what? Tools from the village and materials for crafting. Natalia answered as she listed the items on her fingers and shrugged. There is not much left after it was destroyed, but I have been looking every time I come to the mine. That sounds like a good idea to me. I leaned against a nearby tree and smiled at the Azurean blacksmith. Do you want any help? No. Natalia shook her head rapidly, and her blue hair swung from side to side. I will be fine alone. It will take some time. I do not want to delay you. It is important to return to Hotra. Anton, I rumbled as I glanced over my shoulder at the wolf demihuman. Yes. Anton dusted off his hands and passed a handful of jade pendants to Laika. Stay with Natalia when we leave, I commanded as I stepped away from the tree. No problem, Anton replied and he rubbed at his neck as he glanced up at the sky with a scowl. I'll keep an eye out for any more harpies, too. Are you heading back to Hatra now? Natalia asked as she tilted her head to the side. I opened my mouth to respond with a yes, but then an idea occurred to me. Actually, not yet, I sighed as I folded my arms across my chest. Change of plans. Even though I blocked off the mine's entrance, I don't want to leave it unguarded. Tell me. Your old village is, what, 30 minutes from the mine? Yes, a leisurely walk would take 30 minutes. Natalia bobbed her head in agreement, and her hair moved in time. It would be far shorter if one hastens their pace. Then that settles it, I said with my own decisive nod. We're going to make a base out of the village. It'll work perfectly for defending the mine. That's a good idea. Like a hummed as her gray tail swished behind her languidly. I don't know why we didn't think of it before. We didn't think about the mine being attacked, or even anyone knowing of it. 
Aliona pointed out as she peered up at Laika and smiled gently. Very few people even know of the location of the Azuran village. Father ensured that. The past is in the past. We're going to worry about what we can do now, I said as I glanced at the blocked mine and then back up at the clear sky. The future is what matters, and we're going to safeguard it no matter the cost. We're going to go step by step and stone by stone until we've built something no one will ever be able to tear down. Spoken like a true lord. Aliona lifted her sleeve to hide the smile on her face, but the pride in her eyes was clear for everyone to see. How many do you want stationed at the village? Laika asked, and one of her ears flopped as she tilted her head to the side. Before we decide that, let's get to the village first, I replied, and clapped my hands as I glanced between the two wolf demi-humans. Laika, Anton, I want to see how fast a blue tree guild warrior can cross this distance. Of course. Laika's ears and tail perked up straight. Anton, let's run. An excited light gleamed in the eyes of both wolf demi-humans, and they took off quickly. Well, let's not get left behind by them, I grinned as I took a step closer to Aliona and picked her up in my arms. Evan! Aliona gasped and immediately wrapped her arms around my neck. What are you doing? A leisurely walk takes thirty minutes, right, Natalia? I asked as I glanced over at the blacksmith. Yes, my lord. A faint smile was visible on Natalia's face as she walked to stand beside us. I'm sure Anton and Laika won't mind if the three of us take a bit longer to get there. I started to walk in the direction of the ruined de Jurin village and stepped over a tree root. It's such a beautiful day, after all. It would be a shame not to enjoy the forest. We're not out here much anyways. Natalia nodded and strolled ahead of us as she hummed a cheerful, if slightly haunting, melody that echoed throughout the forest. It is a lovely day. Aliona leaned her head on my shoulder and hummed happily. The sun is bright and the wind is clear. We couldn't ask for more perfect weather from the gods themselves. I hope the rest of Rama is graced with such lovely weather as well. I glanced down at the princess in my arms and smiled softly. Even in quiet moments like these, she had the well-being of her people at the forefront of her mind. She was so pure and unselfish, and I could only love her more for it. Aliona, I said quietly to her, I spoke with your father last night about Hatra and everyone's future. What did he say? Aliona asked as she glanced up at me and the sunlight reflected off her amethyst eyes. He told me his hopes, I tightened my hold around my princess as my heart skipped a beat, and asked for me to become one of the sons of Rama, to stand beside you against whatever darkness this world may bring. But only my father is the son of... Aliona quickly caught on to what I was saying, and her eyes widened as happiness clearly shone in them. Wait. Father wants us to marry? <laughs> yes! I laughed as I pressed a kiss to her cheek. But he wants me to win over the nobles first, before the engagement is announced. I am sure you will do splendidly, my dragon. Aliona pressed a kiss to my jaw before she snuggled into my chest. A glorious future will await Rama. So, is that a yes? I asked with a grin. You're okay with marrying me? Aliona smiled up at me, and her joy was as bright as the sun over our heads. Nothing would make me happier, Evan. The dragon part of me preened in my chest, and I shoved down the urge to take my princess right here and now. Good, I said, but it came out as more of a possessive growl. I can't wait to make you mine for all of a naughty to see and Aliona was right about the glory that was going to come to Rama. The king had placed his trust in me and believed I was the right person not only to marry his daughter, but the right person to help him wipe away the corruption that had begun to stagnate in Rama. I would not let him, or my future wife, down. Walking to the Azuran village from the mine didn't take as long as Natalia had mentioned, Maybe because Aliona and I were talking absentmindedly about little things we noticed in the forest, or because we were able to move quickly. Whatever the reason, it had only taken us fifteen minutes to reach the village, and by that point, Laika and Anton were already waiting for us patiently at the center of the Azura's old home. If you will excuse me, I will return to my old smithy, Natalia said as we stopped beside her at the edge of the village. 
She glanced away from us in the direction of her former workshop, and her voice had taken on a dazed quality, like she couldn't believe she was back here in her old home. Make sure not to overwork yourself, I warned. I knew the Azurin was ready to get back to work, and she probably wouldn't stop until everything was perfect. Pace yourself. I have enough work to last until the mine is reopened, Natalia replied as her brow furrowed. I think. I will do my best to work slowly. It took us two minutes to get here, Lyka reported after she had walked over to us. We will do better in the future. Gonna train everyone to the bone? I raised an eyebrow at her before I glanced over the village. Two minutes is still too long if there is an emergency, Lyka explained as she motioned in the direction of the mine. It'll have to do for now, I said before I closed my eyes and focused on the power inside of me. Visualizing what I wanted was simple, a stone building with rooms spread out over three floors, enough to accommodate thirty people. On the first floor was a simple kitchen and leisure space. The second and third floors were just rooms, and on the roof I created a lookout point. Connected to the building was a simple latrine for them to use, and I knew the Blue Tree Guild warriors would be able to manage until I had more time to expand the building and figure out how to get running water to the base. Is there any water nearby? I murmured to myself as I walked alongside the building I had just created. I closed my eyes and stretched out my senses to see if I could find a river or creek. There had to be something, considering a village had been built here. No one would build far away from a source of water. I furrowed my brow and concentrated, and a moment later it paid off. There, deep in the earth beneath our feet, I could sense a reservoir of water. There were also holes that reached down to it, wells built by the Azurans when they first erected the village. More than a little curious, I followed the trail of the water and realized it stretched all the way to Hatra. At that point, along the border of the forest, my senses felt like they've been stretched too thin, so I pulled back to the village. I returned to the area where I physically was and focused on the water. If I could force the water to the surface somehow, like a geyser, then that would solve the issue of running water. The water was underneath what felt like a solid plate of stone, and there was enough pressure that if I forced part of the stone aside, it would rise up to the surface. So, I did just that. A moment later, a solid stream of water burst through the soft surface soil and created a geyser that shot into the sky. Immediately, I pulled stone upward to form a giant stone tank around the hole. I could feel the constant thudding of the water as it hit the surface of the tank, so that meant there was pressure. Then I formed a tap on one side of the tank and pulled up a trough in front of it in order to catch the water released from the tap. That's incredible! Aliona exclaimed as she clapped her hands in front of her. You are amazing, Evan. Pulling water out of the earth is a wonderful feat of engineering. <laughs> the guards here will be spoiled. Lyka snorted as she shook her head. We should be heading back, though. Everyone is waiting for us to return. I glanced from my work and saw Natalia and Anton were sitting off to the side with evident curiosity in their eyes. I guess I had taken longer than I thought to build the stone house and water pump. Aliona, can you make a portal to take us back? I asked as I glanced over at the Divine Princess. I may be a huge dragon, but I couldn't fit four adults on my back just yet. Do you have enough energy for that? The priestess nodded and opened a portal that linked the Azurin village with one of the town squares of Hatra. We stepped through the swirling silver energy and found ourselves back in our city, right in front of the building that had come to be considered the temporary palace. The moment the portal closed behind us, Aliona quickly stepped away from my side. Where are you going? I asked as I glanced amusedly at the princess and tugged her closer to me. To search in the archives, Aliona replied, and there was a fire in her amethyst eyes as she clenched her hands tightly. There has to be a way to bring someone back from being a demon. Those harpies didn't choose to fall. They were dragged down into the brinks of hell and suffering. Do you think you'd be able to reverse it? I questioned with a frown, as I remembered the despair that had emanated from the harpies. You mentioned once that the miasma was a sickness, Aliona continued, and her voice was nearly desperate. If I think about demonification as something similar, then there has to be a way to undo what has been done. Whatever you need, I'll give it to you, I promised. Just tell me. I know. But for now, 
I need to do a little research on my own. Aliona's amethyst eyes softened before she slipped away with a delicate smile. Thank you. Laika, go speak to Daya and your grandfather. I sighed as I watched my princess's figure disappear in the distance. Let them know about posting guards in the Azuran village and setting up a rotation to defend the mine. Consider it done. Laika nodded before she disappeared as well in a cloud of dust. And time for me to walk into the proverbial dragon's den, I joked to myself as I bit back a laugh. I shook my head as I walked into our building, but the moment I stepped through the entrance, a voice drew me up short. So, you've finally come back, Valera remarked as she stood at the bottom of the staircase in a sleeveless blue dress. I blinked in surprise. Just this morning, the crimson dragon could barely sit up without any pain. What are you doing out of bed? I demanded with a frown and I could feel a bit of a headache in the back of my head grow. You're supposed to be resting. I was bored and curious, Valera replied with a careless shrug of her shoulders. I wanted to know what happened with the demon attack. Well, I was on my way to tell you, I muttered as I headed into the common area. But I guess now you can just follow me and you'll find out. Better to say it once rather than twice anyway. I walked into the common area of our building to find Ruslan, my adopted father, and the head of the ruling house of Hatra. He was a fox demi-human with crimson hair and emerald eyes that sparkled with mischief. Evan! Ruslan exclaimed, and he stood up from where he was sitting when he caught sight of me. What happened at the mine? Next to him sat the king of Rama and Aliona's father, Rodion. He was dressed all in white, just as Aliona had been, and his hair was the color of moonlight. His swirling amethyst and azure eyes zeroed in on me. Do tell us, King Rodion added calmly. We are both eager to know. I sat down at the table and launched into a quick explanation of what happened, but I kept the part about finding the charm to myself. I didn't know if I could trust Valera with that information, and I would wait until things were a bit more private to bring it up. As it was, the topic shifted to the crimson dragon sitting next to me when she grimaced in her chair. Valera, what are you going to do once you've recovered? King Rodion asked as he tilted his head and leaned forward with curiosity. Are you going to seclude yourself once more in your canyons, or are you going to take part in this world of ours again? You can stay here in Hatra, you know, I offered as I smiled at Valera. It would be fun to have another dragon around here. Stay in Hatra? Valera didn't seem thrilled at the idea, and her face clearly showed it. Surrounded by humans in their petty disputes? I think not. Once I am fully recovered, I will take my sister's egg and return to my canyons. Think about it. You were alone in the canyons, and you almost got killed. I shook my head as I leaned back in my chair. What would have happened if the demons had gotten their hands on your sister's egg? I do not wish to imagine such a thing. Valera's jaw clenched as her claws scraped the wooden armrests of her chair. Nor will such a thing ever happen. What occurred with those demons was a fluke, and it will not happen again. I will not fall for the same trick twice. Still, it's better to be two steps ahead of them, I pointed out. They won't expect you to be allied with us. I tire of this conversation. A scowl crossed Valera's face as she stood promptly. I shall be returning to bed. The crimson dragon stalked out of the room, and I clearly heard her go up the stairs. Well, she's a stubborn one, Ruslan chuckled as he shook his head. That's putting it mildly. I frowned as I thought about Valera's reaction. I'm not going to give up on this, though. I just need some time to make her see things my way. You'll be playing the long game with her, King Rodion remarked as he leaned back in his chair and glanced at me. Yeah, I sighed with a nod. I'll keep working on her. There's no way I want her to ever side with the demons or anyone else. I want her in Hatra. But speaking of enemies turned to potential allies, what do you know about the Green Glass sect? That's a dead sect, King Rodion replied with a frown. Supposedly they were wiped out close to a thousand years ago due to an accident during a research experiment. Why, do you ask? Because they aren't dead at all. I gritted my teeth as I remembered the jade charm I'd found. They've attacked Hatra before, and we have some of them imprisoned in the Blue Tree Guild airship. We even welcomed one of them into Hatra, Ruslan added as he tightly gripped the armrests of his chair. 
Then he dropped a horde of corrupted corpses into our midst. How disturbing, King Rodion murmured as he closed his eyes. I will have my people look into this matter. Good, I replied and forced myself to relax. I won't have them hurting my city or my people ever again. As we've come to the subject of Hatra, I've arranged for architects and their workers to arrive within one week, King Rodion said as he easily changed the topic and stared right at me. You are free to order them as you will. They've been instructed to bring materials and supplies. This includes things such as food, cloth, furniture, and medicine. Is there anything you would like me to add to that list? Sample products of what's on the market right now, I replied quickly. I was probably jumping the gun, but this was a wonderful opportunity to start setting the path for the future. I want to figure out a product that can propel Hatra into becoming an economic power. We're figuratively and literally stranded when it comes to the rest of the cities, and actually the rest of the world. Books, too. Have them bring enough literature that it covers everything that's happened over the past thousand years in Rama and the other countries. If I may be so bold as to point you in the right direction, King Rodion began with a cheerful tone in his voice. Hatra was once known to produce the finest moonstones. As it stands, there's been a high demand for them in the market, especially among jewelers and cultivators. I can understand jewelers, but why cultivators? I asked as I tapped my fingers on the table in front of me and frowned. Moonstones augment inner growth and strength. King Rodion explained carefully as he took a moment to consider his next words. They soothe any instability in one's spiritual sea and provide calmness. Such things are essential for any cultivator attempting to break through to the next ranks. Is that why the Moonstone River House is full of them? I asked. I'd been wondering why there were so many of those stones around the city. Yes, a sound construction if there ever was one. The king nodded as a proud smile slid onto his face. It's a fine example of a space for cultivating power and learning how to control massive amounts of it. I am sure you've noticed the rest of Hatra is full of moonstones as well, Ruslan chuckled as he rubbed at the back of his neck. That's what helped Julia, Moscow, and I to become so strong. It's granted us some protection from the miasma too, not as much as the princess's barriers, but enough for us to stand a bit more of a chance. Why are moonstones coming from Hatra, though? I asked as I glanced between the two older men. Aren't those mined from mountains? They typically are, King Rodion confirmed as he shared his knowledge of the ancient past of our city. However, Hatra was built on surprisingly fertile land when it comes to such gemstones. There's nothing but moonstones underneath the surface's bluestone. Deep mines reach underneath the city and spread out through the desert. Has anyone from the city ever mined anything other than moonstones from the desert? I questioned, and excitement filled my voice at the confirmation of treasure existing underneath those golden sands. Things like rubies, emeralds, or diamonds? Unfortunately, the expansion to the desert happened toward the end of Lord Tristan's reign, Rodion replied, and the faint cheer that had been in the king's face faded away when he mentioned my grandfather. Very little of it managed to reach the market, making those desert gems even more of a commodity, perhaps, than the moonstones. Hatra produced high-quality jewels in the past. It only stands to reason those within the vicinity of the city would share a similar quality. I see, I sighed as I ran my hand through my hair. That actually works in our favor. That means those mines are completely untapped, and whatever we get out of them will have a higher value. If I remember correctly, the king continued in a distant tone, in the past, there have also been merchant caravans that went missing in the deserts outside of Hatra. There are a few cities and settlements directly after the desert, right on the western sea, and traveling through the desert cuts the journey time in half when reaching the eastern side of Rama. With Hatra fallen to miasma and the canyons ruled by Valera, the only safe route for them to travel by was destroyed. Then the desert claimed the merchants and their wares. Looking for those lost caravans could be worth a shot. I recalled the dig sites of Egypt and the Middle East back on my old world and grinned in triumph. The aridness of the desert would have preserved most of their goods as long as they weren't food. Maybe if there's spices or things like honey, those could have endured all this time. 
I am certain there are records of the missing caravans. King Rodion tilted his head to the side and closed his eyes in thought. Those documents would list all their cargo and their destinations. We'd even be able to guess at what route they would have taken. A spike of excitement went through me, and I was eager to dig in the desert for the cargo of the missing merchant caravans. How long would it take to get our hands on those documents? It doesn't matter how long or how many people it'll take, the king shook his head, and determination filled his dual-colored eyes. I will ensure they arrive with the coming architects in one week. Awesome! I grinned back and pointed at the papers spread before us. We'll deal with those records when they arrive. I think we can assign Leon to assist Julia in looking through them. He was the one who was able to assemble all these reports and plans on her orders. These are rather impressive if one considers he has no formal training, King Rodion remarked as he pulled one of the papers toward him and nodded in approval. Hatra only produces the best. Ruslan matched my grin, and I could see his tail waving rapidly behind him. Indeed. King Rodion bit back a smile and glanced up at me. So, tell me, lords of Hatra, how are you going to continue rebuilding your city? I already rebuilt the aqueducts and the walls surrounding us, I explained as I pointed at the schematics of the aqueducts and city walls found by my mother. Right now, they're only stone, but I want to have oracalum inlaid in them. Is it for the same reason you have begun to plant dragon's blood trees along the walls? The king inquired as he tilted his head to the side and stared right at me. Yeah. I leaned forward in my seat and began to explain. Aliona found out dragon's blood was capable of keeping miasma away and had the potential to ward against demons. So I ordered for the saplings that survived the attack on the Azuran village to be brought back to the city. We started planting them along the walls once we had healthy saplings. Ideally, I want to have all the streets of Hatra lined with them. We use dragon's blood in the breach to help contain any escaping demons, King Rodion replied thoughtfully as he shrugged. Few of the trees managed to take root due to the tainted soil, but we have filled in the spaces with incense and oil made from the plant. Has oracalum ever been used in building materials? I asked. If I was on the right track with the dragon's blood, maybe I was right about the divine metal, too. Outside of the breach? No. King Rodion laughed bitterly before he rested his chin on his hand. I have not allowed anyone to purchase even an ounce of it because I was worried about such a powerful material falling into the hands of nefarious characters. In fact, you're the first person, aside from myself, to ever think of using it to strengthen a structure. How did you do it? I questioned as I leaned forward. I was eager to learn more about the sacred metal from the very man who had conquered it. I simply created the structures of the breach with my power using the oracalum, Rodion replied, and eddies of power swirled in his free hand before it disappeared from view. It takes fine control as well as a body that can handle its immense and divine power. Thousands have been ripped apart by the sheer power of the oracalum when they've tried to mold it as I have. I see. Such a thing was beyond me at the moment, but I had a modern knowledge at my disposal and could find ways to work around it. Would inlaying in the walls work the same way? Do you mean using it as a decorative embellishment rather than something structural? King Rodion tilted his head again in thought as he looked between the schematics, Ruslan, and myself. Yeah, I'm thinking that would be faster for everyone involved. I nodded quickly as I pointed back at the defense schematics. That is, of course, if it would still have the same effect of strengthening the walls. The power of Oracalum is great, King Rodion explained as he stared at the blueprints. Using it as an embellishment would be more than enough to strengthen the walls of Hatra a hundredfold. Does it hold enchantment well? Ruslan asked from where he had been thinking quietly. As if the gods had created it for that purpose, Rodion answered, and a bright gleam entered his eyes. Commonly, metals tend to shatter or become far too brittle depending on the amount of power poured into the enchantment and the amount of enchantments layered into the metal. Generally, the limit is seven at most. Then how many can Oracalum hold? I questioned with a frown. Seven enchantments would be enough for what I had planned for the walls and aqueducts. No limit has been discovered as of yet, the king replied, and the gleam in his eyes only grew brighter. 
Damn! I whistled lowly as I thought about the harpy demon invasion into the nearby mine. I can definitely understand why I've been keeping it out of everyone's hands. That's an ultimate weapon right there. Use it wisely, King Rodion intoned, and his eyes darkened with seriousness. Don't worry, I will, I promised. There was no way I was going to let something as powerful as the Oracalum fall out of my hands. Am I right to assume you plan on having Aliona do the enchanting? King Rodion continued, without skipping a beat. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of doing, I replied. She is the only one capable of it. Good. King Rodion nodded in approval. I will have scrolls and tomes sent for her use. I know my daughter will appreciate having her library. She was unable to take the majority of it with her when she left the Cave of One Thousand Sages. The aqueducts will be the first to receive these upgrades, I explained. The walls we can defend just fine, but the aqueducts are the lifeblood of this city, and they will not fall again. Of course. A shadow passed behind King Rodion's eyes, but it disappeared quickly. What else? The farms, I said, and then I turned to Ruslan since he would know the numbers better than me. How are we on food? There's enough food stored for a few months, maybe a year. Ruslan answered as he pulled forward a stack of papers that hadn't been spread out. But only if the population remains under a thousand. Our storehouses aren't infinite. And that isn't good enough, I said through gritted teeth. Our city is going to grow again, and we need to be able to provide our own nourishment since we can't depend on anyone for trade yet. We've been able to survive off what we've grown, Ruslan continued in the same serious tone. And the Blue Tree Guild has brought their own stores of food to supplement ours. We won't have to ration for a long while, but disaster can strike at any moment. An issue is how to expand the farms, I started, and then the words just tumbled out as I went on about the ideas bouncing around in my head. We can use the land between the inner and outer walls of the city, but once I rebuild the outer walls, the guards would be stretched even thinner. There's also the issue of the plants not receiving enough light due to being in the wall's shadows. If I knock down buildings in the city to make space for farms, that's less living space we'd have for the future. A sound point. King Rodion glanced between the papers on the table and narrowed his eyes in thought. Your current farms are within the city, correct? Yeah, in former buildings, I said with a nod. Farming like that was fine in the past, but it won't work in the future. Did the Hatra in the past not have farms between the walls? King Rodion hummed in thought as he tapped his fingers on the table. If I remember correctly, Hatra's vassal villages provided sustenance as well. The land between the walls isn't bad, Ruslan explained quickly. We'd be able to grow there easily. And vassal villages would only be helpful in the future, I mused with a shake of my head. We should only focus on Hatra and the immediate areas for the time being. True, King Rodion folded his hands in front of him and nodded. I will ensure the architects have knowledge of such things. Between you and the architects, I'm certain a solution will be found for this issue. What about deserts? I asked suddenly. Can you ensure they know about building on sandy foundations? Are you perhaps thinking about expansion into the desert? The king inquired as he lifted one pale eyebrow in amusement. I want to see if bringing the aqueducts into the desert would be viable. I explained this new idea to the two men in front of me. If we mined there in the future, we'd have to have bases there to protect the mines and for the workers to live. This would be a long-term project. We wouldn't start on anything soon, but it would be good to already have an idea of what to do and how to do it. You've thought so far ahead. Pride gleamed in King Rodion's eyes before it faded, and he sighed as he stood. But now I must take my leave and give my goodbyes to my daughter. If you have need of something, Aliona will be able to reach me. We'll see you off. Ruslan and I said in unison as we both stood up at the same moment. I blinked and glanced at Ruslan in confusion for a moment. He was just as bemused as I was, and when I turned to look at the king, he was smiling behind his sleeve. There is no need, King Rodion waved us off with a smile. You have much work to do, and I'm eager to see what you will accomplish with Hatra and how much the city will grow under your guidance. You have my word that Hatra will become the crown jewel of Rama. I promised the king as I sat back down. 
Hatra will be the most beautiful city you've ever seen when you return. Chapter 3 An hour after the king departed, I paced in front of the elders of my adopted family as my mind churned through ideas of how to make Hatra great again. We should hold a town hall meeting, I declared suddenly. There was a moment of silence as the three elders looked at each other with confusion evident in their eyes. Moskal tilted his head to the side and glanced over at Ruslan, and the fox shrugged his shoulders before he nudged at Julia with his elbow. You want to hold a what? Julia blinked as she set down her fan on the table between us. A town hall meeting, I repeated to the three elders and sat down at the table. It's pretty much where the people of an area can talk to their leaders, they find out what's happening right from the horse's mouth, and they can even bring up any concerns. I'm thinking this would be a good habit for us to get into. Right now, our population is manageable, and everyone has a pretty good relationship. True, the people of Hatra have managed to maintain a friendship with the bandits, Moscow began as he leaned forward and rested his elbows on the table. The bandits living with us now hasn't changed that friendship at all, and they've fallen into step with us quite quickly. And the clans of the Blue Tree Guild are disciplined, so no fights between the two factions have broken out at all. But that doesn't mean something won't happen in the future. I tapped an absent-minded rhythm against the table as I thought about Hatra's growth. These three groups were brought together by necessity and survival. In the future, people who come here won't have that same bond holding them to Hatra. There will be differences they won't know how to settle, and arguments might escalate into something deadly. Just thinking of such an eventuality is enough to give me a headache, Julia muttered as she rubbed the bridge of her nose and let out a small sigh. That's why I want to have the openness between us and our people. I shrugged as I leaned back in my seat. To keep us accessible, just like we are now and how you guys were in the past. With that, even when the city grows bigger and things begin to change, they'll know we're right here and still the same people they knew us as before. People who want the best for Hatra, no matter what. Where should we have this town hall meeting, then? Ruslan mimicked my action as he leaned back in his own chair. Summer is fast approaching, and the heat during the day will be unfathomable. Having it outside would be uncomfortable for everyone involved. I frowned at that. We needed a space where everyone would be able to fit. The airship of the Blue Tree Guild was a possibility, but we needed something distinctly Hatra in order to accentuate the symbolism of it being for the people of Hatra and the good of the city. Wait a moment. We had the perfect space for that. It was cool and provided shelter from the heat of the day, it was large enough to accommodate the growing population, and it was even a symbol of the city. What about the archives, then? I asked as I glanced up, and excitement filled my voice. The open space right at the entrance is large enough to fit everyone, and it's cool in there. That could work, Moskal agreed as he slipped his hands into his sleeves. We could have word spread during the evening meal, and we'd be able to hold the meeting come morning. Tomorrow would work best. I nodded and glanced down at the papers strewn in front of us. We'd be able to get almost everything in one go, well, or most of it at least. Then we shall spread the word, Ruslan said as he stood up and offered his arm to Julia. You should get some rest. I'll stay here for a bit to look over some plans. I shook my head and pointed at the papers spread out in front of me. I want to make sure I have everything ready and haven't missed a thing. Spoken like a true lord, Julia mused with a smile. I grinned back as the three of them departed, and then I set to work. By the time I realized hours had passed, it was already dark outside the building. In fact, I could sense that it was only a few hours before dawn. With a yawn, I cast out my senses all around me and noticed Aliona wasn't inside of the temporary palace. In fact, she was still deep down inside of the underground library. She wasn't alone, either. Laika was down there with her. I was more than a little curious what they were doing down there, and I wondered if Aliona had gotten a chance to speak with her father before he left. So I sleepily made my way to the underground archives. Thankfully, my years in medical school and as an EMT made it easy for me to function on autopilot. My body knew the route to the underground library, and my mind knew exactly where in the subterranean maze they were. 
My mind and power led me to one of the hallways lined with doors that led to study rooms. I stopped in front of a door that had silver engravings, and I could tell Lyca and Aliona were in this room. I opened the door, and beyond stacks and stacks of books were my two lovers asleep on a large couch. Lyca was half-seated, and stretched out with her head on Lyca's lap was Aliona. They made a serene image, as if they were a painting and not two living beings. I took a step into the room, and Lyca's eyes snapped open as the wolf demi-human blinked slowly up at me. Hey, how's it uh, going in here? I smirked at her as I stepped toward the large couch. The two of you look pretty comfy. She only just fell asleep. Lyca murmured as she glanced at the princess in her lap. Really? I looked around at all the books strewn around the room. Has she been up this entire time looking at books? Evan? Aliona stirred and slowly opened her eyes. It's late. Come to bed. This isn't a bed, I replied softly as I walked over to the couch. You're in the library. Oh, was all Aliona said as she sat up. What's wrong? I asked as I sat down next to her. You seem pretty tired. I need to keep researching, Aliona murmured as she ran her fingers through her hair. I haven't found the right link to what befell those harpies yet. But I will. I have to. Lyca met my eyes over Aliona and shook her head. She mouthed, Father, to me, and I nodded. Did you get to say goodbye to your father before he left? I placed my hand on Aliona's back and pushed soothing, healing energy through to her. He said he was going to have some of your things brought to you. His eminence's time is precious, Aliona whispered back to me. He has more important things that need his attention. Aliona, this is your father we're talking about. I frowned at her reaction and glanced back at a wincing Lyca. You're obviously important to him. I didn't say I wasn't important to him. Aliona countered easily as she leaned back against me. Just that he has many burdens on his shoulders. I have no right to be so selfish as to demand his time. I didn't know what to say to her at the moment, since she was right about the fact that her father carried the weight of the entire world on his shoulders. He couldn't be distracted for even a moment, or disaster could strike. Perhaps even the fires of the apocalypse would rain down on the world of Inadi. But I could make her a promise. Aliona, I began as I tilted her head so she'd look at me. I will never turn you away. It doesn't matter where I'm at or what's happening. If you want me by your side, I will be there. And when he is not able to, Lyca added solemnly, I will be there in his place. Thank you, Aliona replied, and her voice was thick with emotion. Thank you, both of you. We spent the night quietly together amongst the pile of books and on the soft pillows of the couch in the study room. The three of us dozed off in each other's arms, and it felt like I had just closed my eyes when I felt someone shake my shoulder. Huh? I mumbled as I blearily opened my eyes. Shh. Like his voice replied, and I finally focused on her shadow form hunched over me. The demi-human looked bright-eyed as she crouched beside the sofa I was reclined on, and she pressed a slender finger against her mouth. Then she nodded slightly downward, and I glanced in that direction to find Aliona curled up and fast asleep on my chest. She weighed practically nothing, and in my hazy mind I'd mistaken her for a warm blanket. What time is it? I mouthed to Lyca. Not yet dawn. She breathed in my ear. I thought you might like to get some breakfast before the town hall meeting begins. We have almost an hour. I nodded silently as I slipped my hands beneath Aliona's head and started to wiggle out from underneath her. Part of me wanted to wake her up so she could join us for breakfast, but I knew how hard she'd been pushing herself by combing through the archives and searching for answers about the harpies. She deserved some rest, and since I knew she wasn't the best at looking out for herself, I'd do it for her. I bet Lyca was of the same mind since she had been so careful just to wake only me. I slid Aliona into the warm spot my body vacated on the couch, and she furrowed her brow as she settled. I froze and hoped I hadn't woken her, but her face finally smoothed out and she sighed in her sleep. I smiled and pulled a blanket up to cover her, and then I feathered a light kiss into her hair. Lyca was standing right behind me when I straightened up, and she gave me a silent nod before she turned and headed toward the door. I trailed after her waving bushy tail, and I made sure to shut the door quietly behind me. 
Morning, I said in a normal volume once we reached the end of the hall and started to climb the staircase out of the underground archives. Good morning. Lyka replied with a quick smile. Sleep well? Yes and no, I chuckled as I rubbed a crick in my neck. Yes, because any night I spend between you and Aliona is amazing. But I don't think that couch was made with a dragon in mind. Or three people. <laughs> Lyka laughed. That too. I grinned, and my eyes drifted down towards Lyka's still-waving tail. The tip of it brushed against my wrist, and her fur was as soft as silk. I reached out without thinking and ran my hand over the appendage, and Lyka paused on the step above me as a shiver raced down her spine. Well, hopefully breakfast will make up for your sore back. She teased as she glanced over her shoulder, but I saw more than playfulness in her eyes. I know something that will definitely take my mind off it, I said and ran my hand up her tail again. This time, I continued past the base and trailed my fingers over the soft curve of her ass before I latched onto her hip and pulled her against me. Evan! Lyka chided. But I could see the tinge of red on her cheeks, and her hands on my chest weren't exactly pushing me away. Lyka! I teased as I dipped my head and ran my tongue over her thundering pulse. The town hall meeting will start soon, she said as I shifted to pin her against the wall of the stairwell. People will be arriving. She trailed off with a moan as I pressed my erection against her pelvis and hitched her leg over my hip. And? I whispered in her ear. What about breakfast? She asked in a husky voice, but her arms were already wrapped around my neck. I see something far more delicious right in front of me. I growled before I ducked my head and devoured her mouth with my own. The demi-human's tongue swirled around mine, and her sharp canines nipped at my lower lip as she bucked her hips against me. I could already feel the heat radiating between her legs, and I delved a hand down between us to stroke her through her pants. She was already soaking wet, and an aroused snarl slipped past my lips as I tore my mouth away from hers to attack her neck once more. As I left a trail of nipping kisses along her throat and collarbone, I hoisted her farther up the wall and wedged my thigh beneath her. Lyka dangled in the air, held up only by my leg, but the way she moaned and threw back her head told me she was fine with it. So I shoved the waistband of her pants down around her thighs, and I wasted no time in zeroing in on her wet, hot pussy. Her pussy lips were already slick with her own juices, and I ran my finger up her slit before I settled it over her throbbing clit. Evan! Lyka gasped, and her airy voice echoed down the staircase. Shh! I teased as I started painting slow circles over her clit. Didn't you say people would be arriving soon? Lyka bit her lower lip until it turned red, and the tendons in her neck stood out in the effort she was exercising to remain quiet. I smirked at my lover's face, and then I slipped two fingers inside of her at once. Lyka gasped again, but it came out more as a strangled cough, and she slapped her hand over her mouth as more moans threatened to spill out. My cock was throbbing in my pants, but I ignored it as my eyes devoured the sight of the stoic warrior falling apart on my fingers. I alternated between fast and slow rhythms but I kept my thumb glued firmly to her clit as I kissed and bit at her neck. Lyka's ears spasmed on her head as her whole body twitched at my touch, and she was growing wetter and wetter by the second. Then my draconic hearing picked up the distant mutter of voices, and I realized my lover had been right about people arriving soon. A part of me didn't care if the whole of Hatra saw me fucking my beautiful wolf, but I knew the professional and dutiful Lyka would probably be mortified. So I sped up my fingers again, and then I began rubbing her clit with one of my fingers while I plunged the other two into her. Desperate whines vibrated at the back of Lyka's throat, and I felt her claws dig into the meat of my shoulders as her pussy clamped down on me, and a gush of warmth spilled over my fingers. I ghosted my thumb over her clit one last time, and then I pulled my hand from between her thighs but still kept her pinned against the wall. Like I said, I growled as I met Lyka's heavy-lidded eyes and licked her juices from my fingers. More delicious than breakfast. Do I get something too? Lyka grinned and trailed her hand down to palm my rock-hard erection. 
as much as I would like that, I chuckled as I pulled up her pants and set the wolf on her feet again. The first arrivals for the meeting will be here in one minute, give or take. Like a blinked, and then I watched her ears swivel on her head. A moment later, her eyes went wide, and her cheeks flushed a bright pink. You're right, she muttered as she patted down her hair and shifted her pants around. I will have to repay you later. If you want, maybe we can run and get an actual breakfast before the meeting starts, I suggested. You are delicious, but I could go for some toast. Actually, like aside, I wanted to ask you something over breakfast, but since the meeting will start soon, I will ask you now. Shoot, I leaned in against the wall and nodded at her. I wanted to request leave from the meeting, she replied. You don't want to be there? I asked with a frown. She shook her head. It is not that I do not want to attend. It's just, I've been thinking of the Oracallum mine all night. I know we spoke about guarding it, but I would rather see to it sooner rather than later. All right, I nodded. That will definitely be a load off my mind, too. Do I need to join you to unseal the mine? No, the wolf replied with a smile. I believe Daya gave us an enchantment we could use for that purpose. I'll organize a retinue of the warriors to go with me, but I wanted to make sure it was okay with you first. You have my permission, but be safe, I cautioned as I bent to press a kiss to her forehead. I am always safe, Lyka responded as she adjusted the strap of her bracer. In fact, you're the reckless one. I grinned at her cheekiness, but before I could respond, I realized the voices I had heard earlier were distinctly louder. Lyka glanced over her shoulder, and her cheeks flushed red again. I must go now, she muttered as she started to climb the stairs once more. My eyes trailed after her and the way her hips swung with each step she took. You might want to take a quick shower first, I called out to her when she reached the top of the stairs. Lyka glanced back at me with a confused frown, but I just smirked and tapped my nose. The wolf somehow blushed an even deeper red before she sprinted out the door. I chuckled to myself as I climbed back down the staircase that smelled very clearly of sex, and then I headed to the atrium of the underground library. Within fifteen minutes, the hall was just beginning to fill up with my people. A table and chairs had been set up toward one side of the hall, and the members of the council sat there. My parents and Moscow sat to one side of the table, and on the other half were the three advisors from the Blue Tree Guild. Pyotr, like his grandfather and the former leader of the guild, had a curious gleam in his dark gray eyes. He was a wolf demi-human, just like his granddaughter. Next to him was another advisor, Daya. She was a fox demi-human and the mistress of war for the Blue Tree Guild. The faint scent of blood lurked around her as her crimson eyes scanned the crowd, and she toyed with the end of her long, purple braid. The last advisor from the guild was Tion, a crow demi-human and the guild's master of commerce. His eyes were a rich blue, and his hair was such a dark blue that it was almost black. We are ready whenever you are, Julia murmured from behind her fan. I nodded and turned around to face the large crowd. There were easily over a thousand people in the hall, and yet there was still room for even more. Hello everyone, this is something new we're going to be trying, I announced loudly, and my voice echoed throughout the chamber. We are aiming to have one of these town hall meetings at least once a month. You're going to be able to talk with us and let us know about any concerns you have about anything, and we'll answer your questions. There was a moment of silence before everyone suddenly spoke all at once. Uh, the kitchens, began a man before he was cut off by someone else. We still have to lug water to the farms, echoed throughout the hall as it was repeated by several people. What are we going to do about food? A nervous voice chirped up and attempted to be heard over the chaos. Whoa! I raised my voice over the chaos and let a crack of thunder echo in the room. Hold on! One person needs to speak at a time. Otherwise, I won't be able to understand anyone. How about one person from each family or group comes up as a representative to speak with us? The crowd quieted down quickly at my words, and they began to murmur amongst themselves. Well done on controlling the crowd. Julia said as she tapped her fan against her palm with a small smile. They listened to you immediately. In hindsight, I probably should have said that first, I chuckled as I rubbed the back of my neck, and I absently noticed my hair had gotten longer than I usually kept it. It doesn't matter, 
Pyotr said as he crossed his arms over his chest. An issue came up, and you took care of it succinctly. Now we wait for them to organize themselves. We will not have to wait long, Moscow murmured as he tilted his head to the side. They have already divided themselves up into groups, according to where they live and what they do, I think. Heh, <laughs> just as expected from my son, Ruslan smirked as he leaned forward on the table. You didn't raise him, Julia murmured as she snapped her fan open. His good qualities don't come from you. Can't you let me gloat? Ruslan grumbled as he slumped in his chair. Calm down, Pops, I laughed as I glanced at the pouting fox. You can gloat later, when the meeting is finished and all of the work is done. There was little time for anything else to be said since three people stepped forward from the crowd. Of the three people who stood in front of us, I already knew two of them. Afra, the fox demi-human who I'd seen working in the farms before, was one of the three to step forward. On the top of her head were dark blue fox ears, and a long braid of the same color blue trailed over her shoulder. She seemed to be a bit nervous and kept ducking her head down. Next to Afra was a golden-haired teenager I knew to be Leon. He was someone I'd seen running around a lot, doing a lot of the small errands commanded by the three elders and myself. Then there was another fox demi-human in the group. I vaguely remembered him as being one of the victims of the attack from the corrupted corpses in Miasma. His eyes were bright like emeralds, and he had crimson hair tied up in a high ponytail between his fox ears. Introduce yourselves first in case I don't know you, I smiled reassuringly at the three people in front of me, and then tell me what your concern is. Simple, yeah? I am Afra, my lord, the female fox said as she stepped forward, dipped into a curtsy, and nervously tugged at her braided hair. I work at the farms. I know, I've seen you there. I couldn't help my smile. The young fox was so clearly nervous, but trying her best. What's happening at the farms that we need to know about? Well, your lordship fixed the aqueducts, so water now flows through most of the fountains in the city. Afra drew in a deep breath before she continued. Even so, we still have to draw buckets of water for the larger fields and the farms. Is there something that can be done to help us? Are there any fountains near the farms? I asked, and my brows furrowed as I remembered the way the area had been set up. There are, Afra replied before her face fell. But there is no water flow. We still have to bring bucket by bucket back to the water storage, or wait for the rain to fill it back up. There's a basic irrigation system in place, though, right? I tapped my fingers against my mouth as ideas floated around in my head. Yes, we have many canals made out of clay that attach to the bases of the smaller garden beds for the things like tomatoes and herbs. Afra's head bobbed up and down as her smile grew for a moment. For the larger fields, though, we use our magic to lift the water above them and sprinkle them like rain. I see, I mused. Okay, so we had something in place that could work in the short term. Uh, depending on other concerns brought up today, that may take priority. Thank you, Afra. Uh, um, I still have another concern. Afra twiddled her thumbs for a moment before she looked up at me. If it's okay for me to say another thing. It's okay, you can tell me. I took a step closer and placed a reassuring hand on her shoulder. Um, what are we going to do about food? Afra inquired as she nervously met my gaze. The farms are enough for right now, but we're going to have to expand in the future. And since we aren't under attack anymore by the miasma, maybe we can do more with the farms than what we've been growing. Especially if more people come to Hatra. You've put a lot of thought into this, I said with a smile. I was impressed by Afra's concern and the way she pushed through even though she was so clearly nervous. I'm sorry if I was too bold in bringing it up. Afra ducked her head down and her ears fell flat against her head. I just... I really care about the farms, and they've been destroyed by the miasma before. I'm excited we don't have to worry about that anymore. No, it's a good thing you told me, I said as I placed a finger under Afra's small chin and gently nudged her so she looked up at me. I want to know what's happening in my city and what's going on with my people, especially if there's something I can do to make everyone's lives easier. As for the farms, there are plans on extending them. In fact, architects are going to arrive within the week to help us do just that. Architects, my lord? Afra tilted her head to the side as her brow furrowed. People are going to come and help Hatra now? Yes. Hatra won't be ignored anymore. 
I removed my hand from her chin and ruffled the hair on the top of her head. The king has arranged for a caravan of workers and architects to arrive within a week. They'll be bringing all sorts of materials, from food to furniture, all for the purpose of rebuilding Hatra. This includes architects who have knowledge when it comes to agriculture. We can't just throw down seeds anywhere, after all. Thank you, my lord. Afra's eyes glittered with happiness as she stepped back into line. Who's next? I asked as I looked between the two remaining representatives. Leon, my lord! Golden-haired Leon stepped forward and dipped into a quick bow. I do many of the odds and ends for your lord, father, and lady mother. They make you run around a lot, don't they? I chuckled as I clapped a hand on Leon's shoulder. I think I've seen you almost everywhere around the city, most of the time carrying papers and charcoal pencils. You've done a great job in examining the structural work of the Lunar Palace, by the way. It's an honor to be part of the rebuilding process, Leon nodded as he clasped his arms behind his back. So tell me, I began, and I had the feeling Leon was going to cover quite a lot of concerns. What do I need to know? A variety of things, but I'll start with the kitchens, Leon took in a breath before he continued with his explanation. With Hatra's population growth, the kitchen isn't as functional as it was before. Right now, the people of Hatra and the members of the Blue Tree Guild have their meals separately. There really isn't space for them in the communal eating area, nor is there enough space to even cook for them. We have the manpower necessary for it, but we don't have enough space. I've seen the structural plans you've drawn, I replied as I looked over the large crowd and knew that feeding over a thousand people a day couldn't be an easy task. Can you draw up how the communal cooking and eating area is right now so I can take a look and have a better understanding of where everything is? Of course! Leon grinned, and there was more than a bit of youthful enthusiasm in his smile. I can have that ready for you by the end of the day! So what's next? I asked. You said you had a variety of things to bring up. Well, it's all along the same lines of the communal kitchen, Leon frowned for a moment before he shook his head. You've restored a lot of the buildings after the battle, but can we have larger areas for our work? The potters and weavers have been working with what we've been able to scavenge and rebuild with our own hands and knowledge. But since we're going to be a proper city now, we need more kilns and workspaces. This would take a bit more brainstorming in order to figure out. Getting Natalia and Ruslan's opinion on this would be a good idea since the smithy was in the area that needed to be worked on. Draw up the plans for the area where the craftsmen are, I instructed as I tilted my head. I think I have an idea for how to expand, but I want to see the plans first before we start digging anything up and tearing down walls. Of course! Leon nodded and took a step back until he was in line with Afra. The two exchanged soft smiles, and I wondered if there was a young romance budding in front of me. Maybe I could nudge it in the right direction when I had the time. Then the remaining representative stepped forward, a young fox demi-human with red hair and a high ponytail. And you are? I asked. Looking at him, I remembered I'd seen this boy help teach Ilya during one of the training sessions. My name is Dagon, my lord. The young fox answered as he glanced up at me, and his emerald eyes glittered with awe. Dagon, I repeated and tilted my head to the side as I studied him. You're one of the former bandits. How's everyone been settling in? Just fine, sir. Dagon raised his hand in salute and grinned at me. We've always been on Otra's side, so it's not that much of a change for us, except we have a solid roof over our heads and lots of good food. And the miasma isn't here anymore. Things are easier for all of us now. That's good to hear, I nodded, relieved to know they had settled in nicely. Then, what should I know? Well, we kind of wanted to know if some of us could leave for a few days. Dagon's ears fell flat on his head as he looked at me through the bangs of his hair. You want to leave, Hatra? I frowned at those words, but if anyone truly wanted to leave, I wouldn't stop them. Not permanently. Dagon's ears shot straight up, and the fur on his tail bristled nervously just to go and get our things from the old hideouts. We want to give everything we can. We don't know if anything survived when the miasma took us, but it's worth a try. At least that's what we think. What do you have in the hideouts? I questioned. I hadn't considered the possibility of the bandits having anything usable, but I was wrong. Well, there's food and our things, Dagon said as he began to list items on his fingers. We have some treasures, too. Stuff like furniture and jewels, 
and there's some fancy silks that we got off some merchants. I thought, well, maybe Lady Julia and the princess could have the silks and pretty things. Daya, can you spare a group to go with them? I asked and looked over my shoulder at the fox advisor. Preferably with someone who has access to spatial magic so we don't have to worry about transporting anything? Of course. Daya nodded at me before she glanced over at the young boy. Come and see me afterwards. We'll arrange a trip to your hideouts using one of our smaller airships after we've located them on the map. We don't want to risk anyone being attacked. Thank you, sir. Ma'am. Dagan bounced on his heels for a moment before his ears flopped backwards. Uh, There's also one other thing. What is it? I raised an eyebrow. Well, I'd like to volunteer. Dagan stumbled over his words for a moment before he rushed everything out. For, um, anything you need done. I can run messages or gather papers for you, whatever, sir. Like a page? Julia interjected as she fanned herself. That is what you mean, is it not? Yes, ma'am. Dagan glanced between Julia and myself. Uh, your ladyship? What do you think about taking him on, Evan? Julia asked as she shifted her gaze over to me. Having a page now would help, especially for errands and duties in the future. My mother had a point. Eventually, there would be things I wouldn't be able to do myself, because I'd be focused on things of more importance. This was something I'd have to get used to, and it would be easier if I started now instead of leaving it for later. Then I'll be in your care, I nodded at the young fox and extended a hand to him. I look forward to working with you, Dagon. I'll do my very best, my lord. Dagon shook my hand eagerly before he stepped back into line with the other two representatives. Is there anything else we need to cover? I asked as I looked between the three representatives and the large crowd behind them. If there isn't, we'll have another meeting when the architects I mentioned arrive so we can go over the plans with them. After that... The town hall meetings will be on a monthly basis, unless there's an emergency. I think we are satisfied, my lord, Leon replied as he bent in a shallow bow before he glanced up at me. If anyone has a concern, I'll let you know. Perfect, thanks, Leon. I nodded at the elders and advisors behind me. If there are any more questions, you can ask me or any of the elders and advisors from the Blue Tree Guild. Just remember, we're in this together. We are one family, and nothing will break us apart. A deafening cheer went up at my words, and it reverberated throughout the chamber. It didn't matter if they were the adventurers and members of the clans of the Blue Tree Guild, or if they were the blood of Hatra, they expressed themselves as one family. There was a strength here, and I knew the thread of fate that tied us all together wasn't flimsy, so nothing would be able to tear us apart from each other. These were my people. They placed their trust in me, and for that I would destroy whatever demon lord that even so much as glanced in their direction. Well done, Pyotr said from behind me. That last bit should quell any doubts that could have been lurking inside of the hearts of anyone present. Oh? I turned to face the old wolf. And how would you rate me according to your experience as a leader? You controlled the flow of information easily so as to not panic anyone. Pyotr stroked his chin as he hummed in thought. You addressed the main points brought up by the three representatives, and you ended the meeting on a high note. All in all, not bad. But there is room for growth in you. I'm interested to see what kind of leader you shall be in the coming years, and exactly what kind of future you'll be leading us to. As interesting as this conversation is, Daya yawned as she stood up from her seat. I have scouting groups to coordinate. I'll send a runner if we have any news. I will accompany you. Tion said, as he stood from his seat as well and dipped forward in a shallow bow. I will find out what I can about the jade charm Laika handed to me. I nodded at the crow demi-human, and he turned to follow Daya as she sauntered lazily toward the entrance. We needed answers about the sect who had attacked us three times now. They had the advantage for the time being, but it wouldn't stay like that for long. I was determined to bring the fight to them. Turnabout was fair play, and they'd been picking on my city for far too long now. Wipe that stern look off your face, Rustlin chuckled beside me as he ruffled my hair. Look at how calm everyone is. They trust you and your actions. Don't worry about the green glass sect. We're on guard for them now, and there is little that can be done about them while we wait for more information. I turned back to face the crowd of people as they slowly began to disperse. Some of them were heading up the large marble staircase back to the surface, and others were taking advantage of the coolness provided by the underground library. 
they milled about and headed to some of the seats and tables along the far walls of the atrium-like space, and some even went further down into the corridors of the library, and I could see them browsing through the bookshelves. You're right, I replied as I pushed away thoughts of the attacks. This is a time for hard work and cheerfulness. The harder we work, the better the food we get to eat, Ruslan laughed as he walked back to where Julia and Moskal sat. I'll be at the smithy, if you need me. I snorted and shook my head at my father's antics. There was a long day ahead of us, and hopefully, I'd have time to talk to Asher at the end of it. All right, the three of you are coming with me, I said as I turned to the three teenagers. Let's head out to check the irrigation system at our current farms before we head over to look at the kitchens. There should be something we'd be able to do today. I would be honored, Leon inclined his head before he peeked at the foxes next to him. Uh, of course! Aphra dipped into a quick curtsy as her tail quivered with excitement behind her. Yes, sir! Dagon brought up his hand to salute me before he froze and dropped into a deep bow. Sorry, sir, I mean, my lord. Don't worry about it! I laughed good-naturedly and waved the three of them over. This might take some time getting used to, and I won't get mad if anyone makes any mistakes. If you do, use them as opportunities to learn and make yourselves better. The three teenagers cocked their heads to the side exactly at the same time, and I had to stifle another laugh. It couldn't have been more coordinated if they planned it. Where will we be heading first, my lord? Aphra asked sweetly as she clasped her hands in front of her. We're going to tweak the water irrigation tank, I explained as I motioned for them to follow me toward the staircase. Even though we're going to expand and relocate the farms when the architects arrive, that won't be for some time, and it'll be a while until those new farms begin to start producing for us. This is true, Afra nodded as she lengthened her stride to try and match our pace. Even with our powers, it would still take a day for a plant to reach full maturity from a seed. It would take longer if there's so much more, and if they're bigger plants. So what are we going to use those farms for in the future? Leon asked as he kept an easy pace with me and offered his arm to Afra. Thank you. Afra's voice came out as a slight squeak, and a faint blush crossed her cheeks as she held on to him. We keep them, I answered Leon, and I resisted the urge to smirk at the two teenagers. Once we have the other farms up and running, we can convert the old, smaller one for growing medicinal herbs and as a nursery for the dragon's blood saplings. Maybe even as a nursery for whatever new plants we get our hands on. Really? Afra's voice trembled with excitement as she stopped on the stairs to look at me. We can use all of that space for growing herbs? If I knew you were going to be so excited, I laughed as I paused on the step below her, I would have asked the king to bring new plants and seeds for you. Those words only made Afra glow even more with excitement and happiness. Oh, I think there's some seeds back in our old outposts, Dagon offered up as he peeked at Afra. We grew some things, not as fancy or proper like what you guys have here, but enough to treat our wounds and things like that. Seems like you're going to be pretty busy, Leon chuckled as he nudged Afra with his shoulder. We continued up the staircase, and just when we reached the surface, a twinge of pain burned behind my eyes. I blinked rapidly to try and see if it was because of the sudden change in lighting. It was definitely much brighter outside of the library, but this had never happened before. My lord? There was a hint of worry in Afra's voice as she stepped toward me. Is something wrong? Don't worry, just something in my eye, I frowned as I rubbed at my face. Probably some, some dirt or sand. It is a bit windy today, Leon mused as he peered off in the distance. There were still some tents set up in the distance, and their fabric flapped in the wind. Even though there was no risk of them flying away since I could see they were securely tied down, it was like the wind was determined to take them away with it. Looks like there's a storm coming, Dagon added as he sniffed at the air. Then we should probably get to the farms before we're reined in. I started walking again, and the three teenagers fell into step beside me. Just as Dagon had said, large gray clouds loomed off in the distance. They were dark and menacing, and I could smell rain in the air. It wasn't like how I would smell it back on Earth when I was just a human. It was like I could smell each individual droplet hovering in the distance and the sparkle of lightning. The plants will be happy today, Afra murmured as she peeked up at the sky. None of us will be if we get sick, I replied back to her. So let's have a race. The first one out of the three of you to the farms will get a prize from me. A prize? Dagon echoed, 
and his ears swiveled on his head. What kind of prize would the first one win? Well, I trailed off for a moment. They'll get to ask for anything they want. The three teenagers exchanged glances before they darted off ahead of me through the bluestone streets of Hatra. I'd barely finished speaking, and they had taken off immediately. I wondered what it was that each of them wanted so desperately. Well, I'd find out soon enough. I could reach the farms ahead of them, and I would. With a running jump, I'd landed on the roof of a nearby building, and hundreds upon hundreds of roofs continued on in the distance. All of Hatra was at my feet, and there were thousands of paths I could take to reach the farms, so I took off and used the rooftops to guide me. I could hear and see everything from here, and it was like a part of my city, and every pulse of my heart was Hatra's own heartbeat. The smell of baking bread filled the air and tempted me to stop by the kitchens. It wasn't just bread I could smell, though. There was also meat roasting, and the scent of fire promised warmth and protection. I could hear the faint sound of metal hitting metal, and I knew that had to be coming from the smithy. Natalia and Ruslan were probably already working through the supply of oracalum we had in the city, or they were working with the smiths from the Blue Tree Guild. Either way, objects of sheer beauty were surely being crafted. Suddenly, I came to a stop in the farms. I hadn't even noticed when I'd arrived. I was too taken in by the smells and sounds of my beautiful city. The farms were just as I remembered them, built within the remains of houses from when Hatra was a thriving city. Vines climbed up the cobbled stone walls, almost hiding them from view, so it looked like we had stepped into a secret garden. As far as the eye could see, everything was green and full of vigor. Off to the side, actually at the center of the garden complex, was the tank Afra had mentioned back in the meeting. It looked to be carved completely from stone, and there were small etchings along the side of it. The tank was actually a massive thing, and at first glance, it just looked like the wall of a building— until, that is, one realized it wasn't a building at all. The sound of feet hitting the cobblestones drew my attention away from the tank, and I turned just in time to see Afra reach the farms far ahead of the two other teenagers. Did I beat them, my lord? Afra panted and used her hand to fan herself as she leaned against one of the vine-covered walls. You did! Congrats! I smiled as I ruffled Afra's hair. What do you want? Uh, I can't think of anything, my lord. Afra confessed shyly as she hid her face. I feel so blessed and so happy to have this life. Suddenly, Leon and Dagon skidded to a stop and nearly crashed into us. Whoa! I spun away from the chaos with Afra in my arms. Calm down there! Sorry, my lord, Afra! Leon sheepishly smiled at us from where he'd landed on the floor. I forgot how slippery the entrance can be. I need to get used to this city, Dagon admitted as he sat up. Then we're racing again. Seems to me like Afra would still beat the two of you. I raised an eyebrow at the two boys as I nodded at Afra. Isn't that right? If it's to the farms. Afra replied confidently as she stepped away from me. I'll always beat them. That's the kind of confidence I like. I grinned as I stepped toward the tank. Now, let's get to work before those rain clouds cut our day short. What do we need to do? Dagon asked as he dusted himself off. Well, it'll mostly be Afra and myself, I admitted as I faced the water tank, unless you're capable of controlling stone and earth. I can't. Dagon's ears and tails drooped. Sorry, my lord. Don't worry, Leon patted the brooding fox on the back. There'll be something you can do later on. Everyone has their own place, after all. Leon's right, I said as I glanced behind me at the teenagers. There'll be something only you can do in the future. Trust me on that. Yes, my lord. Dagon exclaimed with a grin, and his ears perked up again. Afra, this is perfectly in the center, right? I asked as I glanced at the young fox at my side and gathered my power inside of me. Yes, my lord. Afra replied and looked up at me. Why? It'll just make things easier. I drew in a slow breath as I closed my eyes. No one move until I say so. I let my power seep into the earth all around us, and it followed the larger fields of plants. I made sure to take careful notice of where all the roots extended into the earth, since it would be counterproductive if I ended up damaging any of them. It didn't take long before my magic covered the entire area, and I could feel every ounce of dirt with my mind. And now, all I had to do was push. So, I pushed down on the earth with my power, and miniature canals formed around the larger fields and around the plants. 
All the miniature canals were then connected by one large canal. I took extra care in the creation of this and made sure to harden the earth into stone. This was the channel that would carry water from the tank to the big fields. Then I grasped a hold of the stone water tank and pulled onto it. A stone pipe extended from it and shot out into the main canal I'd created. A moment later, water gushed out of the pipe and into the canals I'd created around the plants, flooding their roots. It's done, I said with a deep sigh as I let go of my power and opened my eyes. You can move now. It's amazing, Afra breathed out as she took a step toward the main canal. This will make everything so much easier now. Thank you. It was just like I had visualized in my mind, except the water seemed to glisten and glow in front of us as it flowed out of the massive tank. Just then, the downpour began. Oh no! It started to rain! Afra cried out as she ducked into a nearby alcove and glanced up at the stormy sky. Dagon and Leon quickly followed after her, but they had all gotten soaked by the sudden rain. The three of you get somewhere dry! I called out to the teenagers. We'll continue this another day. The three teens nodded at me, and I faintly heard Leon say, run, before the three of them dashed away in the direction of the kitchens. Well, at least this would give me time to talk to Asher undisturbed. With an effortless jump, I made it to the roof of an empty building. Once there, I pulled at the surrounding stone with my power and brought up a simple pavilion to shelter me from the rain. Asher, you awake in there? I asked as I leaned against the blue stone wall and stared out over the city. You have need of me? Asher's voice echoed inside of my mind, and it was almost faint, as if he was speaking across a large expanse. I need answers, I replied and gritted my teeth together. About the green glass sect and the man named Olivier. I was going to find out everything I could about him. Then I was going to track him down and rip him apart with my own claws. Chapter 4 Olivier? Asher's confused voice echoed throughout my mind. He is the one who came to Hatra before we arrived, isn't he? Yes, under the pretense of being a traveling scholar, I replied as I closed my eyes and listened to the sound of the falling rain. He was welcomed into the city, and then a magical array opened up above the center of Hatra. Corrupted corpses and people controlled by the miasma fell through it and attacked us. Aliona was also attacked by the miasma that day and fell into deviation. If I hadn't been in the city, Hatra would have fallen again, and no one would have been left. Thunder cracked in the distance, and a strike of lightning dove down through the sky like an angry silver arrow. The anger inside of me rose with each strike of lightning, and I had the feeling my rampant emotions were affecting the weather. I see, Asher murmured from within my spiritual sea. You are right to have such a grudge against him. I can feel the seething anger inside of you begin to rise at the mere stirring of that memory. I want to kill him, I confessed as my anger swirled inside of me viciously. And I'll use my own hands to rip the life from him. I won't be satisfied with anything less. I understand the pain of wanting revenge. Regret tinged Asher's voice. And if he could have had his own body, I knew his eyes would have been shut tightly. But I don't remember this man. I don't know if the memory is blocked, or if I've never truly seen him. I'm trying to remember, but when I do, the miasma just tightens around my soul. I opened my eyes at those words. It didn't make sense for parts of Asher's memories to have been blocked away. That would only happen if the miasma was trying to hide something from him, and by extension, me. Asher's master had to know Asher was far out of his reach now so maybe this was a failsafe that had been put into place. Either way, its very existence gave me the clue I needed. Then this means Olivier's someone important, I mused as I leaned back against the wall and crossed my arms over my chest in triumph. What do you mean? Confusion radiated from Asher's voice. He's important because I cannot remember him? If the miasma is trying so hard to keep the memories of him out of reach from your consciousness... I explained to my former enemy. Then that means he's high up in the green glass sect. He's someone the miasma is trying to protect. This was a common mistake I'd seen a lot in movies and games back on Earth. 
Instead of erasing everything so no one would know what was missing, people would specifically hide or erase what they didn't want anyone to know about. And that gap was the clue. This irritates me, Asher growled out. Even now, the miasma and its master is still treating me as a puppet. I doubt I'll ever be free of it in this life. Calm down, I replied. Stop thinking about him before you hurt yourself. I have an idea for us to try. What? Asher struggled to contain the anger in his voice. Didn't you want to know everything you can about him? Sometimes you have to take the long way to get to where you want to go, I replied. My anger had frozen over, and it was ready to be used as a weapon. And that's just what I'm going to do with this. Trust me on this. I obviously do, Asher replied quietly. Before the Green Glass Sect army came to Hatra, I began, did you stop anywhere, or do you remember anything about the route you took to get here? Well, we came, uh... I'm not sure how we came to Hatra, but we couldn't have gone through a portal. Asher seemed confused by his own lack of knowledge and began to ramble on almost to himself. That amount of concentrated power would have set warning bells off for anyone. Not to mention the amount needed just to transport all of us would have been immense. How did no one notice us? That's a start, I remarked as I chewed on my lip. So you guys came by foot or something? We must have. However, we would have needed to avoid arousing suspicions from the kingdom's guards, so we probably traveled in smaller groups. Which means you would have needed a meeting place, I pointed out. Can you think of where you would have met up with everyone? We came from the east. I remember traveling through the forest and the mountains. Did you stop in the mountains at all? I asked. That's some harsh terrain, especially for a large group to travel through. You must have stopped somewhere to rest. We did. Asher's voice trailed off. Do you remember where? I prodded him further. Was it near Hatra? There was an old fortress, deep in the mountains. I thought it was abandoned at first, but it wasn't. And there were strange things there amongst the people who lived in the fortress. What kind of things? I questioned with a sharp frown. Did you see harpies there? I don't... I can't tell you. Asher sounded strained as he attempted to answer me. There was something. There was something old and dark there. It gave me an order, and I followed the order. I know I did. I was supposed to attack Hatra, so I led everyone to the walls of Hatra. Can you remember anything about who gave you the order? I demanded. The sage. Asher's voice was pained as he answered me. It was the sage. He said to wipe out Hatra and to bring back what was his. His? I snarled as my hands tightened into fists and my claws sliced my palms. Did he say what it was? No, Asher responded, and confusion was clear in his voice. He said we would find it underneath the city, and it was ready for us to take back to him. I see... I gritted my teeth angrily as I let out a breath and jumped off the roof of the building. Those words could only mean two things, and neither pleased me. The sage was either targeting the underground library or Aliona. Even worse, he could be after both of them. It didn't matter, though, because he wasn't going to get either of them. Where are you going? Asher asked, and his voice was still pained. To talk to the survivors from the battle. I replied as I made my way across the roofs of the city. Do you want to talk to them and know how they're doing? No. The pain in Asher's voice wasn't just from fighting whatever had control of him. It sounded like actual regret and guilt. It's pointless for me to do so anyway. I can do nothing for them, nor can I even remember them. I know you will be chivalrous in regards to them. Maybe, I muttered as I kept running. The rain hadn't let up, but I wasn't going to let a little thing like rain stop me from heading over to the Blue Tree Guild's airship. If anything, the poor weather would make sure I didn't run into anyone so I could reach my destination faster. Slipping into the airship wasn't difficult. I had the authority to go wherever I pleased since I was their liege lord. The hallways of the airship weren't crowded either, and the few people I bumped into only bowed or nodded respectfully in my direction. A doubt curled inside of me when I was almost to the brig. What if the prisoners were in the same situation Asher was in? 
What if they couldn't give me answers because they were still tormented by the miasma too? Asher had the benefit of my continued healing magic pretty much every single second, but the prisoners didn't have that luxury. I wasn't sure exactly why, but I felt a twinge of worry and my instincts began to impatiently rear their head. I needed to know what had been happening to the prisoners during their time in the brig, and if any of them had reported similar symptoms to what Asher had been showing. Just then, a young wolf demihuman carrying a bundle of scrolls walked down the hallway in my direction, so I waved her toward me. Greetings, my lord. The young wolf girl curtsied as daintily as she could with her burden. May I assist you in something? As a matter of fact, you can. I racked my head for who would be a good choice and settle on one. I need you to inform Daya that I'm requesting her presence while I check up on the prisoners from the Green Glass Sect. Of course, my lord. She replied as she shifted her burden to one arm. I'll send her a message immediately. The wolf girl placed a hand on the gorget around her throat, and I felt an imperceptible shift of magic in the air. I hadn't felt this the other times I'd seen Laika or Anton send messages through the gorget, so maybe I was becoming more attuned to the magic and energy of this world. Daya doesn't need to rush, I added as an afterthought, but tell her to make it a priority. The wolf girl's ears flopped as she nodded, and a bright smile flitted across her face. Lady Daya says she's on her way. Is there anything else I can do for you, my lord? I grinned back at the girl. Nah, that was perfect. She curtsied again and continued on down the corridor while I started walking again to the brig. After that short interaction, I made it to the brig easily and without anyone bothering me. The prisoners from the Green Glass Sect weren't in the horrible condition I'd first seen them in. They were still in the Blue Tree Guild's prison cells, but they had proper beds and they were spread out further. Instead of it being ten prisoners per cell, there were now only five prisoners per cell. It was the middle of the day, so I thought they would be awake, but none of them were. All of them were in a fitful sleep that almost reminded me of the way Asher would fall silent in my spiritual sea and how the snake demi-human remained comatose. My heart began to race inside of my chest, and my instincts seemed to rise ferally inside of me. These people may have been my enemies once, but it was not of their own free will, and after seeing what Asher suffered through, I was angry that these people were still being controlled by some malevolent outside force. I walked toward the closest cell and saw the dark-haired crow demi-human I'd spoken to the first time I was here. Maybe I would be able to wake him up. But first, how was I going to get into the cell? Before, the guards from the Blue Tree Guild had opened it for me, but there was no one in here. I could try and break the cell door open. I wasn't sure how strong they were, but surely they wouldn't be able to stand up to the strength of an angry dragon. I placed a clawed hand on the door of the cell, and it swung wide open to my surprise. According to the guards, Daya's drawl echoed throughout the brig, the prisoners only just fell asleep, perhaps half an hour ago. But it is a strange sleep. It seemed to befall them all at once. I glanced back to see Daya leaning on the doorframe of the entrance, and the dark-haired fox demi-human smirked back at me as she stepped into the brig. Obviously, the door swinging open was her doing, but I wasn't sure how she'd accomplished it. How would the guards know when they fell asleep? I replied back at her. There isn't anyone here. The guards have been keeping an eye on them with magic. Daya walked toward me with a frown on her face. All in order to give them some more privacy so they wouldn't feel exactly like prisoners. We've been treating them kindly, like you've told us to. Not exactly guests, but not prisoners either. That doesn't explain why they're like this. I turned back to face the unconscious crow demi-human and walked into his cell. As I studied the prisoners before me, I knew this was an unnatural sleep, but I wasn't sure what to do to wake up any of them. We still hadn't figured out how to wake up the snake girl, let alone hundreds more. Whatever this was that was happening, it was because of the miasma and whoever this sage was. The guards already tried to wake them. Daya called out from behind me. Nothing they tried worked. They even used magic. When that failed, we were just about to call you. But here you are. The guards aren't me, I replied quickly as I knelt next to the crow's bed. I might be able to do something about this. I focused on the crow demi-human in front of me, but nothing would come up, not even the status check I'd grown to rely on. There was absolutely nothing but the slight twinge of miasma as it burned my senses. 
I reached out a hand to the sleeping crow and placed it on his shoulder. Then I sent out a quick burst of lightning along the tips of my fingers, not enough to seriously hurt anyone, but enough to wake even the deepest of sleepers from their slumber. It didn't work. The crow demi-human remained asleep, even fitful as it was. They won't be able to tell you anything more than the puppet man did. Mariah's calm voice shattered the silence in my spiritual sea. What do you mean by that? I grumbled back to the spirit. My lord? Daya asked curiously behind me, and I realized I'd spoken out loud. I waved the mistress of war off. The sword of Hatra is speaking to me. Just a moment. There is something quite close to a gesh on these poor souls, Mariah explained languidly in my mind. It's wrapped around the innermost veins of their heart. If you want any information from them, you will have to break it first. I gritted my teeth as I brushed my hair away from my face. What exactly is a gesh? A form of magic that forces people to commit actions against their will. Annoyance dripped from Mariah's voice, not at me, but at whoever had placed the gesh on these people. But it is far deeper than that. It may be benign, a promise between two people, or it can reach the depths of cruelty and rip away any free will from a person. Sounds like what's wrong with Asher, I murmured as my mind churned through ideas. How did this happen to them, though? They've been in the brig for weeks. Darker geshes take time to take root, Mariah explained. These poor souls have been afflicted this entire time, but it wasn't until now that the effects were made visible. So, kind of like a cancer curse, I muttered. It grows in the body, silently, until the body breaks down. Yes, that's an apt analogy. Can you break it? I asked. I cannot. I frowned. Why not? You're the sword of healing. I am. Mariah replied. But I am not all-powerful. This Gesh is a dark magic, and it runs deep. In order to break it, I would need help. Help from who? I asked. Why, from you, of course, she answered, and I got the distinct impression she was smirking. From me? I echoed in surprise. You are my wielder, Mariah purred. And a powerful one at that. You might even be the most powerful lord Hatra has ever seen. But that doesn't mean I know how to break a gesh, I pointed out, even though something in my chest preened at the praise. Not yet, Mariah chuckled. But I have every faith in you, and once you find the knowledge you seek, we can work together to root out this evil magic once and for all. If you can learn how to wield me properly and channel my magic, I believe there is little we cannot achieve together. I grinned at the thought, and my dragon side growled at the idea of gaining more power, more wealth, and more acclaim. Guess I have some studying to do. I chuckled as I felt Mariah fade back into my spiritual sea. Then I rose to my feet, stepped out of the cell, and softly closed the door behind me. When I turned around, Daya raised an eyebrow at me. Everything all right? she asked. Yes, sorry, I nodded. The sort of healing gave me a lead on how to help the prisoners, but it will require a little more research. What do you want us to do in the meantime? Daya asked as she sat down in a nearby chair and leaned back on two legs. Keep a watch on them, I responded after a moment. Let me know if there's even the slightest change in their condition. Of course. Daya shrugged and let her chair fall back into place. What do you think is wrong with them? Either the miasma or their sect leader placed a gesh on them. I sighed as I ran my hand through my hair. Maybe the miasma is their sect leader. I don't even know at this point. Each time we find out something more about this poison cloud, it keeps evolving and somehow managing to stay one step ahead of us. That's a dark implication. Daya stood up as the expression on her face darkened. If the miasma is, as you say, staying a step ahead of us, well... That implies they're watching us. Perhaps even now. Or there's a traitor somewhere, I murmured back as I sought to make sense of everything. The miasma could be inside of anyone in the country, and we might not even know. It could be remaining dormant. That would make the perfect spies. Daya scowled as she clenched her fists. Even if someone was truly loyal, they would be unable to fight back against the corruption of the miasma. Don't tell anyone, 
I commanded as I walked past her. I don't want anyone panicking over something that might not even be true. Of course. Daya agreed quickly. There's no point in creating chaos. No one in Hatra would be able to trust anyone from the outside, even if it were false. The same would be true for the reverse, I pointed out to her. If anyone from the outside finds out, they'd say no one in Hatra can be trusted. I will look into this on my own. Daya's frown only deepened as she sat back down. Thank you, I replied as I turned away. There was nothing I'd be able to do about these prisoners for the time being, but Aliona's research would hopefully turn up something that would help once I told her to look for any mention of a Gesh. But the prisoners were relatively safe for the time being, and I had more pressing matters to attend to. For now, I would have to find that fortress I asked Asher about myself and see what was going on with my own eyes, and for that, I wasn't going to be going alone. I had enough resources now that I didn't have to launch a risky operation. There were also the maps in the archives of not only the Blue Tree Guild, but those of the Underground Library, not to mention the other resources that the Adventuring Guild had available to them. Airships. Chapter 5 I paused in the doorway of the brig. Daya, I turned back to the Mistress of War, is there anyone who can take me to the airships? Let me see who is nearest, she replied, and her black fox ears twitched forward in consideration as she hummed. Not everyone has access to them. Oh, so there's a security system in place, I asked. There is. Daya nodded as she tapped the gorget at her throat. The airships can be quite dangerous in the wrong hands, and many of the cubs are rather adventurous. Restricting their access makes things easier for us and prevents headaches from occurring. Ah, Laika is nearest. She'll meet you outside the brig. Thanks, Daya. I nodded and turned around to leave. Of course, Daya replied easily. This is our city now, too. We've put down roots, and anyone who threatens our home will have their throats torn out. I grinned viciously back at her. You took the words right out of my mouth. With a laugh and a shake of my head, I left the brig and leaned against one of the corridor walls to think. I didn't like the implications of there being a traitor somewhere in Rama, but that was the only possible answer with everything that had happened. An army had been mobilized without the king being warned of it, and that alone was enough of a red flag. Then, take into consideration the sole heir to the throne had also managed to run away, and the king hadn't been told of it either. Well, that was just simple math. Laika strutted down the hallway toward me in the distance, and then she stopped with her arms crossed over her chest. Hey, how did things go at the mine? I asked. Good, the wolf replied with a nod. We have almost fifty guards stationed there now. Anton and I gave them their orders, and we've implemented a rotating schedule so the guards are always fresh. I just got back because I wanted to see how the meeting went. It went great, I grinned. And I'll tell you all about it later, but right now I need something from you. Yes, Daya said you had need of an airship? Laika asked as she motioned for me to follow her with a small smile. What would you need one for? A small scouting mission, I replied as I shoved my hands into my sleeves. Perhaps one of the smaller airships would work, Like amused, and her fluffy ears twitched to and fro as she walked beside me. There should be something in the fleet that would do. Wait, how many do you have? I asked as I stopped walking and glanced over at the wolf demihuman. We usually have around a hundred different airships docked here. Laika shrugged carelessly and glanced up at me. We still have some adventurers completing requests throughout Rama, so currently there's about another fifty ships outside of the docks. How many people can they carry? I questioned excitedly. The airships could be just the solution I was looking for. Depends on the size. One of Laika's ears twitched as she tilted her head and thought. The smallest ship can carry around ten or so. Twenty if you jam everyone in. The largest can fit around two hundred. Can you explain more of what you require for this scouting mission? I want to find out where in the mountains the harpies came from, I explained as we started walking again. I could fly over them, but I wouldn't be able to bring any back up with me except for whoever could fit on my back. Not to mention, that would be playing all my cards at once if I travel there in my dragon form. A fair point, Laika agreed as she hummed in thought. Traveling silently would allow us to have the upper hand. 
They wouldn't know what hit them, I laughed. If it comes to fighting, we'll strike like lightning. Is that supposed to be a reference to your power? Laika laughed lightly as she pointed at a different corridor. We're heading this way. Laika led me to a pair of enormous mahogany doors. A strange, almost leaf-like pattern was carved all over the wood, and the pattern shifted as the light of the crystal wall lamps flickered. It was almost like the carved pattern was alive, a slithering serpent in the wooden doors that never stopped moving. Here we are. Laika pushed open the large carved doors in front of us. Welcome to the dry docks of the Blue Tree Guild. The doors swung open to reveal an enormous chamber, easily twice the size of the main atrium in the underground library. I couldn't help but wonder if there was some sort of magic involved in the creation of the room and of the Blue Tree Guild airship. Even though I knew the airship was enormous, it was like it was even larger on the inside. Rows and rows of airships, all different sizes and shapes, lined one half of the room. The other half of the room, the part along the hull of the airship, was completely empty, and there was a large glowing circle on the wall that reminded me of Aliona's portals. I figured that was from where the smaller airships launched out of, since there was no other opening I could see for them to exit. This is amazing! I exclaimed in awe as I walked into the enormous room, and then a flash of silver caught my eye. What are those ships over there? There was a line of sleek silver airships, as if they were made out of molten metal that hadn't become fully solid, but they were also tarnished and mottled, as if they had been exposed to the elements and left to suffer for it. Those are relics, Laika explained as she followed lazily behind me. Pretty much derelict. They haven't been used in centuries. Supposedly, they can outrun even a wind dragon outright. At least that's how the legends go. So it's never been proven? I turned around sharply and glanced back at the sleek ships. There was something about the ships that called me to them, like they were just begging to be used and adored again. They hadn't been created so they could rust away like they were right now. Evan, no one's used them in centuries. Laika shook her head in amusement and gently nudged me away from the ancient ships. No one even knows if the claim is true. Though, perhaps the fact they haven't been smashed to bits is proof enough they are capable of it. So? I grinned excitedly at the thought of flying faster than even I could in my dragon form. That just means we have to test them out! Evan! Laika sighed as she covered her face with her palm. We don't have time for that. Not to mention the fact that they've never been repaired. It would take ages to fix them up again. Well, maybe when the workers arrive, I replied as I crossed my arms over my chest, there might be someone who knows how to fix them. We shall see. Laika rolled her eyes at me before she sashayed over to the nearest ship. This one might work for what you have in mind. It's fast, and it's a quiet one. The ship was nearly the size of a school bus back on Earth, but it looked nothing like the rectangular vehicles. This looked more like a yacht, but it obviously wasn't meant to cross the waves. The ship was for sailing the sky and drifting among the clouds. There were no sails on the main deck of the ship, but sleek wings came out along its side like an airplane. Each wing was easily 15 feet long, maybe a little more, and came to a minimum wingspan of 30 feet combined. Yeah? I walked over to Laika and stood behind her. What's it called? Blue Willow. Laika replied as her tail swished softly side to side. It can fit 20 people inside of it. And like I said, it's one of the fastest we have, and it's perfect for reconnaissance, like the type you have in mind. Let's take a look, I grinned as I jumped over the railings of the airship's deck. Now that I was on the deck, I could see it looked a lot like polished mahogany. There was a cabin, just like a boat would have, but it seemed to lead further down into the ship. I knew magic had to be involved since, once again, it seemed to be bigger on the inside. It was definitely going to be large enough for 20 people to live and sleep inside of it. So? Laika asked as she joined me on the deck. What do you think of the Blue Willow? It's gorgeous, I admitted, and turned to face her. As the ship should be. Laika leaned on the railing with a smirk on her face. The Blue Tree Guild has an appreciation for beauty, even if most of us look rather haggard for the majority of the time. I can see another beautiful work in front of me. I murmured and let my gaze trail down the exposed planes of Laika's body. Oh? Laika purred back as she walked toward me. Well, if I recall correctly, I believe I owe you something from earlier. 
Do you want to collect on that debt now? I didn't answer verbally, but I did tug her closer to me and slanted my mouth over hers. My hands trailed down her body, and I undid the laces of her leather clothing and let it fall to the ground. Like it did the same for my own clothes, and she tugged my shirt desperately off my shoulders as she gasped into my mouth. Then she bucked her hips against me, unexpectedly, and shuddered against me. I raised an eyebrow at that reaction, but only moved faster to catch her desperation. If my warrior wanted me this badly, then I'd give her exactly what she wanted. We'd already begun to learn each other's bodies, and the cool touch of the mahogany deck against our bare backs only heightened the thrill. There was nothing tame or boring about Laika, and the way her body slithered along mine. I quickly flipped the two of us, so I was hovering over her on the deck. Laika bit her lips seductively and arched her back so her bare breasts pressed into my chest. I growled as I felt her pert nipples scrape against me and I ducked my head to take one in my mouth as my hand slid past her stomach and hips. My fingers found her wet and warm entrance, and I painted slow circles over her clit as I bit down on one of her nipples. Evan! Laika gasped as she writhed beneath me. A feral growl slipped past my lips, and I adjusted my wrist to plunge two fingers into her dripping pussy. The wolf demi-human moaned loudly, and her sharp claws raked at my shoulders but that just spurred me on. I settled into a fast rhythm and pistoned my fingers in and out of her with my thumb pressed firmly down on her clit. Laika thrashed and hissed, and when I slid a third finger into her as I clamped my teeth over her breast, she gave a shout of ecstasy and arched clean off the deck. The dragon part of me snarled in desire as I felt like a climax on my fingers, and I knew I had to have her now. I pulled my hand from between her trembling legs and latched onto her hips to drag her toward me. But Laika had different plans. The wolf glanced up at me from beneath hooded eyes, and she licked her lips as her gaze traveled down my torso. My turn, she growled, and before I could say a word, the lithe warrior flipped us over. She straddled my thighs and dipped down to trail kisses all the way to the base of my cock. A throaty snarl echoed in my throat, and I ran my claws through her hair as her hot breath ghosted over my pulsing erection. Are you just going to stare at it? I teased as I flicked one of her ears. Laika smirked up at me. I only wanted to get a look. I've been thinking about this since the stairwell. You and me both, I grunted, and then a gasp was torn from my throat as Laika dipped her head and ran her tongue over my shaft. Mm. The wolf purred, and then she took me in her hand as she wrapped her plump lips over my head. Pleasure spiraled through my veins, and my head fell back onto the deck with a thunk. I buried both my hands in Laika's hair, and then I just held on for the ride as she attempted to suck me dry. The wolf's mouth was hot and oh so wet, and I chanced to peek down to see her eyes closed in rapture and her cheeks hollowed out as she slurped on my cock. I tightened my grip on her hair and bucked my hips upward, and Laika moaned in ecstasy as her throat fluttered around the head of my dick. We set up a quick rhythm, but all too soon, I felt the coil of an orgasm tighten in my gut. Laika must have sensed it too, because she pulled off me with a wet pop and leveled me with her hooded, lustful eyes. More, she purred, and I was only happy to oblige her. I flipped the two of us again with ease, and Laika growled as I settled in the cradle of her pelvis. My cock slipped past her swollen lips and into her deepest place, and she gasped and keened as she wrapped her legs around my waist. Mine, I snarled in her ear as I set a punishing rhythm. Y yours, Laika gasped and met my hips thrust for thrust. I latched onto the juncture between her neck and shoulder with my teeth, and I pounded into her as I chased my own release. Then my mind blanked, and all I knew was the taste of Laika's supple flesh and toned body as we fucked each other into oblivion. Uh, Evan! The wolf demi-human moaned as she threw back her head and clutched at my shoulders. Uh, I'm... I lifted her legs up, folded her in half, and fucked into her even harder as I felt the coil wind tight in my gut. 
Laika gasped and shuddered, and a moment later she screamed as she orgasmed for the second time. I felt the splash of her intense climax drip down my thighs, and I growled deep in my chest as I yanked her hips tight against me and poured my load deep inside her. The two of us froze like that as I filled her pussy up with my hot seed, and then Laika moaned weakly as she flopped back onto the deck, relaxed and satiated. I rolled over on the wooden deck of the airship and groaned. The smell of sex hung heavy in the air, and when I glanced over at the wolf demi-human beside me, I could see my seed gleaming on her thighs and dripping onto the deck. My cock throbbed, but as much as I wanted to stay here with Laika and maybe go for round two, we really needed to figure out just where exactly that damned fortress was. Come on, I sighed as I glanced over at Laika. We should get going. Why don't we go one more time? Laika slyly lifted one eyebrow as she trailed her hand up my thigh. I owe you for that morning in the stairwell. All my critical reasoning went out the window at her touch. Well, I smirked back at her. One more time wouldn't hurt anyone. Less talking. Laika swiftly climbed on top of me once more and pushed me down until I was flat on the deck. More fucking. As the guild leader commands, I replied as I thrust into her wet folds with one motion. So I shall obey. Laika was unable to reply coherently as a strangled gasp left her mouth. Her pussy squeezed me tightly as it attempted to keep me from slipping out of her body, and I grasped her hips tightly as I thrust up into her. By the time we finally were able to keep our hands off each other, it was late in the day, and we had cleaned ourselves up as best we could. Laika used a charm from her storage to wipe away any smells that would have given away what we'd been up to for the past several hours. Even so, I was still planning on heading out to the bathhouses eventually. We should get going, Laika muttered as she slipped back into her leathers and tightened the laces of her bracers. Probably a good idea, I replied with a sigh. As much as I want to keep exploring these airships with you, duty before pleasure. I feel there is a bit of irony in that statement. Laika shook her head as she tied her hair up in a high ponytail. You didn't complain earlier. I waggled my eyebrows at her and was pleased when she blushed an attractive pink. The two of us left the Blue Tree Guild airship and made our way to the temporary Palace of Hatra. Granted, it was more of a multi-storied building, but it served its purpose well. Once there, we pored for hours over all the maps in the room. Some of them were ancient, easily a thousand or two thousand years old, and only kept together by the strength of the preservation magic cast on them. Even so, there was nothing on any of them so far that hinted at a fortress in the mountains to the east of Hatra. There wasn't even a mention of a single ruin. I don't understand, I grumbled as I clenched my hands on the table. Asher and the others remember there being a fortress there. How come it's not showing up on any of these maps? Perhaps it was built secretly? Laika suggested with a sigh and rolled up a map. It also might have even been built recently, which means no one would have noticed it with how dense the miasma has been in the area. Besides, those mountains are treacherous. No, I disagreed with a shake of my head. There's no way that fortress was a recent build. It's been there for a long time, maybe even before Hatra fell a thousand years ago. Why do you say that? Laika asked as she glanced over at me and leaned back in her chair. Well, I began to explain my hunch. Hatra's been targeted for far longer than we realized, and if I was going to spend that much time and energy in destroying a city, I'd make sure I had a base nearby. But why wouldn't it be on any of our maps? Laika frowned, and her ears flicked backward. Not that I disagree with your logic. It makes complete sense considering the amount of attacks on the city. But no one could have a fortress up there that wasn't on any single map. Maybe it was only on local maps, I suggested as I stood up and paced. There's a possibility it could have been there and just not been that important, or even ignored. I mean, Olivier did come to Hatra under the presence of studying ruins over the kingdom. So maybe there is one nearby. The best lie has a seed of truth to it, after all. And maybe, just maybe, it's not a fortress but a former guard tower of Hatra. Maybe from when the city was first constructed by the Moon Princess. There is a chance it could be so. Like a sighed as she rubbed at her sore eyes. So what now? 
We move to search in the library. We still have all of these other maps to go through. Like a motion to the rest of the maps littering the tables in front of us, and I frowned. We were going to need more help in this matter. My first choice would be Leon, but he was busy creating the structural plans I'd asked of him. So that would leave my new page, Dagon. I pooled my power into my hand and concentrated it so it would take the form of a tiny dragon. Once it sparked to life, the small magical creature shimmered as if it were carved out of a piece of diamond. Bring me Dagon, I commanded the tiny dragon and watched as it flew away. Dagon bounded into the room a few minutes later, and he bounced with excitement in front of us. You call for me, sir? Dagon asked cheerfully as his tail wagged slightly behind him. Laika's lips twitched upward in a slight smile, but she turned her attention back to the maps in front of her. I need you to find something for me, I instructed the boy. I tried to keep a stoic face as well, but his excitement was contagious and I couldn't help my own smile. This is very important, okay? I can do it! Dagon's ears perked up even higher. What is it? I need you to go and find every map in the library, I explained to him. Once you've found those maps, bring them here so we can make a note of every single mention of a castle, a ruin, or a guard post in the mountains and forests near Hatra. Yes, sir! Dagon practically bounced in place as he vibrated with excitement. Castles or ruins are guard posts to the east of Hatra! Don't rush while doing this. I made sure to impress upon him the importance of what I was asking. Be thorough so you don't make any mistakes. This involves the safety of our city. I won't let you down, sir. Determination shone in his emerald eyes, and he saluted me before he dashed out of the room. He's young, Lyca murmured as she turned back to gaze at a map. Young and eager to please. I trust he won't make a mistake, I murmured in reply, but I was suddenly distracted as I felt a shift in the air outside. What is she doing up? It was Valera's presence I sensed outside of the building, which was odd because I was sure she was still bedridden. What's wrong? Laika asked as she focused on a nearly faded map. I thought I felt Valera outside. I stood up and made my way to the entrance. I'm going to go check and see if she's really out there. I'll be here. Laika replied faintly as she pulled out another barely held together map to compare against the one she was looking at. I walked out of the room and out of the building to see the sun was beginning to set over my city, and it dyed the blue stone buildings around me a rich purple. Valera stood several yards away from the entrance of the temporary palace, a pale figure against the light of the setting sun. Her hair seemed to glow like molten fire as it consumed the rays of light. In her arms was her sister's egg, and it was crimson and sparkled with specks of gold. Ha! Huh, you're fully healed! I remarked as I looked her up and down and couldn't see any signs of her being in pain. Are you going for a walk? Of course I am healed. Valera rolled her eyes at me as she waved her hand. I am not one of your puny humans who will die if too cold the wind sweeps by them. And no, I am not going for a walk. You really hate humans, don't you? I leaned against the wall of the building and bit my cheek at her response. Are you only just noticing? Valera scoffed as she wrapped her arms tighter around the egg. It seems you might have a brain after all. Then she turned and walked away from me, and her long hair swayed behind her with every step she took. Wait, where are you going? I followed after her with a frown. Back to my canyon, she replied in a matter-of-fact tone as she walked in the direction of the main gate. We've already discussed this. I leave with my sister's egg when I'm recovered. I'm recovered, hence I leave. How about you don't leave? I countered as I caught up with her easily. There's more than enough room here for you and your sister's egg. Quite the comedian, aren't you? Valera rolled her eyes again and yawned languidly. It was not humorous the first time, nor will it be the second time. I'm being serious here. I stopped in front of her and blocked her way. I want you to stay here, in Hatra. I am also serious. Valera's eyes glowed fiercely with the light of the sunset. I refuse to stay in this city, surrounded by so many humans. Then the dragon pushed past me and continued walking in the direction of the main gate. Why don't you stay long enough to teach me about being a dragon? I asked as I switched tactics in an attempt to convince her. Why would I? 
Valera yawned and continued walking without even giving me a glance. Because I've helped you, I countered easily and tried to play on her pride. Turnabout's fair play, and you owe me. I dislike having such a debt. Valera stopped and glared at me for a moment before she huffed. You may visit me by the waterfall, and I will deign to give you some morsels of wisdom. How gracious of you. I dipped into a mocking bow. Yes, you should be grateful. Valera didn't seem to notice or care about my mockery as she started walking again. Very few can claim such a boon from me. You know, since you don't want to stay in the city, I continued as if she hadn't spoken, it could be kind of dangerous in the canyons by yourself. You don't know if there'll be another attack. What if you can't hold them back long enough for us to get there? Valera stopped walking to glance at me with cold golden eyes, and then she looked down at the egg in her arms. Her jaw clenched minutely before she looked up at me again. Your point being? There was no uncertainty in her voice, but I saw a sliver of doubt in her amber eyes. Why don't we patrol the area together? I suggested with a shrug of my shoulders. I mean, who's going to be dumb enough to attack two dragons? Patrol? Valera scrunched up her face in disgust at my suggestion and resumed walking. Together? You must be joking. Dead serious. I raised an eyebrow at her reaction and shook my head. You know just how dangerous the demons are and how cruel they can be. Who knows what they would do to a defenseless and unhatched dragon? A wind swept around us, and Valera tightened her arms around her sister's egg. We had already reached the main gate, and I didn't have much more time to convince her into patrolling with me. Otherwise, she would leave, and tracking her down in the canyons could prove both difficult and dangerous. Fine, Valera growled out. But I am only doing this to protect my sister's child. I will not be lifting a single claw to help your humans. I know, I know. I lifted my hands up to placate the angry dragon. This is just looking out for you. Looking out for me? Valera snarled back as her eyes flashed angrily. Are you implying that I am weak? Her fangs and claws seemed to lengthen in the waning light as killing intent leaked out from her body. No, not at all, I replied soothingly as I inwardly cursed my poorly chosen words. I just meant this works out in your favor. You're back in your canyons, you're away from humans, and you have an extra set of eyes protecting your sister. Valera's brows knitted as she glanced from me to the egg in her arms. Then her shoulders slumped for the merest of moments before she straightened again. I see. Valera shifted the egg in her arms and nodded. Very well. Our first patrol shall be on the morrow. Wait, what? I blinked, somewhat surprised she had finally agreed. Tomorrow? Meet me by the waterfall at sunrise. Valera stopped in front of the main gate and turned to face me. Do not be late. I have no patience for tardiness in others. She didn't wait for a response from me. She just shifted her stance and jumped high in the air. Then Valera shifted fluidly into her dragon form and soared into the sky above me. With a quick flap of her wings, she was far out of sight. Well, isn't she demanding? Mariah's voice echoed through my mind with amusement. Let's keep this between us, I muttered to the sword spirit with a grin. But she's kind of hot. Chapter 6 The next day, I woke up a good while before dawn and walked from my bedroom to the ramparts of the main gate. As I strolled through my sleeping city, I thought about last night's conversation. Valera had somehow agreed to patrolling our territories and teaching me about being a dragon, but she'd immediately scheduled a patrol for this morning. It was incredibly short notice, and I'd only been able to let Laika know about it before we'd gone to bed. The wolf demihuman said she would let everyone know where I was in case my patrol ran long, or, if I found something during my patrol, there was always a few squads of warriors from the Blue Tree Guild ready to be deployed at a moment's notice. I didn't expect for Valera and me to run into any trouble we couldn't handle, though. I was pretty strong and had more than one massive cheat on my side with my healing power and the Sword of Hatra bonded to my soul. But then there was also Valera. If there was something even I would struggle with, I knew she would be able to handle it easily. For now, I was outclassed and outgunned by her, but I promised myself that wouldn't last long. 
As dawn started to break over the horizon, I reached the top of the ramparts and shifted into my dragon form to fly in the direction of the waterfall. I passed over the edge of the desert and along the length of the river and aqueducts that provided not only water but life to the people of Hatra. In the distance, I could see the waterfall rise before me, and at the very top of it was an enormous crimson dragon that stood proudly on a rocky outcropping. Valera was easy to see, even at this distance. I couldn't help but wonder how large I'd grow by the time I'd lived as long as she had. With a few more flaps of my wings, I made it to the crest of the waterfall, and Valera rose up to meet me. Good, Valera rumbled, and her scales glistened with dew from the waterfall. You aren't late. Good morning to you, too, I replied dryly. Let us depart, Valera said as she ignored my comment and took to the air. I've already patrolled my canyons. What is left is the desert sands. It shall be interesting to see what we find in that barren land. I followed after Valera and, thankfully, she slowed down enough so I could catch up with her. Just one of her wings was easily five times the size of my dragon form, and she could quickly outpace me if she wanted to. As I glided toward her head, I mentally patted myself on the back for managing to turn such a massive dragon into a reluctant ally. You know, I called out carefully, what did the demons even try to offer you? What are you on about? Valera rumbled back to me. The demons couldn't have just attacked you outright, I replied as I glanced at Valera's giant eye and shifted my wings to beat in time with hers. They had to catch you off guard, otherwise you could have easily taken them out. Valera remained silent as she glided over the desert sands that glistened as if they were molten gold. I'm right, aren't I? I continued on with my theory. Did a demon somehow manage to get your sister's egg? But how would they even have gotten past you? I mean, I barely flew into the canyon before you started chasing me. There was a man, Valera growled out, and the temperature around us rose. A strange one. For a moment, I wasn't sure if he was human or not. In fact, I was convinced he was a spirit of some sort. A spirit? The sudden spike in heat didn't bother me, but I knew Valera's fiery temper was rising to the surface. Why did you think he was a spirit? Because he had no scent, she hissed angrily. There was nothing to him that had substance. Thus, I thought he was some wraith or ghost who'd lost his way. Because of that, I was going to ignore him and leave him be. Until I saw he held my sister's egg in his hand. What did he look like? I asked as suspicion nagged at me. A blonde man. Valera paused for a moment and glanced over at me. The oddity was his appearance kept shifting, and for the merest of moments I caught the stench of death and decay from him. So there was a possibility Olivier and perhaps the Green Glass sect were some of the suspects behind the attack on Valera. We knew a demon lord had to have been involved, but for humans to be involved as well? What the hell was happening? This is dangerous, Mariah whispered in my mind. There is something much larger at play here, larger than you realized. Valera, I rumbled as I internally agreed with Mariah. Do you know anything about the lands near Hatra? Do you know if there's any castles or fortifications? Of course not, Valera snarled and whipped her head around to glare at me. I have been in those canyons for three thousand years protecting my sister's egg. Why would I leave such a well-defended area? It was just a question, I huffed. I'm thinking the demons that attacked you have a connection to the demons that attacked the mine. There's a pattern to the attacks, and I wanted to see if you could help figure out who was behind them. I don't care who's behind the attacks, Valera rumbled back, and her voice promised pain. But if I ever find them, I will make them regret every single second of their life that led them to meeting me. Then I will wipe them out of existence with excruciating pain. And I will help you, I nodded in agreement since I was sure our enemies were one and the same. It wasn't an easy silence that settled between us, but it wasn't uncomfortable. Valera was more considerate than I had thought she would be as we continued our patrol and she carefully angled her immense body so it wouldn't hit me whenever she changed directions. I'd begun to fly in loops around Valera, a bit of practice for myself when it came to aerial maneuvers, when I saw something strange before us. 
It almost looked like a carpet of black on the desert sands, if carpets moved. I realized it wasn't a black carpet when we flew closer, but it was still a bit of an odd sight. From how high up we were, they looked like bugs. Still, that wasn't the right way to describe the creatures. They had what looked like fur on top of thick and scaly skin. The best way I could describe them was by comparing them to very hairy turtles, if the turtles had somehow managed to lose their shells. The beasts moved slowly over the surface of the desert, and I wasn't sure if their lack of speed came from their size or because of the intense heat radiating from the shifting sands. I didn't want to imagine the blisters that would develop on anyone's bare feet after spending a day in this desert. What are those things? I asked. Bugs? Or some type of demons? They are native to the desert, Valera explained with extreme disinterest. They are known as desert echidnas. Should we leave them alone? I asked as I glanced back at the creatures for a moment. If you want to. Valera gave a shrug of her massive shoulders and yawned. They are rather vicious and territorial, though. Our presence should be enough for them to try to attack us. Wait, why aren't you attacking them, then? I frowned at Valera before I glanced back down at the milling creatures underneath us. Why should I? Valera replied languidly. Fire doesn't work on these creatures, and I don't feel like exerting myself to fight them. What? I asked in surprise. So they're like behemoths and have impenetrable skin? No, I simply said fire doesn't work on them. Valera's annoyed voice echoed around us as she launched into an explanation. They're not even close to the defensive strength of behemoths. These things are just petty annoyances. If they're petty annoyances, then they should be easy enough to take care of, I said as my eyes locked on the insect-like creatures. There were hundreds of them, but it should be a piece of cake between the two of us. Take this as a lesson. Valera replied as she ignored my question and remained hovering in the air. Get rid of them by yourself. By myself? I gaped at her. This would be quicker if you joined in. And yet, I shan't. Valera's lips curled upward in a smirk as she bared her fangs. Be a good little disciple and dispatch them for your mistress. Wait a second, I growled back at her. When did I become your disciple? When you asked me to teach you. Valera answered flippantly as she shifted in the air to a more comfortable position. Therefore, commence. Otherwise, they'll start rampaging. And once those creatures start rampaging, they won't stop until they've been killed or they've marched themselves to death. They might even reach your city. Fucking hell! I growled out as I glanced down at the creatures. So, what was my next move? The echidnas were fireproof, so I doubted my lightning would be able to do much against them. I could probably use my stone powers to squash a bunch of them, but I didn't want to expand all of my magical energy on a group of bugs. I gnashed my fangs as I hovered in the air and tried to think of a plan. Well, I could always tear them apart with my claws and fangs. I was a huge badass dragon, after all. And each echidna didn't look larger than one of my legs. There were hundreds of the creatures down there, but as long as I kept their attention on me, they wouldn't go in the direction of the city. Besides, if things started to look bad, Valera would hopefully join in and lend me a hand. I glanced back at Valera's perfectly relaxed form high above me and squinted at her. She didn't have a choice if these things started overwhelming me, not if she wanted to protect her own best interests. But I was confident in my abilities to take care of the echidnas myself. With a growl, I dove down through the sky and pulled up just shy of slamming into the creatures. Then I raked my claws along the backs of the echidnas closest to me. There was a spray of dark green blood and a keening cry from the creatures as their eyes turned to face me. A roar of pain escaped me as the emerald blood splashed onto my scales and burned through them down to the muscles of my forelimbs. Even my talons felt as if they were beginning to disintegrate. I glanced down at my forelegs and saw the echidna's blood had eaten away at the flesh it came in contact with. My glimmering obsidian scales were gone, and now ivory bone peeked out from between bleeding layers of muscle. How the hell was their blood acidic enough to eat through my scales? The pain was unbelievable. Even as I pushed my healing power to concentrate on my ravaged forelimbs, and I knew I needed to be more careful when fighting these creatures. 
I needed to figure out a way to kill them without getting their blood on me, because while I could heal myself over and over again, there was the chance of being blinded or driven mad by the pain. What the fuck? I glared up at Valera as my talons twitched and healed from the acidic blood. This would have been helpful to know beforehand! I won't be giving you all the answers. Valera drawled back lazily from where she floated. How are you supposed to learn otherwise? You can't just have everything handed to you on a silver platter. Coddling and spoiling only leads to death in battle, especially for a dragon. I gritted my teeth as I glanced down at the crawling echidnas. She had a point. But would it have killed her to have given me a little warning about their blood? I continued to coat my limbs with healing magic as I thought about my next move. None of the echidna's acidic blood had splashed on me any higher, so healing my wounds was quick work. Then I turned back to the chittering beasts and bared my fangs. I hadn't noticed when I first observed them from high up in the sky, but the echidnas had countless crimson eyes, just like a tarantula would, and they chittered a high-pitched sound that grated on my ears. Desperate for the sound to stop, I gathered my healing power and covered my ears with it. It was sheer instinct that made me do this, but it somehow worked. The keening, chittering somehow dropped to a manageable level, and I was able to think clearly as I dove back into the fight. I slashed through the echidnas with my claws and forelimbs covered in healing power. Thankfully, this worked and stopped their acid-like blood from eating through my flesh again. I also didn't have to worry about it reaching the rest of my body, so long as I was careful with the angle of my slashes. There was also no way I was going to bite into these things, though. Even if I coated my insides with healing magic, I didn't want to think about how they would taste or how my body would react. The echidnas had claws, but they weren't able to do much damage to me. Every time they reared up for an attack, I pumped my wings, buffeted the beasts with hot air, and rose up out of their reach. After several minutes, I'd killed a huge swath of them, but the remaining insects climbed over the corpses of their fallen friends to surround me. I could keep hacking them to pieces, but there was still the danger of their blood, and they could potentially suffocate me if they somehow managed to drag me down from the sky. Just as I was about to sweep back down for another attack on the echidnas, two of them did manage to latch onto my legs. The other echidnas immediately grabbed onto those two, and the combined strength of all the creatures pulled me down from the sky. I pushed my healing power to envelop all of my body right as I was slammed into the hot desert sands and the large pools of acidic blood. This would have been more than just painful if I didn't have this healing power. Get off me! I growled at the hideous creatures while I thrashed about in the hot sands. I lashed out wildly and spread lightning magic all over my scales as I did so. While I knew it wouldn't harm them much, I'd hoped the electricity would shock them enough to let go of me. Some of the creatures did loosen their grip on my legs, and the ones that had latched onto my wings were shaken off. I slashed at them with my claws and swiped at them with my tail as I made a wide circle around me. This was the only way to keep the chittering, bug-like creatures away from me. I had to think outside of the box, otherwise I would be stuck fighting these hideous creatures for the rest of the day, and maybe the day after, too. Wait a minute. Maybe a box was exactly what I needed to take care of this. I roared as I flew upward again and ensured the echidna's attention remained on me. Once I was high enough that I could see all of the creatures with one glance, I yanked at the earth around them. I was envisioning a stone box as I did this, and high walls of unbreakable rock rose up around the echidnas. There was no escape from it, no matter how much the creatures chittered and attempted to climb up over each other to reach the closing gaps. My stone box closed around them with no mercy, and I mentally pressed down on it. Instantly, the echidnas were flattened inside of it. For lack of a better word, they'd become puree. I let my stone walls crumble back into the sand they had come from and frowned at the mess. Calling the echidna's puree was pretty accurate. They'd turned into a green and black mush, but I could pick out chips of ivory bone within the gore. Some of the creatures were still alive, though, even if just barely, but they weren't a threat anymore. They were on the verge of death as it was. So I flew back down for a moment and decided to put the remaining echidnas out of their misery with some well-placed slashes to their skulls. Once all of the echidnas had been defeated, I glanced up to see a rather bored-looking Valera touch down on a nearby dune. 
All in all, your form wasn't terrible, she began with a drawl. But your execution was sloppy, and you could have finished this quicker. Excuse me for having never fought these things before, I snarked back at her with a growl. It would have been helpful if you'd given me more to go on, or at least given a helping hand. There were hundreds of them here. But I did give you a hint, Valera sighed as she stretched out languidly on the sands. In fact, I gave you two hints. It wasn't my fault you weren't able to understand what I meant by any of it. You're quite young, after all. Which is why I asked you for help, I muttered back as I glanced at the carnage around me. There had to have been a less messy way to get this over with. Just follow me. Valera snorted as she took to the skies with one flap of her wings. I followed after Valera and left the gory mess behind us for the elements of the desert to take care of. The winds and sands would swallow the corpses. Where are we going? I called out to the crimson dragon flying ahead of me. Unless you want to remain disgusting, Valera roared back to me. Be silent and follow me. I rolled my eyes at her reply. Someone was determined to be crowned queen bitch of the year. I suppose that's what living on your own for God knows how long did to a person. That and hating everyone else. It turned you into a grumpy menace. We flew deeper into the desert and the scent of water began to fill the arid air around us. The golden sands of the desert slowly gave way to lush vegetation, and I could see small flowers and hear the gentle trickle of water. The oddest thing was that I could sense some sort of magic emanating from the water, as if it was healing and protecting the area at the same moment. Is the oasis alive? I asked Valera as I touched down on the soft grass. It feels like it is, like there's magic everywhere, in the air and even in the water. Hmm. Valera replied as she landed gently next to me and curled up languidly like a snake. Perhaps it is. Perhaps it isn't. What a great non-answer, I snarked back as I walked toward the faintly glowing pool. Be quiet and go bathe, Valera huffed, and puffs of smoke flew out from her nostrils. You reek of echidna guts. I rolled my eyes at her, but still stepped into the pool until it covered all of me. The water was soothing, and it was just as I thought there was some sort of power in the oasis. Perhaps you are feeling the blessing of the water spirit. Mariah purred languidly from within me. Water spirit? My mind went back to the water demons I'd fought before. Nothing like that, Mariah chuckled, and her amusement spread throughout my mind. A naiad, a being born of the water, and so they are one with it. They are said to be able to heal with their water and grant minor blessings. So perhaps what you have sensed is the naiad's grace. Why would a naiad be in an oasis, though? I murmured back as my body and mind began to unwind in this peaceful place. There's not a lot of water in the desert for a being of water. Naiads are a source of life, the sword spirit replied as contentment dripped from her voice. Otherwise, there would be no oases in the desert. The size of the oasis determines how powerful the naiad is and vice versa. This one must be quite powerful. I nodded absent-mindedly, and my eyes drooped lower and lower until everything went dark for me. It was a gentle sleep, more like a catnap than anything. I could feel the warmth of the sun on my scales and the coolness of the water around me. All my worries and everything that had me on edge was slowly washed away from my body. When I opened my eyes again, I was alone in the oasis. Valera had disappeared on me, and I wasn't sure where she went. One moment she was there, and the next moment she wasn't. It was pretty impressive, and I wondered if I would be able to find her. I doubted she was going to hide her presence from me in case there was an attack or something, but this might just be another form of training. That, or she'd gotten annoyed enough of me already. Somehow that thought made me want to annoy her more and more until I was the only thing she could think of. I snickered lightly at the thought. And then I closed my eyes as I concentrated on Valera's image in my mind and the way her power felt. It was like a burning fire, wild and out of control, and that was how she showed up in my mind. A flickering flame that burned in the distance and led me straight to her like a lighthouse's beacon in the middle of a stormy night. I slipped out of the oasis and took to the air once more as I followed the trail to Valera. Her power led me through the desert and just past the entrance of the canyon. 
There was a small cave I hadn't noticed the first time I'd entered her territory, but then again she was trying to kill me at the time. I flew closer to the small cave entrance and realized there was a ledge jutting out from it, almost blending in with the rest of the stone face. Right as I was nearing the stone ledge, I shifted from my dragon form and jumped down into it. I managed to land perfectly on the stone, and I glanced back at the drop behind me. It was at least a good 900 feet or so to the bottom. If I'd fallen, that would have been more than a little annoying. Suddenly, there was a shift in the air, and I glanced over to the small entrance to see Valera in her human form. Then I did a double take when I realized she was completely naked. When the Crimson Dragon had been recovering in Hatra, Aliona had lent her some clothes, and while Valera had grumbled about wearing human garments, she'd been even less keen to have so-called filthy humans ogling her. Now that she was back in her home, she'd reverted to her natural state of being which was sexy as fuck. My eyes trailed up her long ivory legs to her round hips, the bush of red hair between her thighs, her taut stomach, her full breasts with their pink nipples, and finally settled on the scowl she wore. What are you doing here? Valera growled out as she stood at the entrance to the cave. Go away! I don't want you here! You disappeared on me, I replied with a shrug. I was curious to see where you went. You've seen. Valera's scowl only grew as she blocked me from entering. Now leave. We have finished our patrol for the day. Your precious human city is safe. So, go. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I laughed as I shook my head. I'm curious about this place. Is this your horde or your home? Or maybe both? Valera paused for a moment to think, and I took advantage of that to slip past her and into the cave. I should kill you for even coming in here, Valera muttered partly to herself. But you're not going to, I cheerfully reminded her as I stepped further into the cave. Since, after all, I'm your disciple, I'm precious to you. There was a system of tunnels in front of me, all leading in different directions, but there was one thing that was the same about all of the tunnels. I could see hints of glowing objects within each and every one of them. I started down the main tunnel, and the crimson dragon huffed as she followed after me. I don't see anything precious in front of me, Valera replied immediately. What I see is an annoyance who is perilously towing the line. Aw, you don't mean that, I laughed as I glanced behind me. I'm your only disciple, after all. Precious disciple, my ass, Valera muttered angrily and shoved past me. I opened my mouth to retort, but instead I ended up gaping as I realized just why Valera didn't want me in here. As far as I could see, there were mounds of treasure. There was everything from ivory statues to piles of gold coins and silver goblets. Any type of treasure I could think of, it was there. This was everything Aunt Emma had told me about when I was a child, of ancient tombs bursting with more riches than any man could imagine. Except this wasn't back on Earth, and this wasn't a tomb. This was the treasure hoard of a 3,000-year-old dragon. I glanced around at the piles of treasures that surrounded us. This is impressive. I guess this is what 3,000 years will get you. Of course it's impressive. Valera sniffed proudly and sauntered over to a pile of gold ingots and jewels. This is all mine. I wouldn't have anything subpar. Valera reclined on the heap of treasure and raked her hand through it as a possessive gleam glowed in her golden eyes. Then a different and odd light came into Valera's eyes, and she motioned for me to follow her. I cocked my eyebrow at her curiously, but followed without a word. We passed more mounds of treasure, some of it silver jewelry that glowed with the light of stars, and some of it intricately carved furniture. In the distance, over in one of the beautifully crafted silver beds, I could see a crimson and gold-flecked dragon egg. The dragon egg was nestled within a mound of finely embroidered silk, and I could see pillows spread out on the bed. I guess Valera slept next to the egg. And I didn't blame her. I would, too, in order to keep it safe. Hey, wait up! I called out after Valera and jogged to where I'd last seen her. The crimson dragon peered her head around a corner and glared at me before she ducked away again. I followed Valera, and we came out to a massive entrance just behind the waterfall. The roar was deafening, but through the curtain of water I could see glimpses of my city and the aqueducts. 
This was both the perfect lookout point and escape exit for anyone. Come along now, Valera called out as she walked to the edge of the stone floor. We are climbing up. There was no choice but to follow her, both up and out. Climbing on the slick rocks was a bit of a thrill, but not much considering I was capable of flight. And then, even if I did fall, it wouldn't kill me. When we made it up to the top of the waterfall, I took in a deep breath and let out an ecstatic yell. Valera only rolled her eyes at me and sat down on the edge. Be quiet and sit before you fall off, she growled and pointed next to her rather imperiously. As you command, I laughed as I made my way to where she pointed. Good. Valera brushed some locks of crimson hair over her shoulder as she threw a dismissive glance in my direction. I wasn't going to dive after you if you fell. Do you do this a lot? I asked as I ignored her snide tone like a champ. What? Valera glanced back at me with one crimson eyebrow perfectly arched. You'll have to be more specific. Sit by the waterfall like this, I mean, I said and motioned to the rocky outcropping and the surrounding water. Oh. Valera blinked back at me, and her golden eyes were puzzled for a moment. Well, yes, it's peaceful, and the sound of the falling water is soothing. It helps when one has lived as long as I have. Huh. I wouldn't have pegged you to be the type to like sitting quietly. I tilted my head as I looked at her and quietly reconsidered my previous perception of the Crimson Dragon. Hmm. Valera shrugged her shoulders and turned her gaze back to the water. We sat somewhat quietly by the edge of the waterfall in our human forms, and I asked questions about the past 3,000 years and what she'd seen. Valera would sometimes reply with elaborate answers, other times with non-committal sounds. I'd have to change the question when it came to those grunts, since I discovered that she was a rather lazy lizard, all things considered. Suddenly, Valera frowned and narrowed her eyes as she stared off into the direction of Hatra. What is it? I asked as my eyes followed hers. I don't sense anything. What's there? The people you spoke of are arriving, perhaps. Valera leaned back with a huff and scowled deeply. More pesky humans to befoul my air. I blinked in surprise as I glanced back toward Hatra. This was too soon. Not even half a week had passed since King Rodion left, and now the architects were here? I stood and took a step toward the edge of the waterfall. I'll be back tomorrow morning, I promised Valera as I shifted into my dragon form. Then I launched into the air and flew in the direction of my city, curious to meet the people King Rodion had sent me. Chapter 7 I flew through the sky and made my way back to the city of Hatra. Two rings of bluestone walls encircled the city. One was fully reconstructed and decorated with mosaics that reflected the morning sun. The other wall was undecorated and mostly rebuilt, but that wasn't where I was heading to. I angled my wings and pivoted in the sky as I decreased speed. This was the exact opposite of how I'd landed the first time outside of Hatra's inner walls. That had been an inexperienced crash landing, but this time I was much more experienced and my wings glided gently over the barren soil as I came to a stop in front of the main gate. With a shake of my head, I shifted from my immense draconic body to my human form. My limbs grew smaller and fewer as almost all of my scales disappeared, save for the ones on my inner forearms. Soon enough, I felt my hair graze the back of my neck and brush along my cheeks. It had grown longer during the time I'd been in this world. I kept it pretty short back on Earth since I'd been an EMT, but maybe growing it out here wouldn't be a problem. A pure presence hovered on the edge of my senses, and I glanced over at the main gate. That had to be my princess approaching. Evan! Aliona called out as she stepped through the main gate with a bright smile on her face. Thank goodness you came back in time. Behind her, my adoptive parents followed at a sedate pace and waved at me. I thought it was supposed to take a week for the architects to arrive, I muttered as I walked over to my princess. How are they here so early? I believe someone interesting is coming with the entourage. <laughs> Aliona giggled into her hand. Their presence would explain how quickly they've arrived. Someone interesting? I placed a finger underneath her chin and tilted her head back. What do you mean by that? You'll have to wait and see, my princess teased, and delight glittered in her amethyst eyes. 
I'm sure you'll both get along splendidly. I'll take your word on it. I shook my head as I smiled and let my hand fall away from her chin. Are we prepared to welcome them? I know we have the space to house them, but this is kind of short notice. The quarters in the buildings next to the temporary palace are prepared to house guests, Aliona replied as she began to list things off on her fingers. A lunch has been prepared and set up on the first floor of the temporary palace, and there's enough for twenty people, though I doubt there'll be that many. You're a saint, you know that? I pressed a quick kiss to her lips before I walked away. I'm going to go check in with my parents, see if there's anything they need. My parents met me halfway through the gate, and I noticed Ruslan was wearing shoes for once. I didn't know how Julia had managed to accomplish that, but I was impressed. How did the patrol go? Ruslan asked as he clasped an arm around my shoulder. Laika told us you were meeting Valera out by the waterfall, and that you'd somehow convinced her to help protect the areas around Hatra. Well, there's fireproof monsters in the desert, I replied dryly as I grimaced. Other than that, nothing much really happened. That is not what I wanted to hear. There was a look of disgusted confusion on Ruslan's face. Did you kill them? Yeah, I got them all. I nodded as I brushed back some of the hair from my face. And Valera is, well, the same as always. Well, good to know something is still the same. Ruslan muttered partly to himself and shook his head. Fireproof monsters in the desert. What's next, killer plants? Or maybe the forest is suddenly going to march on Hatra. Ruslan, be quiet, Julia commanded as she fanned herself lightly. I don't want you accidentally jinxing us. At this point, Julia, Ruslan replied with a frown, this is a valid concern. Have you seen what's been happening here? Pops has a point about this, I added easily. Things are getting pretty strange, even by our standards. Then we keep adjusting to the new standards. Julia snapped her fan shut and walked over to where Aliona stood several feet away. Ruslan and I exchanged a glance as we trailed behind Julia. Everything had really escalated for Hatra. It was pretty much non-stop over the past month. There hadn't been even a moment where something wasn't happening, from water demons attacking us to demonized harpies appearing out of nowhere. We came to a stop next to Aliona and followed her gaze to the north, but I couldn't see anything in the sky. Even so, there was something on the edge of my senses, but nothing like the overwhelming and suffocating presence of King Rodion. It was more like Aliona's power, steady and almost warm. This is weird, I murmured to my family. It's like I was basking underneath the sun and all of its warmth is sinking into my bones. I thought it was just me, Ruslan confessed as he ruffled my hair. It's somewhat strange. I'm starting to feel more cheerful. No, that's not the right way to describe it. Like, anything is possible? I suggested as I kept my eyes on the northern sky. Yes, Julia agreed quietly. Just like that. Suddenly, something came into view in the distance. I squinted in an attempt to try and make out what it was. And when I saw it, I gasped. It wasn't an airship, but what looked like an ornate little cottage on a large white cloud with gleaming crimson columns in front of the door. Strange carvings similar to the ones in the underground library covered the red columns, and there were two windows, one on either side of the door, and the glass shimmered as if it were liquid mercury. What is that? I managed to get out, and my voice was full of awe. That can't be an airship, can it? It is. Aliona glanced at me with pride in her eyes and dripping from her voice. It can be considered a floating home. There are some places that float in the sky and travel in whichever direction their master wishes. This is an example of one. But they take a great amount of power to maintain. Not everyone is capable of such a thing. Is this the interesting person you mentioned earlier? My eyes snapped back to Aliona with more than a little curiosity. Yes, Aliona replied with a laugh. He is called the Prince of Light, and he is a noble of the sword. His eminence himself has even recognized him for his prowess and abilities. That's impressive. I let out a low whistle as I kept my eyes on the airship. I see King Rodion really delivered when he said he was sending help to Hatra. His eminence does not go back on his word. Aliona smiled, but the light disappeared from her eyes for a moment. He has promised to help Hatra, and help Hatra he will. I wouldn't be surprised if he opened the treasury of the White Jade Sect for Hatra's renovations. 
The airship, or floating home as Aliona had referred to it, landed gently a dozen yards away from us. No dust was displaced by its landing, and the cloud at its base seemed to merge down into the earth. It was like the tiny cottage had always been there in front of us, and there was just some leftover snow from winter at its doorstep. Then the door swung open, and eleven people walked out of the house, far more than should have comfortably fit inside of a cottage of such size. If that wasn't proof of the magic that created the tiny structure, I didn't know what would be. A young man with black hair led the group toward us, and he seemed to be even younger than I was, maybe a teenager on the cusp of adulthood. Even so, there was something about him, and I could tell the warmth we'd all felt came from him. He was the source of that invigorating energy, but there was nothing youthful about his silver eyes. They were like the eyes of someone who was already dead and tired of the world. The leader of the group knelt in front of Aliona, and the other ten strangers followed suit immediately. Hail to Her Royal Highness, the young man spoke with confidence. The Divine Maiden of Rama and the future son will protect us all. Rise, my loyal sword. Power and quiet confidence rolled off Aliona in waves as she inclined her head slightly. We greet you, lords and lady of Hatra, the silver-eyed young man intoned as he turned on the spot and glanced at us. Would you mind introducing yourselves? I asked with a wry smile and stepped forward. You know who we are, but we have no idea who you are, well, save for the princess here. Of course, the silver-eyed man replied. We would be remiss in our manners if we didn't. I am Nikolaus of Leyte, and I am a noble of the sword. Onya is my name. The gold-haired girl next to him dipped into a shallow curtsy. My master is Nikolaus. Anya! Mariah's voice cried out happily throughout my spiritual sea. Oh, my heart is overfilled with joy at the sight of her. She is one of my sisters. I glanced back at the younger girl with more than a little surprise. I hadn't realized the other sword spirits could transform as well. Natesta is my name. One of two white-haired girls stepped forward and dipped her head. I am a disciple of Leyte Sage. I am Lord Alexi. I come from the city of Leyte. A smug-looking man with pale brown eyes and white hair said as he stepped forward to bow shallowly. I'm Seroja, and I am a scholar. Another white-haired girl with brilliant blue eyes inclined her head. I'm also from Leyte, but I served in the Mihereti Mountains for some time. Yes, yes, there is time for us to learn each other's names later, Nikolaus spoke up with a sigh. There is a more pressing matter to attend to. Before Nikolaus could go on, Anya tugged on his sleeve, and he glanced down at her with a sudden frown on his face. Welcome to our city, I said when the silence stretched for a moment and I realized Nikolaus wasn't going to continue. We have empty quarters for you near what we've been calling the Temporary Palace. Temporary Palace? The man named Alexi sneered as he looked at us. I frowned at the man and clenched my jaw tightly as I took in a breath. There was no point in getting upset at someone so early in the day. I didn't even know these people, and they had come with the king's recommendation. That had to count for something. But if anyone else decided to trash-talk my city, I wasn't at fault for my actions. Before anything else commences, I must ask a favor of you. Nikolaus drew me out of my thoughts and took a step toward me with a serious expression on his face. It is the important thing I mentioned earlier. What is it? I asked with a frown. I half expected there to be someone wounded amongst the group. Fight me! Nikolaus replied easily. Excuse me? I blinked, sure I had heard him wrong. Why do you want to fight me? We've only just met. In front of me, half of his entourage sighed and buried their faces in their hands. I could even see Aliona, out of the corner of my eye, do the same. I guess this wasn't the first time Nikolaus had challenged someone to a fight after only just meeting them. I wish to see firsthand your strength. Nikolaus continued without any malice in his voice. My king has told me of you, but I wish to test myself against my fellow noble of the sword. Behind Nikolaus, an excitable-looking boy with silver hair sent me a helpless smile and shrug. He lifted one finger to his forehead and made a quick circle before he pointed at the sword that dangled from Nikolaus's hip. It was obvious he was trying to get me to understand Nikolaus was a combat freak. And that was perfectly fine by me. 
I'd show these nobles I wasn't something to sneer at. I understand the sentiment, I chuckled as I stepped away from the group. How do you want to do this? I challenged you, Nikolaus followed me swiftly. So you pick the method of battle, be it swords, magic, or hand-to-hand combat. I glanced down to the sword that hung at my hip. I didn't know the first thing about swinging a blade, and from both the look and sound of it, Nikolaus was more than comfortable with his own sword. Fighting by hand would be the better choice. Let's settle this with fists, I grinned as I untied my own sword and set it gently on the ground. What better way to get to know each other, eh? I couldn't agree more, Nikolaus replied as he mimicked my actions and set aside his own sword. Shall we begin? My reply was to dive at Nikolaus and attempt to topple him over. Instead, Nikolaus sidestepped me with a wide smile on his face as he let his arms dangle at his sides. Using my back leg as support, I turned and brought a fist up to where I sensed Nikolaus was, but it just grazed his shoulder as he swung his body out of the way. I barely even had time to think as Nikolaus's own fist whistled past my face. He was just as fast as I was, and maybe even stronger. Instead of getting frustrated, this only made me more excited for the fight. This was someone who knew how to fight barehanded and didn't depend on their weapons. I could definitely get along with someone like him. There was a certain type of honesty in Nikolaus's attacks. They weren't obnoxiously showy or purposefully elaborate. I could tell from the way he moved seamlessly that he was more than experienced in fighting. This was a man whose whole body had become a weapon. If I slipped up in the slightest, this mock battle between us would be over in a second, and I would have lost, which was something I wasn't going to allow. This was the perfect opportunity for me to start laying the foundations for winning over the nobles. If I was able to keep avoiding Nikolaus's powerful punches, of course. One of Nikolaus's fists narrowly grazed my cheek, and the air pressure behind the hit left a thin trail of blood on my face. That had been too close for my comfort, and I was sure he was slowly getting faster. Were all nobles of the sword like this? Impressive! Nikolaus cheerfully called out as he sidestepped my punch. You're just as good as I've heard. You're definitely living up to my expectations. Oh, I growled as I swiped at his ribs. Just what have you heard about me? You're a born fighter. It's like you were created for combat. Nikolaus's silver eyes glittered with excitement. I cannot wait for the day we will fight side by side in actual battle. It will be a day of glory that will be remembered for ages to come. You're a bit of a battle freak, aren't you? I couldn't help the amusement in my voice, since I was the same way. Is fighting all you can think about? Of course not. The well-being of my people is always at the forefront of my mind, Nikolaus replied easily as we circled each other. It's simply that the best way I can protect my people is in battle. We are nobles of the sword, after all. Battle is where we are at our best. Well, I can't argue with that, I laughed as I dove toward Nikolaus and attempted to tackle him to the ground. That was an interesting move. Nikolaus neatly dodged my attempt to throw him down, but I saw a hint of surprise in his eyes at my tactic. Were you attempting to use my own strength against me? Yeah, that was the point. I was surprised at how quickly he had picked up the move. It's a whole fighting art based on using your opponent's strength against them. You'll have to teach me that fighting art one day. Nikolaus rolled his shoulders as he settled back into a loose stance. Implementing your fighting technique into the training camps could prove to be helpful. Some of the soldiers lack physical strength when in battle against the demons, even through strenuous training and cultivation. How difficult would you say it is to learn? It just takes dedication, I explained, as I bounced on the balls of my feet. Even a child can learn how to use this technique without hurting themselves. That's perfect! Nikolaus's silver eyes lit up at my words. If this is a fighting art anyone can use, it will save countless lives in future skirmishes. I smiled at his praise for a moment before I dove back into the fight. That was a discussion for the future. After several more attacks and feints, we ended up at a stalemate. Nikolaus kept managing to parry my blows back, and I his. We circled each other with narrowed eyes, and Nikolaus's mouth twitched into a smirk, like he thought he'd already won. 
I was looking for an opening somewhere, though, a way I could slip in and gain the upper hand. I had to do something he wasn't expecting. As Nikolaus shuffled to the side, he kicked up a cloud of dirt, and I knew just what I could do. I could change the terrain and throw him off his feet. Nikolaus was going to be expecting my punches and kicks to be aimed at him since that's what I'd been doing this entire time. He wouldn't expect an attack from below. I watched Nikolaus carefully for the right moment to strike against the ground. He'd adapted pretty quickly enough to my fighting style, so I would have only one chance if I wanted to catch him off guard. My plan wouldn't work a second time. There was a minute shift in the wind as we parried blows, and a lurking sense of power that was almost reminiscent of the miasma fluttered through the air. There was nothing to worry about, though. There was always a subtle presence of the miasma in the air outside of the city. But Nikolaus didn't know that. For the slightest of moments, Nikolaus's eyes shifted from me to the surrounding area, and that's when I struck the ground between us with all of my strength. The force from my punch caused a minor shockwave that threw Nikolaus into the air, but I hadn't expected to be launched off my feet as well. We both landed on the ground and gasped from the impact. Ha! Nikolaus cried from his prone position in the dirt. I was not expecting that! Impressive! Thank you! I wheezed as I stared at the sky overhead and tried to get the air back into my lungs. Now that we've fought and greeted each other, Nikolaus laughed as he pushed himself up to a sitting position. Do you have any food? I'm famished. Is that really what you'd call a greeting? I grinned at his reaction as I sat up from where I'd landed on the ground. Obviously, Nikolaus replied and stood up. You can tell a lot about a person from their fighting style. And I can see you'll be a fine prince. There's a lot of honesty in you, and I'll be honored to fight alongside you against the coming darkness. I couldn't help but laugh loudly as I sat in the dirt. It was a deep belly laugh that coursed through every fiber of my being. This was definitely someone I could get along with. Nikolaus walked to me and offered me his hand. And I'll be honored to have you as a comrade and a friend, I replied as I took his hand with a grin. There's food inside. Follow me and we can all talk while we eat. The younger man helped me to my feet, and we both went in search of our swords. Our two groups had merged into one during our fight, and Nikolaus's entourage fell into place behind my parents. Nikolaus walked beside Aliona and me, and he excitedly commented on our fight to the priestess. Somehow, it was easy to talk to him, especially since he wasn't as serious as he first appeared to be. I guess I was right when I pegged him to be younger than I was. When we reached the temporary palace and settled around a table laden with food, I launched right into the meat of the matter and started on the topic of the miasma. While it hadn't outright attacked us lately, it was still a dangerous threat that lurked on the edges, especially with how deeply interwoven it was with Asher and the prisoners. My theory is that the miasma is either intelligent, I explained as I leaned forward to rest my hands on the table, or it's being controlled by someone else. Varying masks of confusion and terror covered the faces of the new arrivals, all save for Nikolaus and Nadezda, the disciple of Lady Sage. My fellow noble of the sword looked to be deep in thought at my words, but Nadezda leaned forward with curiosity shining in her eyes. Truly? Nadezda asked as she tapped her fingers against the goblet of water in front of her. That's a terrifying theory, even if it doesn't turn out to be entirely accurate. We'd have to strenuously test it, but how would we even experiment on such a thing? She trailed off and shook her head. My apologies. I was getting distracted by my thoughts. What brought you to this realization? The attacks on Hatra were too directed, I sighed. It was like they were purposefully attempting to eradicate any signs of life in the city, even after it had been toppled by the demons. So I started thinking, why would something like the miasma keep targeting a fallen city? And why were the attacks escalating? And why didn't it leave to attack somewhere with a higher population? And what conclusion did you come to? Nikolaus asked and lifted the goblet in front of him so he could drink from it. We've never been able to find any pattern to the miasma's attacks. They've always been random. There was something in Hatra the miasma was after. Julia chimed in as she snapped her fan open and closed her eyes. We found the underground archives completely untouched and sealed for the better part of a millennia. 
And that's when the escalation of the attacks became even higher. What happened? Nikolaus set his goblet down as he frowned. Did the miasma completely encircle the city? It wasn't just the miasma, Ruslan muttered with more than a hint of bitterness in his voice. A man entered Hatra claiming to be a traveling scholar and opened up a magical array above the city. An almost endless amount of corrupted corpses fell through and attacked us. There were some of the living in the mass that attacked us too, and they were just barely holding on to their lives. At the same moment that happened, Aliona added as she poked at her food with a fork, the miasma attacked me and managed to force me into deviation. There was a sudden silence at the table as the new arrivals stared at her with wide eyes. Even Nikolaus seemed to be set on edge by her confession. That's unsettling. The scholar Sorosia murmured and folded her hands underneath her chin as she stared at Aliona. You're the divine maiden of the White Jade sect. Miasma shouldn't be able to even reach your body. But for it to be able to force you, someone who has a divine body, into deviation? We've never even considered something like that being possible, let alone it actually happening. And yet it did, I sighed as I leaned back in my chair to look up at the ceiling. Not to mention, the Azurin village was attacked by demons. The attack happened just before Hatra was nearly overrun by the corrupted corpses. Uh, I beg your pardon! Nadezda coughed into her goblet and glanced at me with wide eyes. The Azuras were attacked? And killed, I added somberly. We were only able to save the children of their lord and a handful of others. None of our guests had expected any of the facts we'd dumped on them, which made me think the king hadn't told them nearly as much as I'd hoped. Perhaps he was trying to limit the amount of people the information was spread to. I'd have to ask him the next time we managed to speak. This is verging on insanity, Alexei rubbed his forehead as he leaned back in his chair with a groan. You're right in that this couldn't be possible if the miasma was mindless as we've always believed it to be. What else happened? Nikolaus stared right at me as he folded his arms over his chest. I heard rumors of an army on Hatra's doorstep, claiming that a dragon had kidnapped their princess. The rumors were silenced quickly by the White Jade sect, but the damage was done. There was an army, I admitted as I thought back to the battle. It belonged to the Green Glass sect. We were able to rout them and take prisoner a good majority of their warriors and mages. Nikolaus frowned at my words, and I could see how he focused on the sect name. One of his fingers began to tap on his arm rapidly. My lords and ladies, if I may, Nadezda spoke up, I would like to study the miasma according to Lord Evan's theories. There may be something I can discover within the archives, and I believe this is how I may be able to best serve Hatra. That would be perfect. Aliona glanced at the disciple with a soft smile on her face. We actually managed to trap some of the miasma inside one of my barriers. Truly? Nadezda's face lit up with excitement, and she sat up straight in her chair. That's incredible, your highness. No one's ever been able to study a sample. How did you manage to trap it in a barrier without purifying it? Aliona launched into an explanation of how, once again, I had come up with an idea of isolating the miasma without touching it. With the idea in mind, she'd been able to create a barrier around the miasma and essentially turned it into a deadly snow globe. Quite a lot has happened to this city of yours, Nikolaus shook his head as he glanced back at me. Anyone would say the city was truly cursed by perhaps even the gods themselves. You have no idea, I muttered before I stood up to stand by the window. I wouldn't be surprised if that was actually what happened. I still remembered how Aliona had told me the city had been founded by a princess from the moon, and after she'd brought together the tribes in the area and gave them a thriving city, they killed her lover. If I were her, I didn't know if I would be able to continue protecting the city I'd made. I might have even destroyed it. Then what's the first order of business? Nikolaus stood and walked over to me. How can we help in the reconstruction of Hatra? We're in the perfect place for that. I murmured back as I let my power seep into my hand. We just need a few more people before we start. A glimmering dragon formed in my hands, and it was tiny and delicate as it caught the light of the sun. Anyone would have thought it were made from crystal or even diamond. It was so multifaceted and beautiful. 
The dragon leapt from my hand and flew out of the room, and with it went my message to the rest of the council and the pages who served my family. Before, we'd been doing our best to rebuild Hatra with what understanding we combined from the underground library and my knowledge from Earth. However, there were things I didn't know about architecture and only so much I could do with my control over stone. Also, there was only so much we could learn from the books in the library. There were too many possible errors that could result in lives lost. But now, I had exactly the tools I needed to finish rebuilding my city. Chapter 8 I caught the nobles and architects up on the plans that had been discussed during the town hall meeting a few days before their arrival. Afterward, I mentioned the idea of building a fortification near the Orichalum mine, and there was a moment of shock amongst the nobles, save for Nikolaus, when I mentioned the mine. I never thought I'd be so close to the origin of Orichalum. Nadezda's eyes glittered with curiosity and excitement, and she was almost vibrating in her seat. That mine is definitely a national treasure. And something else that needs protecting, I sighed as I rubbed the bridge of my nose. If possible, I would love to see the mine as well, Nadezda added. I would settle for a piece of Orichalum to study, though. It wouldn't have to be much, just a tiny piece so we can see how the miasma would react to it under observation. Talk to Natalia and ask her for some pieces of it, I replied. She is one of the Azuras who survived the attack on the village. She resides in Hatra now as one of our blacksmiths. She'll give you what you need for your experiments. What happened? Nikolaus asked. You said the mine is also in need of protection, yes? Demonized harpies attacked the mine, I explained with a frown. They weren't exactly like corrupted corpses, but they were frighteningly similar. It was obvious their minds weren't their own. Demonized harpies? Nadezda stood suddenly, and her chair fell on the floor behind her. How is that even possible? I have no idea, I admitted to the disciple. None of us even knew such a thing could exist. Their souls cried out for salvation, Aliona murmured gently. And it was clear to me they'd been forced into something similar to deviation, but not quite that. Their spiritual seas weren't on fire, but it was like something had tainted them. It was just like the stories of the old days. Old days? I glanced over at my princess and frowned at her serious face. What kind of stories are you talking about? When the demons would drag mortals down to the depths of hell, Nikolaus added as he stood and righted Nadezda's chair. That is what you are talking about, am I correct? Yes. Aliona replied as she tucked a lock of hair behind her ear. We've all thought they were just impossible stories. Apparently we were wrong. What happened to the harpies was some twisted form of necromancy, corrupting the art into the most wicked form possible. I'm searching in the library for any clues as to what happened. That reminds me, Nikolaus pulled out a silver ring from his pocket and tossed it to Aliona. His eminence entrusted this to me. He said you would have need of it. My library! Aliona's amethyst eyes shone like stars with her excitement. There may be something here that could lead me to an answer. If you'll excuse me, my lords and ladies. The newcomers from Lady immediately stood at those words and inclined their heads respectfully. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see my father blink in surprise at their actions. If I may be so bold, may I accompany you in order to study this event? Nadezda asked as she took a step toward Aliona. And I as well, Sorosia the scholar added quickly. My talents would be better served under your command, your highness. Of course, Aliona replied with a smile. I would greatly welcome the help in my research. Don't spend all night in the library again, I reminded my princess as she stepped toward the door. There's no point in overworking yourself. Her only response was to send a blinding smile my way as she stepped through the door, followed by Nadezda and Sorosia. I doubt she would take your advice, Julia murmured from behind her fan. She's quite the stubborn one, after all. Yeah, I sighed as I shook my head fondly. She's going to be there all night again. I tore my eyes away from the door and turned my attention back to the matter at hand. We have more pressing things to attend to, though. Lord Nikolaus, I was under the impression there would be a caravan of supplies and workers arriving with your entourage. 
You are correct, Nikolaus replied as he sat back down. We were the vanguard, you could say. The proper caravan will be arriving in a few days, laden with all of the supplies his eminence promised, and more. I could tell there was a hidden undertone to his words, and I wondered if his early arrival was supposed to be a deterrent against any attack on Hatra by the demons or the Green Glass sect. A king as wise as Rodion wouldn't make a move without considering every possibility, Mariah whispered to me from my spiritual sea. This lord of Leyte is quite powerful. He would be a worthy ally. I didn't respond to the spirit sword. Talking to Mariah in front of everyone at the table wasn't something I was entirely comfortable with. I didn't know what was going on, but given what Asher had told me about a traitor in the White Jade sect, my instincts screamed that there was a serpent at the table. Considering there was quite the variety of newcomers, I wasn't sure who had triggered my inner alarm, but I quietly studied them nonetheless. We'll make sure to have quarters prepared for them when they arrive, I promised Nikolaus before I launched into the long list of work that needed to be done. Since we have some time before your workers arrive, let's use that to go over my plans. You've seen that a good majority of the city is rebuilt, and the walls are up once more. We still have most of the defensive structures left to rebuild, though, mainly the lookout towers and military barracks. There's also still the farm expansion, the defensive structures for the Arcalum mine, the fallen temples, as well as the central palace and government offices. Obviously, the palace should be reconstructed first, Alexei scoffed and waved his hand in the air. There's no doubt that should be the first order of business. Excuse me? I gritted my teeth as I told myself to be patient with this newcomer. What's your reasoning behind rebuilding the palace first? You can't have a city without a palace. Alexei shook his head, as if his logic was perfectly sound. The ruling family can't be living in the streets with the common folk, let alone make her highness live outside of a palace. Beside him, the excitable silver-haired boy from earlier sighed heavily as he rubbed his temples. Then one of the women in the group, quite delicate-looking, and with curly blue hair, groaned into her hands. So, I sighed as I crossed my arms over my chest, your logic is that Hatra needs a symbol, and the house of Hatra El Shamash can't live alongside the people they rule? A ruler is a living symbol, Lord Evan. Alexei glanced over at my adoptive parents for a moment. So they have to be untouchable and without reproach. If that means living apart from the masses, then so be it. It seemed like I was going to have to make something clear to this foreign noble. Yeah, you see, I began coldly as I leaned back in my chair. That's not going to fly with me or in Hatra at all. I don't mean the Lunar Palace will never be rebuilt. I already promised my people I'd rebuild it for them, but that's not a priority right now. The priority is making sure my people are safe, no matter what happens. So no, I'm not going to waste time on a palace no one needs to live in yet when there's so much more outside of the city walls that needs to be done first. There was a moment of silence and tension as Alexei frowned, and his fists clenched tightly around the armrests of his chair. For a moment, I thought there was going to be more arguments from him, but he just nodded sullenly and slumped back into his chair. I smirked in triumph. I wasn't about to be bossed around in my own city, and now these nobles knew it. Suddenly, I could hear two pairs of footsteps outside of the room, and I knew the two people I'd sent for had finally arrived. We've brought the plans, my lord! Leon exclaimed as he walked into the room, and his arms were full of scrolls and books. All of them! Dagon added cheerfully, just as burdened as Leon was and we brought unused parchment and scrolls as well. Perfect! Just spread them out here on the table. I pointed at the empty spaces between the plates of refreshments. The two of you can take a seat, in case we need any explanations on your plans. A blue-haired man with eyes the color of an amber sunset was the first one to grab onto the paperwork brought in, and he began to scan through the various sketches Leon had made. A woman with brilliant crimson hair leaned over his shoulder as her brow furrowed in thought, and her dark brown eyes darted to and fro over the parchment. They murmured quietly to each other, and I caught some of their whispered words. "'What about terraces?' the blue-haired man asked as he glanced over his shoulder at the woman. "'Terraces could work between the walls and create additional farming areas. We could divide them according to crops.' 
It depends on the height of the inner walls compared to the outer walls, she responded confidently. Look at the schematics for the aqueducts. What do you think about connecting them to the underground system? Uh, excuse me for interrupting your thought process. I spoke up with a slight grin and leaned forward. But I don't think I quite caught your names. Ah! The crimson-haired woman smiled and inclined her head quickly. I am Raisa, an architect of Leti. It is an honor to help rebuild this city. I am Azra from Leti as well. The blue-haired man brought his hand to his forehead in a quick salute. I am also an architect and gladly offer my services in the reconstruction of Hatra el Shamash. And I gladly welcome your help, I replied as I leaned back in my chair. Hatra needs all the help she can get. You were saying about the underground waterways, though? Well, it could work, Azra hummed out as he tilted his head to the side. If the underground waterways haven't been damaged during the past thousand years at all, which I doubt. We're going to have to go underground to check all of that out. Would it be possible to examine them with magic? I asked the two architects. Well, it can be done, Azra replied as he frowned. Using just magic to examine them isn't flawless, though. You could miss something because you are looking at all of it all at once. Examining the waterways section by section using both our eyes and our magic would ensure there are no mistakes or issues we'd overlooked. Are these all of the plans? Raisa asked and suddenly looked up from the sketches. They are, I nodded back to her as I took a sip from my goblet. Leon's been putting together all of the schematics under my mother's guidance and direction. Leon preened at my words for a moment before he suddenly coughed and glanced down at the floor. Thank you for your praise, my lord. Don't be shy, Leon. Julia glanced over at him with a smile as she set her fan down. You've got quite the talent, considering we were a ruined city and you were educated on the remnants of our passed-down knowledge. They are rather fine sketches. Raisa smiled over at Leon. They make things much easier for us. Thank you. The most pressing issue right now is the expansion of the farms. I tapped my fingers on the table as I frowned at the plates full of food. Right now they're producing enough for us, but as the city grows it won't be enough. I don't want to clear out any of the land within the city walls for the expansion of the farms, though. Not when we have all that arable land between the walls. The issue is how to keep them as a defensive structure and be able to feed the mouths of everyone. The two architects glanced back down at the schematics they'd begun to spread out over the table, but this time there was no whispered mutterings of ideas. Raisa and Azra only stared fiercely at the plans before they both whipped their heads back up. Perhaps if we raise the elevation of the land between the walls, Raisa suggested, and excitement burned in her voice as she paced behind Azra. Farming on a sloping incline? I glanced between the two architects. Is that what you mean? Exactly, Azra explained as he lifted a glowing finger in the air and began to draw with it. We'd need a day or two at least in order to work out the kinks of the plan and to survey the area. What we could do is create terraces and leave the area immediately in front of the outer walls for defense purposes. If we do the terraces, we could create a sort of tunnel system between the gates that would give added protection to whoever enters the city. Not only that, but we could create underground farming sections, turn those places into storage, or make holding areas for people entering the city. What do you think? Azra traced slightly opaque azure lines in the air as he sketched out the city of Hatra and created what was essentially a three-dimensional model of my city. It was almost like looking at a hologram, and I never expected to see something like that in the world of Inati, but it did make discussing architectural plans much easier. That could work, I nodded as I focused on the tunnels near the main gates. That would give us multi-purpose use of the area, it won't just be farmland. I'm not exactly too fond of the idea of it being used as a checkpoint for entrances. We'd have to figure out ways to make sure nothing can go wrong. That would be a perfect target for someone to strike. Well, since you've said there's the underground library, why not make use of Atra's own natural architecture? Raisa suggested as she pointed toward the area underneath the city. Expand those already existing subterranean areas, and it would be easy to create underground farms, all things considered. 
an added benefit to subterranean farming is the fact you wouldn't have to worry about sourcing food during a siege or demon attack. Lord Nicolaus, what security measures do you have in Leyte? I asked as I glanced over at my fellow noble of the sword. If we had a barrier preventing physical violence, that would make defending ourselves quite difficult. Nicolaus smirked as he leaned forward and added on to the model with his own glowing white lines. What we've done is to have a three-step entrance process. My city of Leti is encircled with walls, just as Hatra is, but we have one additional ring. That's the first step where everyone has to go through an identification and verification process. On the magical hologram, there were now three walls encircling the city of Hatra instead of the original two. The third wall stretched further out, making it look almost like an enormous canal curled around the city. I see, I muttered as I leaned back in my chair. That additional ring can serve as a buffer zone if we don't have anything within it, or it can be an immediate defense measure if we have our military allocated within that area. Exactly, and if necessary, Nikolaus continued, it can serve as an area to accommodate refugees. I doubt Hatra will have to house any refugees outside of her walls any time soon, I replied as I shook my head. But it never hurts to be prepared. Anything at all can happen, and once the city's population starts to rise, we won't have as much free space for people to move in. Have you been to the ruins of the vassal villages yet? Alexei interjected from where he was sprawled in his chair. There could be more than enough building materials in those ruins. No. I replied honestly. I haven't had the time for that yet. Still, I'm having the Blue Tree Guild organize a patrol to some of those areas to get an idea of how bad their condition is. I tilted my head as I stared at the model. I'd been playing with the idea of a road straight to the Oracalum mine in order to make traveling to it easier, but seeing the model of the city gave me an idea. Would it be possible to create a road from the main gate of Hatra to the Oracalum mine via the Azuran village? I asked as I glanced over at the two architects. And underneath the road on the surface, could we have a tunnel system underneath that leads straight to the mine? Raisa and Azra both blinked in momentary confusion. A decoy, Ruslan murmured as he leaned back in his chair. That way no one will know exactly where or how the metal is being brought back to the city. You got it in one, Pops. I grinned at Ruslan and turned to face the architects. I've built a temporary garrison at the Azuran village and sealed off the mine for the time being, but I want to ensure that area can withstand any attack and, if necessary, have an escape route from the city to the mine. How are you going to prevent spies from getting into them? Nikolaus raised his concern. It would be dangerous for the city and easy for Hatra to be toppled if they manage to get inside. And that, I began with a smirk, is where the enchantments in the underground library will come into place. While I'm not sure how the verification process works for other cities, I do know the Lords of Hatra had some secrets up their sleeves when it came to protecting passages within the city. It'll take some time experimenting in the archives to get the right enchantments, but I know it can be done. I see. Nikolaus glanced over at his sword Anya with a smile, and the tenseness faded away from his shoulders. Hatra will be well defended then. Not even the smallest of snakes will be able to slither their way in. That's the plan, I replied with a nod, as I let a bit of a growl seep into my voice. And if they do, I'll rip the sinew from their body and let insects feast on their innards. That sounds too merciful to me, Julia huffed as she snapped her fan open. Traitors deserve much worse. If there is any person who deserves to suffer through the torment of the burning hells and all the cruel devils, it would be traitors. I didn't have to be psychic to know who my mother was thinking of. Olivier. Even though we hadn't known him long, and I'd been suspicious of his purpose in visiting Hatra from the start, he'd still been welcomed into the city as a guest. Then he spat on all of that and tried to destroy our city. Death would be too merciful for him. All right. Let's go to the walls, then. I stood up and clapped my hands. You said you needed to survey the area, right? Yes, do you think it would be possible to take a look at the waterways as well? Azra snapped his fingers, and the floating model of Hatra disappeared as he stood up. It would be helpful to see them afterwards, or depending on how long we spend at the walls, another day. Of course. 
I motioned for Dagan to follow my parents as I walked toward the entrance. I haven't visited the underground waterways yet, but I'm sure we have a map of them somewhere. I'll come with you to the walls, Nikolaus announced, before he waved off two of his aides and directed them to go with a pretty blue-haired girl, who seemed like she would be toppled over by a strong wind. The rest of you must be curious about the inner city, Ruslan began as he offered his hand to Julia. If you'd like... We can show you the city before you return to your quarters to rest. With that, our group split up in nearly equal halves. I headed out toward the city walls with the architects, Nikolaus, and the sword spirit, Anya. My parents led the rest of the group on a tour of a city so they'd be able to get to know their temporary home. I was sure they'd be led down to the underground library at some point. There was no way they weren't curious about seeing it. As for me, well... I was more excited in getting my hands dirty and maybe raising another wall for my city. Chapter 9 The walk to the main gate of Hatra was an easy one, and the two architects from Leyte talked over each other as they suggested ideas for the terraced farmlands. Their discussion was lively and completely flew over my head with the terminology they were using, but I could tell they were excited and enjoying themselves. Are they always like this? I muttered as I glanced over at Nikolaus. Once they start going on about architecture and construction, Nikolaus sighed as he discreetly rolled his eyes. Yes, always. Getting them going is easy, but getting them to stop is nigh impossible. You'll have better luck trying to stop a horde of rampaging desert beasts. I snickered at his words. Raisa and Azra did seem like two bouncing balls of energy. They somewhat reminded me of the three Dryad sisters. And I wondered what those flirtatious girls were up to, probably off on missions and patrols for the Blue Tree Guild. Even Laika's schedule was packed with training schedules and patrols now. So what's the secret to calming them down? I locked my fingers behind my head as we walked. There has to be something that would turn them off, even for a little bit. Other than knocking them unconscious? Nikolaus smirked as he looked back at the two architects. Is that really an option? I joked back easily. It might damage their brains, and then who's going to figure out the construction plans for us? Alas, Nikolaus sighed dramatically, that is the main issue. Then the only option available to us is simply to wait for them to burn themselves out, eventually. Or we can just put them straight to work, I replied as we reached the main gate. They'll be exhausted in no time. Raisa, look! Azra stopped in front of the gate to look at the ornate carvings. Do you think we could incorporate some of these design elements into the terraces? Offsetting them in the pattern of a stylized dragon? Raisa leaned in until her face was almost pressed against the draconic carvings. That could work. The maw of the dragon could be the outer gate. Or making them look like scales, Azra replied as he traced the shape of one of the dragons before him. That was my thought at first, but a stylized dragon would be interesting and make for quite the striking aerial view, especially if we make it seem like the dragon is wrapping around the city. Nikolaus and I exchanged an exasperated look. Even though I hadn't known them for very long, I could tell if we left the architects to their own devices, they would just delve down deeper into the rabbit hole of their thoughts. It was better to nip that in the bud when I could. I uh, hate to interrupt your brainstorming, I coughed as I stepped forward. But I don't think you'd like to waste daylight. Wouldn't it be better to start surveying the land before you start thinking about minute details like that? Of course, that's only my suggestion. Of course, you are right. Raisa nudged Azra aside as she coughed and shook her head. It's better to take advantage of the daylight. Come along, Azra. You need to learn how to focus. Focus? Azra frowned as he called after his fellow architect. Why are you shifting the blame on me and making me look bad in front of them? Because you were the first one to be distracted. Raisa replied quickly as she glanced back to us. Am I wrong, my lords? And so it continues. I sighed as I tried not to burst into laughter. Azra, you lost this time. Nikolaus coughed as he tried to hide his smile behind his hand. Let's continue on with what we promised to deliver. We are on a schedule, after all. As you saw when you arrived, this is the space we have, I explained as I took a step into the land between the inner and outer walls. By my estimate, 
it's a mile, maybe a little more, wide. How many terrace levels would we be able to fit into this space? The walls are what? Ninety feet high? Raisa squinted up at the inner walls as she walked backwards toward me. Approximately, yes, I replied. We haven't measured them out, so that's another estimate. That is no problem at all, Azra spoke up from next to Nikolaus. There were some measurements in the schematics Leon brought to us. We can double-check them to make sure they are correct. By the look of it, we can probably fit six concentric levels around the city. Raisa glanced over her shoulder at me and smiled confidently. Trust us on this, Lord Evan. We'll have this ready for the planting season. And by the time fall comes around, all of this will be swaying farmland. I'll leave you to it, I responded with a nod. I'm trusting you with the well-being of my city. King Rodion picked you all out, and I'm going to have faith in his decision. You won't regret it, Azra called out as he jogged backwards and glanced up at the walls. I looked over at Nikolaus to ask him something, but blinked in confusion when I realized Anya had disappeared. Nikolaus's sword spirit had been silent the entire time we'd walked through Hatra but I'd seen her pause a few times as she took in the city's sights like a distracted squirrel. She'd been trailing just behind us earlier, but now she wasn't there. Where's Anya? I asked Nikolaus as I walked over to him. She was just behind you, wasn't she? Oh? Nikolaus glanced around him and shrugged. She's probably around here somewhere. She's quite the curious one and likes exploring. If anything, she'll be back by the time everyone is getting ready for bed. Are all sword spirits like that? I asked, as I thought back to how Mariah had led me down to the catacombs. They do what they wish when they wish, Nikolaus shrugged again, and placed a hand on the hilt of his sword. It's like trying to chain down wind or water. You cannot control them. You can only be their partner and their ally. Well, it's kind of hard to tie them down if they're spirits, I muttered as I glanced at the sword at my own hip and frowned. Despite what I just said, Weren't the spirits chained down and trapped in some ways? I had no idea how or why the swords were sentient, but their only freedom was choosing who their partner would be. Other than that, they were pretty much slaves. What are you thinking about so seriously? Nikolaus waved his hand in front of my face. You've quite the dark expression on your face. Is everything all right? Yeah, I blinked and shook my head as I turned. Let's head to the outer wall and talk about that third wall you mentioned late he has. Of course, Nikolaus replied as he followed after me easily. What would you like to know about the third wall? How many guards are garrisoned on it? I jumped right into the biggest question. This was how I would know how big I would need to make the third wall. There was no point in half-assing something just because we didn't have all the manpower needed to guard a proper city. Not having it now didn't mean we wouldn't have it in the future. Fifty thousand guards are stationed full-time within the third wall, Nikolaus explained as we reached the outer wall. There's an additional twenty-five thousand guards who are rotated into the fifty thousand in order to make sure they are all well-rested and prepared for any eventuality. Those fifty thousand guards, I began as I eyed the space behind the outer wall, they live inside of the third wall? Yes, Nikolaus closed his silver eyes for a moment. The other 25,000 live in barracks, unless they have family within the city walls, and then, depending on their experience and designation, they may live with their own family. Also, at any given time, a total of 6,000 guards are given time off. I see, I replied quietly as I fell deep into thought. That was a minimum of 75,000 mouths to feed, and assuming only half of them had families, that number could easily be tripled. The only way Hatra would be able to feed so many people was if the farms were expanded into the desert or if the vassal villages were rebuilt. Either way, it was going to take just as long as I'd originally thought for Hatra to be fully rebuilt, perhaps even longer than I'd realized or planned for. I wasn't sure how long King Rodion would be able to support Hatra with food and supplies, and if doing so would only be a burden on the rest of the country. Not to mention the fact I'd have to leave Hatra soon to go on my campaign to woo the rest of Rama. Are you worried about feeding your people? Nikolaus asked gently as he placed his hand on my shoulder. How did you know? I was a bit startled. He could so easily read my thoughts. 
Because I'm in the same position you are, Nikolaus replied with a tired smile. I'm a noble of the sword with a duty not only to protect the city of Leyte, but the rest of the world as well. The burdens we carry are heavy ones, but we have the strength to bear it. Wouldn't you agree? Somehow Nikolaus appeared even younger to me as he spoke, and I had a suspicion he really was younger than me. Maybe he was even younger than Leon. Then I guess the two of us should stick together, huh? I slung an arm around his shoulder and laughed. Since we both know the burden of protecting everyone and everything we love, it would be good for us to have someone we can lean against. What do you think? Even though I'd only just met Nikolaus today, my instincts screamed at me that he was someone I could trust. He wasn't in my pack technically, but I had a feeling I was going to see him as pack soon enough. Maybe even as a younger brother. Could it be because we both shared raven-colored hair? I didn't know how my dragon instincts worked, but I just knew he was my ally. It would be an honor to fight at your side, Nikolaus replied with a smile of his own. Well, <laughs> hopefully we won't be fighting any time soon, I laughed as I stepped away and rubbed at my neck. Ah, this is going to be tricky. What is going to be tricky? Nikolaus glanced at me as curiosity gleamed in his silver eyes. I'm going to raise up the third wall, I explained simply as I gathered my power inside of me. Lord Evan, wouldn't it be better to wait until the terraces are completed? There was a slight concern in Nikolaus's voice as he took a step toward me. A structure of the size you're planning would take a large amount of power. Aren't you worried about an energy drain? I won't know until I try, I told him. I haven't reached a limit yet with my power, and if I can't bring it up in one go, I'll try it in sections. But if I can get this wall up by myself, then that's one less thing your architects will have to bother with, and we'll have a stronger defense that much quicker. Very well, Nikolaus sighed as he took a step back. I focused my strength and power into the ground as I visualized a wall three hundred feet high. This was going to be the first line of defense for Hatra, and it needed to be taller than the other two walls. I wanted it to span all around my city and to be an impregnable defense no matter what came after my people. As for how thick the wall would be, I wanted it to serve as another defensive structure, but have the capabilities for offense. That meant turning the interior of it into a garrison or something like that. So the wall would have to be wide enough to accommodate troops passing through and living in it. I would have to make it at least 150 feet wide for that to work. So I pulled forth my power, entirely sure I would be able to bring up the massive wall I was envisioning. Something went wrong, though. It was like I was being choked, and the very air and life was being squeezed out of my body the longer I held onto the wall. Evan! Nikolaus's voice faintly reached my ears. Let go of your power! Stop! I tried but it wasn't responding. It was like I was being sucked in, no matter what I did. My power just kept flowing into the earth and air around me as I was slowly being drained of all life. My healing ability couldn't keep up with what was happening. I was metaphorically bleeding out, and there was nothing I could do to stop it from happening. I kept trying to break off the links with the ground, but the energy flow wouldn't stop, and it was still trying to raise the massive wall I'd imagined around Hatra. And that was what was trying to kill me. Faintly, I felt a small hand gently wrap around one of mine, and then the whole world went white. There was nothing I could see or sense, just a plain and white existence. I knew I wasn't dead. I could feel my heart continue to beat in my chest. But what exactly just happened? And who had grabbed onto my hand like that? Your power exploded out from you. Mariah's voice echoed all around me in the white expanse. You could have died, had it not been for the Divine Maiden and the Prince of Light lending you their power. I almost died? I asked as my heart skipped a beat, but I reminded myself I was still alive. I'd survived it. Why did my power do that? The Sword of Hatra serves as another well of power for its wielder. Mariah's voice was calm and serene, even in this situation. Misusing such a power can be potentially fatal, especially when one is unused to it. As you are, you are quite talented and powerful, but you don't know how to wield or use me at all yet. Well, talk about a lesson learned. 
I laid down in the white expanse and closed my eyes. I overestimated what I could do, but I'm not going to make that mistake again. I thought I could raise the wall at once, since I'd already been able to rebuild the aqueducts, most of the city, and the other walls. But this endeavor is so much bigger than everything else, and I tried to do it in one go. Do not be so hard on yourself, Mariah chided gently. You aren't the first noble of the sword to have done such a thing, and you won't be the last. Still, I muttered back to her tiredly, I have to be held to a higher standard. I almost left my city without any protection. Well, you've been sleeping long enough, Mariah sighed carelessly. And as much as I want to continue speaking to you thus, the Divine Maiden would not be pleased. Wait, what do you mean? I tried to ask Mariah, but the light around me began to fade and gave way to a different power. The energy around me was familiar and soothing, and I could tell exactly where I was from it. The River Moonstone House. But I didn't know how I'd gotten here. I'd been outside of the walls when my power went out of control. How long had I even been asleep? My power swirled angrily inside of me, as if it was infected or suffering from a poison. It was upset and vicious as it poked at my insides and made my spiritual sea turbulent. But it didn't matter how much pain I was in. Even if it felt like my very spiritual sea had been set on fire, I needed to learn how to stop this from happening again and figure out what had happened during the time I'd been unconscious. So I forcibly cracked open one eye and saw the white marble walls of the River Moonstone House. Moonstones glimmered along the walls and floors, and they caught the flickering light of the crystal lamps. My head was on what felt like a soft pillow, but even so, it ached and throbbed. I feel like I got run over by a behemoth or something, I groaned as I clutched my head. Don't move too quickly. Aliona's clear and sweet voice came from above me. Your power went out of control and spasmed around you. Your spiritual sea needed to be calmed. And you calmed it down? I winced as I rolled into a sitting position. How? It doesn't matter. Aliona murmured back gently as she peered into my eyes. What matters is how you're feeling, and how we can prevent this from happening again. I didn't hurt anyone, though, right? I asked with a furrowed brow. You hurt no one but yourself. Aliona explained as she placed a gentle and cool hand on my cheek. I sensed the turmoil in your power from down in the library and made my way to you as quickly as I could. Once I was there, I took in the power you were exuding and quelled it with my own. I leaned into Aliona's gentle hand, and the pain I felt slowly disappeared and became nothing more than a faint memory in my mind. I didn't know why or how, though, since this wasn't healing magic I was sensing from her. You took my power? I didn't know how to react to that. I didn't even know such a thing was possible for someone who wasn't a dragon. How? I've skipped ahead of myself. She laughed gently as she pulled her hand away from my cheek. There is such a thing as soul magic. It is one of the arts learned not only by cultivators, but by sages as well. It is the power to make what belongs to another person yours. Be it their mind or their power, you take control over it. Everything belonging to them, their soul and their very heart, is yours. Suddenly, Mariah's words of the Gesh echoed in my mind, and I thought about the way the miasma had curled around Asher and the prisoners. Could this soul magic be the key to removing them from the control of the miasma? Aliona, can you teach me soul magic? I asked as I stared right into her amethyst eyes. I don't care how long it takes to learn. I'll do whatever it takes. Are you sure? Aliona tilted her head to the side as she considered me. It is a difficult magic to maintain. You have to continually dedicate time to practicing your control. It's not like a dragon's predation. Instead, I would call this a domination of power. Asher and the prisoners from the Green Glass Sect are under the control of a Gesh, I explained. According to the Sword Spirit Mariah, if I know how to wield Mariah's power properly and have an understanding of a magic similar to the Gesh, I would be able to do something about it. I just need someone to teach me so I'd be able to put my energy toward doing it. That does make sense, Aliona replied softly. 
It must be a remarkably well-created Gesh if we haven't picked up on it yet. The Gesh could be why the first prisoner hasn't woken up from her coma yet either. It shut her mind down. That's why I want to learn it, I sighed and rubbed the back of my neck. I need to learn how to wield Mariah's power as well. Can you teach me both? I'll teach you what I can. Aliona hummed lightly. Perhaps Nikolaus can be of help, too. He is a noble of the sword, after all. He would have first-hand experience in comparison to my knowledge, which will mainly come from scrolls and tomes in regards to the swords. That reminded me, there was still the spirit of my grandfather I could turn to for advice in the catacombs. Not just that, but the wisdom of all the previous wielders of the Sword of Hatra was supposed to be within the sword and available to its current wielder. I had a lot of resources. The only problem was, I had a million things that needed my time. Do all nobles of the sword master soul magic? I asked Aliona as I closed my eyes. Yes, she replied easily. They all master it to some degree. Some of the nobles of the sword have a natural talent for it, and the magic comes easily to them. But some of them learn only the basics. I didn't have time to dedicate a vast amount of time to learning soul magic, so I'd start with the foundations. Aliona, teach me the basics for now. I opened my eyes, determined to do whatever it took to prevent today's situation from happening again. When we're traveling around Rama, I promise I will dedicate myself to mastering soul magic, but we don't have that kind of time right now. The basics are just that. Aliona smiled tiredly as she straightened her back. Meditation and mastering your spiritual sea, learning the way your power waxes and wanes until you have a solid grip on it. You can feel not only your own power, but the power of others around you. Your power will press down on others to either fill them with happiness or push them to the point of death. There will come a point, though, if you decide to fully master it, where all people will see in your face is death. I'll bear that burden. I gritted my teeth as I forced a smile onto my face for my princess. If I have to become the face of death in order to gain the power I need to protect what's important to me, then I will. I had to master this power if I wanted to accomplish anything with the Sword of Hatra. It didn't matter what I would have to sacrifice or become. There were those outside of Hatra who already considered me a demon. I'd just be showing them how accurate their label was. Chapter 10 So what do I have to do first to start learning soul magic? I asked as I rubbed at the sore muscles in my neck and looked at Aliona. You aren't doing anything just yet. Aliona stood and dusted off her dress. What? I frowned at her. Why not? You need to rest. You've already pushed yourself to the brink and collapsed once, she said with a stern look. I don't want you to overtax yourself and your spiritual sea again. Well, that makes sense. I winced as I remembered how I'd passed out earlier. I guess I can take it easy on everything for a while. I'll just start building the walls up slowly again. Maybe divide the sections up even smaller. And that's where you're wrong, Aliona said as she tapped my forehead with one of her fingers and smiled. Excuse me? I blinked owlishly at the princess. What do you mean I'm wrong? You need to rest fully. Aliona's tone left no room for argument, but her amethyst eyes softened minutely. That means not using your powers for at least a full day, maybe even a few more. Seriously? I groaned as I rubbed the bridge of my nose. Yes. Aliona slid her hand through the air and pulled out blankets and pillows that she set on the ground around me. You should spend some time here in the River Moonstone House recovering. It'll do you and your spiritual sea some good and help speed up your recovery. I'm guessing you won't be spending the night in here with me? I teased as I made a fake pouty face. It'll be rather lonely in here without your lovely presence. You need to be resting, Aliona replied with a hint of disapproval in her voice. And that means no strenuous exercise or using your powers for anything. Then where are you going to go? I sighed as I leaned back on the pillows she'd brought out for me. Obviously, I will continue researching in the underground library. Aliona smiled at me as she walked to the entrance of the hall. I do hope you're able to rest this evening. How boring, I muttered to myself as I closed my eyes and let the power of the moonstones embedded in the walls wash over me. 
I spent the night in the River Moonstone house, but I was listless the entire time. I wasn't used to sitting quietly in meditation anymore. I had gotten used to always fighting or doing something physical. Still, it wasn't like I didn't get any rest. In fact, even though I only managed a couple hours of sleep, it was some of the best sleep I'd had in years. When I finally decided to leave the River Moonstone house, the sun hadn't risen yet. The stars glimmered high above the rooftops, and the three moons of Inati lent their light to the world in place of the still sleeping sun. I yawned languidly as I walked through the cobblestone streets of my city. It seemed like no one else was awake except for the guards patrolling along the walls. So I decided to head toward the kitchens and see if there wasn't something I could scrounge up. As I started to walk toward the kitchens, I suddenly sensed two other people working outside of the city walls. They weren't any of the guards from the Blue Tree Guild, though. In fact, it seemed like they were the two architects from Lady. What on earth were they doing up at this hour? They couldn't still be working on the plans for the terraces, could they? Well, there was only one way to find out what they were doing. I switched my destination from the kitchens and headed toward the main gate. This was more interesting than any leftover food I could scrounge up. As I walked through the streets to get to the main gate, there wasn't really anything out of the ordinary. It didn't look like there was new life and hope in my city, but I knew there was. The people from Leyte had brought new possibilities with them. The plans for the terraces were proof of it, and I was excited to see what they were going to accomplish with their magic. In fact, there was probably a ton I could learn from them. While Aliona and Laika were both knowledgeable, and there was a ton of information down in the underground library, that knowledge was either dated or limited. Aliona was taught to be a ruler from a young age and had the sacred knowledge befitting a cultivator of her rank, and Laika was a blooded warrior who had a menagerie of skills, but there were things even they didn't know. Then there was the fact that nothing in the underground library had been updated for a thousand years. I yawned just as I reached the road that led to the inner wall and the main gate of Hatra. I wasn't really tired, but damn if my body and spiritual seat didn't still feel drained. It helped being in the River Moonstone house for those hours, but it wasn't enough. The flow of power inside of me had slowed down to a minute trickle, and I wouldn't have known it was even there if I hadn't been concentrating on it earlier. My power was slowly resettling inside of myself, but I knew if I even tried to heal a bruise, my power would just futz out and maybe even backfire on me. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? I walked through the main gate to see something incredibly odd, and it definitely wasn't what I was expecting to see. Though, to be honest, I wasn't really sure what I'd thought the two architects from Leyte were doing at this time of night, or morning, since it was so late it was actually early. Outside of the main gate were the two architects I'd met earlier in the day, Raisa and Azra, and they were surrounded by piles of dirt. There was even dirt on their faces if my eyesight didn't fail me. What are you doing? I asked as I rubbed my eyes and leaned against the blue stone wall. Do you have any idea what time it is? Oh! Raisa's brown eyes gleamed, and the starlight made them seem even brighter than before. Are you feeling any better, Lord Evan? Yeah, just pretty much on bed rest. I smirked from my position against the wall and shrugged. I have strict orders not to use my powers for a bit. Makes sense. Lord Nikolaus told us what you are trying to do. Azra nodded as he rubbed a bit of the dirt off his face. A little reckless, if I do say so myself. Yeah, in hindsight, that probably wasn't the smartest of moves. I bit back a chuckle as I glanced over at the outer wall. But you gotta risk something in order to gain something. I didn't get to raise the wall, but I did learn more about my power limits. That is very true. Raisa agreed as she moved to help Azra with the dirt on his face. Discovering one's limits is the first thing anyone does when they first begin on the path of cultivation. Ask anyone, and I'm pretty sure they'll tell you the same thing. Yeah? I tilted my head as I studied the two of them. Passing out like that is pretty common? Well, not usually from trying to raise a massive wall. Raisa laughed a little as she wiped some of the dirt from her own face. But from pushing themselves to the furthest point of their capabilities? Definitely. What about you guys, then? 
I moved off the wall and walked toward the two architects. Have you done something similar? Well, I tried to make an entire palace out of diamond in one week, Azra practically preened in front of the dirt piles, making for a hilarious image. Out of diamond? My eyes widened at the thought, and I couldn't help the gasp of awe that left me. You can really do that? You are looking at the cream of the crop here, Azra smirked back as he leaned on Raisa. We're the top architects of not only Leti, but most of Rama. Dare I say it, but perhaps even the whole world. He isn't, Raisa added without missing a beat. But I am. Hey, Azra glared at his fellow architect. I'm just as good as you are, if not better. Says the architect who took three weeks to craft a single palace out of pure diamond. Raisa replied nonchalantly as she glanced down at her nails. How long does that usually take? My mind ran at a million miles as I tried to figure out how much power it would take to do something like that. By oneself or with the help of others? Raisa looked up from her nails and tilted her head at me. Um, how about you tell me both? With the help of others, it would take perhaps half a year if everyone is incredibly talented. Azra waved his hand and the dirt piles around us turned to chairs and a table. That's including the use of rejuvenation elixirs, but if it's by oneself, perhaps three times that period of time, a year or two, depending on the power of the architect in question. That timeline is only considering if architects are provided the materials for building and if they don't have to either search for them themselves or craft them with their power. Raisa added as she sat down in one of the chairs in a rather unladylike manner and stretched out like a cat. Did you have materials or did you do the crafting thing? I joined Raisa at the table and tapped it. The table and chairs didn't seem to be made from stone, but weirdly enough, it was like they were carved from wood, which didn't make sense since this was just earth all around us, so shouldn't it have been stone or dirt? The majority of the palace was crafted out of my own power, Azra smiled as he sat down and placed his palm on the table between us. I used my power to compress the surrounding mineral deposits into diamonds. From there, I concentrated my magic and allowed it to flow through the earth surrounding me. Just like how I made this table, I rearranged the composition of what was around me to become what I wanted it to be. So you did all of that in three weeks? That opened up so many avenues for me. I hadn't thought of controlling Earth like that before. When it would have taken everyone else months, if not years, color me impressed. Well, I wouldn't say it was impressive, Azra shrugged as he leaned back in his chair. Especially considering I was passed out cold for the next three days while I recovered. But how did you do that? And is this something all architects can do? I glanced between the two and remembered their boasts from earlier. Creating things like the palace you mentioned, I mean? Well, yeah. Azra blinked, as if he were surprised by my question. To be an architect isn't just drawing up plans and ordering people about. It's truly being an artist. Raisa added from where she'd been quietly stretching. To live and breathe with what you create. Is that why you're still out here working? I glanced at the piles of dirt still around us and knew they must have been digging for hours. Yeah! Visible excitement shot through Raisa's body, and as she sat up straight, her eyes were alight with an artist's fire. How can we go back inside to rest when we have this beautiful project to work on? I mean, this is pretty much a blank slate for us to work with, and it's glorious. We can run wild with it. Well, within reason, anyways. Azra laughed as he rubbed the back of his neck. It's not like we're going to do anything terrible or collapse any tunnels. Wild to us means doing our absolute best work, not doing a shoddy job or anything like that. We won't do anything less than our best when it comes to these terraces. Hey, I've already made the decision to trust you guys. I smiled back at the two and did my best to reassure them. And if you can make an entire palace out of diamond by yourself in three weeks, then who am I to tell you how to do your job? See? Azra's smile widened as he pointed at me. 
I like him. He's not overbearing or acts like a know-it-all. Not like those other nobles we've worked with. Focus with me, Eel. A smile twitched on Raisa's face as she shook her head. We still haven't even finished answering his questions. Yeah, I think we got distracted. Azra chuckled as he clasped his hands in front of him eagerly. So, you ready to learn some fun stuff? I can't use my powers, though, so I, I don't think I'll be of much help. I shrugged sheepishly and nodded in the direction of the outer wall. That's the trick to it all. You just watch us work. Raisa smiled and tapped the side of her nose. Some things you don't have to use your own power for. You can watch, see how others do it, and learn from their actions. Which is what we'll be showing you since we've already gotten a look at how you were trying to raise that wall. Just to confirm, you were trying to raise it all pre-built, correct? Azra asked as he hummed in thought. Azra? He might not know all of the terms. Raisa interrupted him as she glanced at me. Be more thoughtful toward Lord Evan. Ah, that's true. Azra's eyes widened for a moment before a faint blush took over his cheeks. Sorry, I got overexcited there. Don't worry, Raisa and I will stop you if you start pulling out words I don't know. I grinned at Azra good-naturedly, and I couldn't help but be drawn into their enthusiasm. I'll start with what I meant by pre-built, okay? Azra coughed as he straightened in his seat. Sounds good. I nodded as I leaned forward, eager to learn something new. So, raising something pre-built means you aren't doing it in sections, Azra nodded in the direction of the walls and pointed at the chairs and tables he'd created. You are pulling it up from the materials in the ground as one whole structure and going through it at once. Usually, this is only done for smaller buildings or simpler things, and only masters would even dare to attempt raising larger and more intricate structures like that wall. Is it because of the power drain? I asked, as I thought of how much attempting to bring up that massive wall had taxed me. Not just that. A power drain can be avoided if one links up with others, or if they're using a power source. Raisa shook her head as she leaned forward. The issue is the structural integrity of the building will be put in jeopardy if one is improperly focusing on every piece of what is being raised. And if you're building it up piece by piece, I began as I followed their logic, you can avoid a drain, right? Exactly! Azra smiled blindingly at me as he clapped his hands. If you start with the foundations of whatever you're constructing and then continue with the structural skeleton... After that, you fill in the bits and pieces that aren't as integral to the foundation and skeletal shell of the structure. The three of us continued eagerly talking about the way buildings were brought up with magic. Perhaps saying the three of us was a bit of a stretch, though. It was mostly Raisa and Azra dumping knowledge in front of me as they tried to slow down enough for someone who was completely new to this. But I soaked it all up like a sponge. In fact, if it hadn't been for the orders to rest, I would have tried building the wall exactly like how they said architects brought up larger structures. All I had to do was start with the foundations of the wall first and then work my way up its body. Which, in hindsight, was kind of like how I'd fix the aqueducts. I just hadn't thought I could use the same technique for the wall. Now, I knew my instincts had been on the right route after all. Before we knew it, the sun had begun to rise on us, and it was a new day. As much as I'd love to keep talking with you two, I should probably get back to the River Moonstone house, I grinned as I stood up from the table. And you two should probably get some sleep. The two architects blinked at me owlishly for a moment before they both broke out into yawns. I think you may be right, Raisa replied between her yawns. We'll get started on the terraces again later today, after we've slept some. Don't push yourselves, I called out as I walked toward the main gate. We have time for the terraces, after all. Also, you two still have a ton to teach me later, and you can't do that if you're knocked out for days. At those words, the two architects burst into laughter behind me. I stifled my own laughter as I jogged back into the city and made my way back to the meditation hall. I'd learned some amazing things about construction, but now it was time to turn my studies towards soul magic.
Chapter 11 Take in a deep breath and center yourself. Aliona's voice echoed all around me in the River Moonstone house. Feel the way your spiritual sea runs through you, how your power curls around you and penetrates every fire of your being. Aliona glowed in the dim light of the meditation hall, and she seemed to be a goddess come down from the starry ceiling. Maybe she was one. It was as if she always knew what to say and had all the right answers. Even now, she was explaining what would happen when she left me alone. And after that? I asked as I stared deeply into her amethyst eyes. What do I do? You gather and control your power. She pressed a gentle kiss to my forehead before she stood. You have to understand how you and your power are one. And if you aren't one yet, then you must make it meld with you. The one in control is you, not your power. I will. I nodded sharply as I watched her leave the hall. I will overcome this. Then I breathed in deeply as I took in her words, closed my eyes, and focused only on the sensation of my spiritual sea. I hadn't dived back into it since the day I'd attempted to free Asher from the chains of the miasma, but it was just as familiar to me as if I had been doing it all my life. Understanding the power that flowed through my veins and body was something far different than the meditation I'd done back on Earth. This was on the verge of losing myself to something much bigger that slept inside of me, like a tempest waiting to break free. Aside from Asher's sleeping presence inside of my spiritual sea, I could sense my connection to Mariah like a taut string. I followed that vaguely glowing string to what was like another abyss of energy inside me. It wasn't like the serene sea I'd come to know as my own power, but almost a glacial lake. Even then, that wasn't the right way to describe it. A mirror, that's what it was like, a silver mirror set upon an icy surface. Even as I reached out to it, this power felt cool and almost indifferent. There was a sharpness to it and yet a duality as I sensed the desire to heal from it. This was the sword of healing, after all. It wouldn't make sense if there wasn't any healing power coming from it. I devoted hours simply to learning the sensation of the new power source and the way it curled around me. It was a cold sort of power, a bit like how my lightning felt as I summoned it. But there was no cool heat. This was just cold, like the reflection of the moon on a lake. Just sitting in a lotus position and breathing quietly was exhausting. My body wasn't doing anything, but my mind was going at a thousand miles per hour, and I couldn't slow down at all. This normally took the average cultivator or mage decades to accomplish, if not centuries, and I wanted to cut that down drastically to months, if not weeks. Still, I couldn't push myself to the brink. Not with this. I'd already seen how that ended, and I was going to be careful. I never made the same mistake twice, and I already knew I was going to have to come back here and meditate more often. I wasn't sure how I would accomplish that when my schedule was already unpredictable, though. Maybe I would take advantage of my lessened need for sleep and spend most nights meditating. The three moons had already risen by the time I left the River Moonstone house, and I realized I must have been in there for hours. Yet somehow, it hadn't felt like time had passed at all for me. It was like a single moment frozen in time. I didn't want to go back to my rooms in the temporary palace, but I also didn't really know where I wanted to go. I was listless and full of tired energy from the intense meditation. Even though my mind was exhausted, my body wasn't, and there wasn't much I could do about it. Working on the reconstruction of the city would be a tad risky considering what had happened yesterday. There was also the fact that I didn't know if the architects had continued studying the potential farmland. So, I wandered throughout the cobblestone streets of Hatra, not really thinking about anything as I let my feet carry me along. As I walked, I could sense warriors patrolling the inner walls in small groups, but other than that, everyone was asleep in their respective beds, including, to my great surprise, my princess. I could feel the purity of her presence in her room in the temporary palace, which shocked me to a degree. I expected her to have spent yet another night down in the underground library and fall asleep while surrounded by ancient tomes. After some time, 
I stopped and glanced up at the three silver moons of Inati, and they shone fiercely and proudly as their light painted the blue stone walls and roofs in a wash of pale gray. I couldn't help but smile with pride at the sight. Hatra really had changed in the short time I'd lived here. My home had gone from a crumbling ruin into a city reborn. It would take time for it to become the jewel it once was, but it was happening step by step. Even now, with the arrival of the architects and nobles from Leyte, there was a sense of excitement in the air. Everyone knew change was coming, and the despair of the past thousand years was being wiped away. During my aimless wandering, my feet took me down through the subterranean library to the catacombs of the rulers of Hatra. Marble statues of each lord and lady lined the grand hall that was deep within the underground archives. But there was one in particular I was looking for. I finally came to a stop in front of the white marble statue of the previous ruler of my city, Tristan, of the house of Hatra el Shamash. This was my grandfather, and I'd gotten the chance to meet him and fight alongside him when some strange power had thrown me back in time a thousand years. Last time, his spirit had just sort of appeared in front of me. I hadn't summoned him or called out his name, but maybe placing my hand on his nameplate would work. So I took a step forward and placed my hand on the carved etchings at the base of the statue. Tristan, I said aloud. Gramps, it's me, Evan. Are you here? The marble statue glimmered for a moment, and it seemed like the stone behaved as if it were liquid for the merest of seconds. There was no flickering of lights and no sudden whoosh of wind like I'd seen in ghost movies back on Earth when a spirit was being summoned. All that happened was just a minute shift in the air as power concentrated within Tristan's statue. Hello, Evan, Tristan spoke as his translucent body stepped out of his statue and readjusted his azure robes. It's been a while. His brilliant crimson hair caught the light of the crystal lamps and seemed as if it was on fire. A pair of fox ears the same color as his hair twitched excitedly on his head. Mischief glimmered in his emerald eyes, so very much like my father's eyes, and I knew I had to bring Ruslan down here one day. It would definitely happen before I left Hatra to travel around Rama and win over the nobles and people. Hey, Gramps, I sighed with a relieved smile. I meant to check in sooner, but I didn't have any time until now. Ah, don't worry, Tristan ran a hand through his crimson hair as he shrugged. I can imagine that rebuilding our city is no easy task. Besides, I've all of eternity to spare. So tell me, why have you sought me out? Where do I even start? I laughed as I rubbed at the tension in my neck. There's people from Leyte here, including another noble of the sword. Leyte, you say? Tristan's ears perked up straight with evident excitement. Things really are going back to the way they're supposed to be. Were Hatra and Leyte on friendly terms? I asked as I picked up my grandfather's happiness. The noble of the sword who came seems to be a decent guy, if a bit of a weirdo. The first thing he did when he met me was challenge me to a fight because he wanted to get to know me better. The sword of light and her wielder can always be trusted, Tristan explained with a slight smile on his face. I'm not sure why, but there's always been a bond between the sword of light and the sword of healing. That bond extended to their wielders and our cities as well. Huh, that's good to know. I paused for a moment, as I thought back to how I felt around Nikolaus. I always feel like I can trust him, but I wasn't sure if it's my dragon instincts or something more. Sounds like it's because of the Sword of Healing. It could be both influencing each other, Tristan admitted with a shrug. There's never been a dragon wielding a sword that I know of. So I can't be entirely sure. Besides, the wielder of the Sword of Light is always, for lack of a better word, pure. Light does not deceive with its actions, nor can it hide any sins. To bear the burden of the Sword of Light is to always be honest, no matter what. That's quite a heavy burden to have on someone's shoulders. I grew somber at those words. Indeed, but... Tristan shook his head slightly as he stepped forward. I don't think that's the only reason my favorite grandson has come to visit me. I suppose you're here to pick my brain about something. Just ask away, and I'll do my best to provide you with an answer. Well, 
Do you know if there were any harpy nests around Hatra? I tilted my head to the side as I remembered the attack on the Orichalum mine. Maybe some rather hellish ones? That's an odd question. Why harpy nests? Tristan frowned as he looked at me. Are you looking to trade with them or something? No, see, that's the thing, I began to explain. We got attacked by demonic harpies the other day. Demonic harpies attacked ya? Tristan's eyebrows nearly shot up to his hairline. There used to be one or two harpy nests in the mountains, but none of them were at all demonic in nature. Are you sure you didn't meet one of the creatures from the burning hells instead? No, these were definitely harpies, I replied, and a muscle in my jaw twitched as I remembered their screams. Something had managed to turn them into demons. We aren't sure what or even how, but they attacked us with the intent to destroy the Orichalum mine. Thankfully, they didn't succeed. Did they still have their own minds? Tristan asked as he began to pace in front of me and tapped his chin in thought. That's the odd thing, I sighed as I rubbed my face. Their souls were crying out for help, for someone to save them. However they were turned into demons, it wasn't by their own choice. I think someone was controlling them. Terrifying to think of, Tristan muttered as he stopped pacing. They could potentially have an unending army behind them. All they would have to do is replace their soldiers any time they lost some, unlike us mortals. The thought of that kind of army did not please me at all. Demons were bad enough to fight on their own as it was. Yeah, so... I grimaced. Did anyone ever encounter anything like them in the past that you know of? Not demonic harpies, Tristan replied and leaned against the base of his own statue with his arms crossed over his chest. But those mountains have always been a little strange. What do you mean by strange? I asked as I pulled the marble floor with my power and made some chairs and a table for us to sit at. Well, parts of the forest and mountains are supposedly haunted. Tristan shrugged as he walked over to one of the chairs and languidly sat down in it. Before Hatra was attacked, I was putting together expeditions to go into those areas. One expedition was completely wiped out. No one ever came back. I blinked at the sight of the translucent Tristan sitting down. It was a bit weird since I didn't realize spirits could sit down. I just made the second chair out of habit. Who knew? It can't be the area where the Azurin village was, right? I sat down with a frown. If it was there, the Azurans would have pointed the expedition back towards Hatra. Could the expedition have just gotten lost or something? I wondered if there were any records of the expeditions down in the library with us, or if they'd been above ground in the government offices by the Lunar Palace. When I had the chance, I'd have to check in with Julia or Leon to see if anyone had found any documentation in regards to these expeditions. Finding those papers could prove to be helpful in the future. No, we have treaties with the Azurans, and they're under the protection of King Rodion. Tristan shook his head as he spread his hands on the table. And even if the expedition had somehow managed to get lost within the forest, there would have been survivors, and we would have been able to track them down. It was as if they completely disappeared, swallowed up by the mists of the mountains. Okay, so what led you to sending out an expedition in the first place? I crossed my arms over my chest as I leaned back in my chair. Something pretty serious must have happened. Were people being kidnapped from the city or something? Something like that, Tristan scowled darkly with those words. Wait, really? I asked as I sat forward in shock. Who was being taken from Hatra? Was it from within the walls of the actual city or the vassal villages? Children were disappearing. Tristan's voice had developed a dark edge as he spoke. Not only from the vassal villages along the forest's edge, but from within the walls of Hatra as well. Witnesses said they saw the children walking in the direction of the forest, as if they were possessed by some creature that was luring them. Red-hot anger spiked in me until I paused to think for a moment about why it seemed familiar. They looked like they were possessed? That sounded similar to what the miasma was doing, or, well, being used for. It was possible whoever was using the miasma to control people now had tested it out on Hatra a thousand years ago. Sounds like mind control! We think the miasma has been doing that! 
I frowned as I tapped my fingers absently on the table between us. Were there any reports of anything else, anything weird or out of the ordinary? Well, all things considered. Let me think for a moment. Tristan closed his eyes for a moment and leaned back in his chair. There was quite a variety of things occurring at the same time. The first that comes to mind is rather a bit morbid. Graves in some of the vassal villages were being desecrated, but no grave within the walls of Hatra was disturbed. Why graves? I asked, and disgust dripped from my voice. That's so strange. My advisers believed the perpetrators were looking for magical ingredients, Tristan replied with anger burning hot in his eyes. For what nefarious purpose we couldn't be sure. What kind of a sick person would do that? I was already struggling with my anger at the thought of children being kidnapped by some psycho with potential ties to demons and the miasma. But adding corpse desecration onto that? Fuck that. They were definitely a monster. But what did they take? I gritted my teeth as I tightly clenched my fists. I mean, children were disappearing already. So were they taking things like the corpses of children? Yes. The corpses of children and of cultivators. Tristan shook his head and his fox ears twitched angrily. And of the cultivators, only those who had born children were taken. So what can be done with those types of ingredients? I frowned down at my clenched fists. They were obviously taken for a reason. Out of everyone in Hatra and in the vassal villages, children and cultivators were chosen. This isn't a coincidence. These items could be used for a wide variety of things, all the way from malevolent magic to medicine. Tristan sighed as his ears went flat on his head. There's just too many possibilities for us to be able to understand just exactly what they were after. And these children were never seen again after they went into the forest? I asked. I was trying to find a clue, but so far the only common denominator was the forest. Never again. Tristan didn't visibly droop but the melancholy wafted off of him in waves. I understood why. He had a duty to protect those children, and they'd been taken right under his watch. Worse still, he didn't even have a chance to take retribution for their deaths and desecration. Are there any other clues to go on? I tried to grasp at the minute details I had at my disposal. Any direction to go in anything you can give me. Tristan was quiet for one long moment, as if he was recalling a memory. Then his eyes went dark, and he glanced back at me. The day we met, Evan, I just returned from the forest, Tristan began slowly, as if he'd almost forgotten the memory. I'd gone by myself to scout the forest, since it would be easier if I was doing it alone, and had no one to distract me. I could easily slip in and out of anywhere with my power. You found something, I gasped and leaned forward. There was something that wasn't supposed to be there in the forest, right? I did. Tristan's eyes darkened even further as he stared back at me. There are some ruins in the mountains, and the legends say they were haunted. But when I say ruins, I expected them to be little more than crumbling stone walls and perhaps one sole remaining tower. But it wasn't abandoned, I whispered back as I realized where this was heading. This was exactly the place we'd been looking for. My gut instinct knew this was the place the demonic harpies had come from. You're right, Tristan replied as he nodded. Instead of there being ruins, there was a castle built onto the mountainside, as if it had always been there. I didn't manage to get inside the castle, but I did meet a strange person there. A person? My curiosity was piqued by that. Who the hell could have been there? A rather odd scholar, Tristan frowned again, and his ears twitched. He didn't give me his name, but he said he worked in the castle. He was startled by my presence, but didn't let it show on his face. I could smell it on him, though. A scholar? Shock flared through me as I stared at my grandfather. It couldn't be. Could it actually be Olivier, once again, causing chaos for my people? Living a thousand years wasn't that odd in this world. But... It was like everything kept coming back full circle to him and his deceit. What did he look like? I clenched my fists tightly, not entirely sure if I hoped the scholar to be Olivier or some other person. 
He had blonde hair and pale green eyes, Tristan replied. And he wore a leaf-shaped pendant in his hair. My blood pounded harshly in my ears. It was Olivier. That fucking asshole was here in Hatra a thousand years ago, and he was involved with the kidnapping of children, the kidnapping of my people. Killing him would be too merciful. Chapter 12 Where's the castle located? I asked Tristan as I took in a deep breath. I was angry, and I wanted to tear Olivier limb from limb for his part in harming my city. But this wasn't the time for anger. I had to think coldly and cruelly if I wanted to get any justice and revenge for his actions. It's on the edge of the eastern mountain range, Tristan replied as he lifted his hand up in the air. I'll show you. A magnificent castle formed in the space between us, out of crimson magic. It was much like the schematics the architects had created with their own power. The difference was, it wasn't just a castle that was forming, but the entire mountain range, the forest, and even Hatra. The castle rose up, almost cradled within the rugged mountain chain, in different levels. It looked like a multi-leveled fortress with dozens of towers rising into the sky. It was smaller than the Lunar Palace, but larger than the Blue Tree Guild's airship. I wouldn't be surprised if it was big enough to house an army of several thousand, if not double that. Knowing how magic was capable of making things bigger on the inside, there could even be an army of thirty thousand in there. How far would you say it is from the city? I asked as I leaned in closer to judge the distance. It took me an hour to travel from Hatra to the castle, Tristan answered as he traced a route between the two locations. Then again, I was being covert and making sure no one was following me. It should take you less time to get there, especially if you fly. I nodded back to him. That was exactly why I'd gone to look at the airships the Blue Tree Guild brought to Hatra with them. Go back to sleep, Gramps, I said and placed a hand on Tristan's semi-solid shoulder. I'll let you know how it goes. You're going hunting! There was a near feral gleam in Tristan's emerald eyes as he glanced back at me and the castle disappeared from view. Yes, I murmured as I headed toward the entrance. There are some rats in the forest, and I'm going to smoke them out. I don't want our city getting infected by their disease. Tristan threw his head back and laughed at that, and in his voice, I could hear the predator in him. He was a fox, and while most people thought foxes could only be wily and mischievous, his laughter proved that wrong. It promised death and blood, and I would be the one to deliver on that promise. I walked out of the catacombs of the Lords of Hatra and made my way through the underground archives back up to the surface. Once I made it to the top of the stairs and through the door of the library, I could see the rays of an amber sunrise begin to paint splashes of gold across the bluestone buildings of Hatra. It was morning, and I'd somehow spent the night in the meditation hall and in the catacombs. Funnily enough, I didn't feel exhausted or anything, which was perfect since I was supposed to head out on another patrol this morning. With a sigh, I headed in the direction of the main gate. It was time for me to head out and deal with the stubborn and narcissistic dragon that was Valera. Maybe today I would be able to convince her to move into the city instead of living out in the canyons. I snorted at the thought. Yeah, that was wishful thinking. There was no way in hell she had changed her mind after a few days. So I had to think of a different way to convince her, since logic wasn't working at all, apparently. I couldn't lure her into the city with the promise of treasure. I'd already seen her hoard, and it was a mind-blowing product of three thousand years of work. Could I lure her with food? Dragons ate, and I enjoyed eating still, even though there were some foods that grated on my heightened senses but she definitely couldn't have eaten much beautifully spiced and roasted goat over the past three thousand years. That was definitely something to go on. Unless, and I doubted this, she hunted and ate the creatures of the desert. Valera had seemed to be greatly disgusted by the echidnas I'd killed, so maybe she didn't eat them. I doubted she ate the sand vipers either, since she didn't demand them that one time I'd killed the snakes. Maybe dragons as old as she was just didn't need to eat anymore or something. 
Not that I would ever be like that, no matter how old I got to be. The pleasures of life weren't something I'd ever give up on. I reached the main gate and glanced around me. There was just enough room for me to shift into my dragon form and fly into the sky, and I did so with relish. The cool air of morning embraced me and flowed over my scales as I flew over the buildings and walls of my city. When I came to the banks of the river, the rising sun made it seem like the blue waters had changed into molten gold. Everything underneath me, even the walls of the aqueduct system, glowed. In front of me, the crimson walls of the canyon shimmered from where the morning light also painted them gold. Everything around me was beautiful, as if the gods of this world had decided to come down and ensure all of creation shone with power and beauty. I wondered if this was one of the after-effects of the training I was undergoing, and my heart skipped a beat as I continued to sense everything around me much more deeply than before. It was like I'd gained even more senses, and the ones I already had were multiplied by a hundred times. This was something I'd already experienced once. The first time was when I'd become a dragon after coming from my original world. But this time? It was as if everything around me was alive, every pebble beneath me, and every blade of grass growing by the river. There were strands of power everywhere. Power I hadn't noticed before because it was just outside of the reach of my senses. Now, the blindfolds were beginning to slip loose, and I knew there was still far more for me to uncover and learn how to sense. A part of me wondered if this was how my family and Aliona saw the world. If they saw something this beautiful, too. If it was, then I could understand why cultivators put themselves through such difficult training for so long. Potential immortality and unrivaled strength was just an added bonus to seeing the world in such a way. I could definitely get used to this. The waterfall was coming up, and I barely dived through it to execute a perfect landing within the cave. Then I shook my head to get rid of the water on my scales before I seamlessly shifted into my human form so I could walk further into the cave. Valera's presence was like a bonfire and I walked through the maze-like tunnels as I followed my senses. I found her in a chamber I hadn't seen the first time I'd been here. She was half buried in a pile of gold coins, and there were rolls of silk tossed haphazardly around the place. I really didn't understand how she found that position comfortable, but it was nothing if not hot. She was a devastatingly attractive and naked woman surrounded by gold and jewels. Any healthy male would be turned on by the sight, and while I was, I knew there were more pressing matters to attend to. Hey, Valera! I called out with excitement in my voice as I focused on the way her ivory skin gleamed along with the gold coins. Let's go patrol the desert! You're late! Valera growled back at me as she slowly sat up on the gold. I'm not late, it's still sunrise! I ignored the rising anger in her voice and leaned against the cavern wall. You said to meet you by the canyons every morning. It's past morning. Valera ran a hand through her hair, and the action caused her full breasts to lift even higher. Therefore, we won't be patrolling. I'm really not that late, I argued. Are you seriously going to penalize me for a couple seconds? This conversation is boring me. Valera drawled as she dismissively waved her hand. You can go. I narrowed my eyes at the prideful dragon, and I opened my mouth to retort, but then a thought struck me. As Valera rolled over in the pile of gold with a sigh, I dragged my eyes over her bare curves and ivory skin. Why are you naked? I suddenly questioned. Valera froze and turned one golden eye on me. Her gaze dragged all over my body and it left a trail of fire in its wake as it lingered on my lower half. What? she asked. Why are you naked? I repeated. I know you own clothes. I saw you wear them back in Hatra. And I know when you change from your dragon form to your human one, you can choose to retain the clothes you were previously wearing. So why aren't you wearing any? Clothes, Valera scoffed with a roll of her eyes. Such a paltry human invention. Why should I restrict myself in garments made by inferior hands? 
The skin I was born in is splendid enough. I think there's another reason. I smirked as I began to pull my robe off my shoulders. Valera arched one red eyebrow at me as I let my robes fall away. I was naked underneath, and my cock was at full attention. I do not recall asking for your opinion. She sniffed as she trailed her hand along her pile of gold and left a tinkling sound in her wake. But her eyes were focused on my cock as if it were a magnet. See? I continued as I stepped toward her like she hadn't even spoken. You knew I was coming. You could have chosen to be in your dragon form, ready to go out on patrol. But instead you're in here, lounging naked on your riches. And I think I know why. I came to a stop right before her and smirked down at my prey. Wipe that look off your face, Valera sneered. But I saw how her gaze hadn't actually left my cock. I don't think I will, I replied calmly as I reached out and trailed a finger across her cheek. Because I think you want me to fuck your brains out. I think you want me to pour gallons of my cum into your tight little pussy. I think you are going to love every second of it and then beg me for more once we're done. Valera's nostrils flared and her pupils constricted to cat-like slits. Got her. I do not know what you are talk- The imperious dragon began to respond, but before she could finish her sentence, I fisted my hand in her thick red hair and dragged her upward to meet my mouth. Our lips clashed together like two armies on the front lines, and Valera's sharpened fangs nipped at my lower lip until they drew blood. I snarled deep in my chest and yanked her head back by her hair, and then I dove down and latched my teeth to her neck. Valera growled in the back of her throat, and for a moment I thought she was going to shove me away. Then her hands latched onto my shoulders and tugged me onto the pile of treasure on top of her. Her claws raked over the skin of my back as I nipped and bit at the flesh of her breasts. Then she gasped as I tweaked her sensitive nipple with my teeth. Evan! She cried out and buried her hands in my hair. Still don't know what I'm talking about? I smirked into the toned flesh of her stomach. You can argue all you want, but your body doesn't lie. It wants me to fuck you, and fuck you good. Valera snarled, but her tugging hands in my hair betrayed just how much she wanted me. Well? I teased. Well what? She snapped as she arched against me. Are you going to beg? I asked and dipped my tongue into her navel. I do not beg for anything. She shot back with fire in her eyes. Maybe after this, I chuckled darkly, and then I wrapped my hands around her hips and flipped her over onto her hands and knees. Valera bucked like a bronco, but then I dragged my hand from her thigh and brought it down to her glistening lips. I barely touched her dripping pussy before I trailed circles along the swollen flesh. Broken gasps caught in Valera's throat as she shoved her ass toward me. I smirked, drew my hand back, and slapped the pale globe of her left cheek so hard a red imprint was left in my wake. Evan! Valera snarled, and I knew I had her. I plunged my finger into her and had an idea just as I pushed in another finger. Carefully, I let tiny sparkles of lightning pulse around my fingers as I slowly moved them in and out of her. What about this? I whispered against her flesh before I bit her thigh harshly and pushed my fingers deeper into her pussy. This rough enough for you? What are you? Oh! Valera's walls clenched tightly around my fingers, and they almost imprisoned me inside of her as her body spasmed underneath me. She was right on the brink of losing everything, and I settled my thumb against her clit as I pumped my fingers faster and harder. Then I reared back on my knees and used my other hand to slap her ass until it glowed red. A moment later, Valera arched her back with a feral snarl, and a gush of warmth flooded out around my fingers. As her body twitched in the aftermath of her climax, I realized this would be the perfect moment to exchange my fingers for something much thicker. After all, she clearly wanted my cock to be buried deep inside of her.
So I pulled my fingers out of her throbbing body and pressed the head of my cock at her slick entrance. Then I looked down at her and raised an eyebrow. The dragon woman hissed and then shifted her hips back so that my tip would slide in between her lips. But I just leaned myself away a bit so that I was still barely touching her wet lips. What are you doing? She panted as she glanced back over her shoulder at me. I'm not doing anything, I purred. You know what I mean. She tried to wiggle her ass back so I'd enter her. You haven't begged yet, I whispered. She looked into my eyes and her orbs burned like twin fires. For half a moment, I actually wondered if I had gone too far, but then she grunted and laid her head back on the gold coins. Fine. Fine what? You may fuck me, she hissed. Not what I'm looking for you to say. I sing-songed as I grabbed the base of my dick and gently began to rub it across the slick lips of her vagina. Fuck me, Evan! Damn you! I want it! She clenched piles of gold at her sides while she screamed at me, as if it took every ounce of her willpower to admit how much she craved me. That's all I needed to hear. I slipped in without any resistance, and her body immediately swallowed me right up. Uh! The redhead groaned from deep within her belly, and she pushed her face into the pile of gold so that her back would arch and cause her tunnel to rub against the bottom side of my shaft. How's that? I murmured as I wound my fingers into her hair and tugged her up onto the tips of her fingers. Am I deep enough yet? Not yet. Valera moaned as she threw her head back against my shoulder. Deeper. I need you deeper in me. Please, Evan, you are right. Pour your seed into me. I want you as deep inside of me as you can get it. Then I'll go deeper, I growled as I bit her shoulder and settled into a deep rhythm. The sounds she made were simply exquisite. Soft mules that echoed in the cave all around us as she thrust her hips against me. She was desperate to match my rhythm and force me to speed up. Valera wanted her pleasure, and she wanted it now. But I was in control of her beautiful body for once, so I made every movement drive her to the brink before I backed down and let her calm. Then I slammed deeper and harder into her. After half an hour, she'd stopped calling my name and was just making raw animal groans, almost as if the pleasure had turned her brain off. Please! She finally begged after the fifth time I denied her a climax. Let me... please... fill me... Evan! That's how I want you to beg for me. I slammed harder into her body, and her dripping walls only clenched tighter around my cock as she orgasmed for the second time. This climax had progressed for a long build-up, so her back arched like a drawn bow while her velvety walls clutched frantically around my cock. She screamed, and it was joy mixed with delicious agony. It was probably the most violent orgasm I'd ever given a woman, and I had to dig my claws into her hip bones so that she wouldn't buck me loose. I want all of your sperm in me, she screeched. Fuck! I grunted as her words caused my control to shatter. My cock and balls spasmed, and I shot load after hot load of my cum deep into the dragon woman while she screamed for all of it. Her tunnel milked me the entire time, and when we both finally began to relax, I wondered if I actually had poured a few gallons into her. Wow! I pulled my cock out of her strong grasp, and a thick trail of my seed dripped down the flesh of her lips and down her perfect thighs. Yup, I totally filled her to the brim. Oh. Valera collapsed onto the pile of gold and flipped over. Her hazy eyes trailed over me, and then she pulled me down for a deep kiss. Her tongue curled around mine, and her teeth grazed at my lips as she pulled away with a moan. The sexy dragon's gold eyes were still covered with a mist of lust as she slumped into the pile of gold. I collapsed next to her and let out a sigh. I never expected I'd sleep with the dragon I'd been chased by once. Are you done? 
Valera suddenly blurted, and I saw the marks I'd left on her flesh had already healed. Done? I frowned at her as I sat up. What do you mean by that? Inseminating me, she whispered as she looked away. Uh, do you mean you want me to do it again? I shall take that as a yes. You are done. Valera stood up, and her crimson hair fell down her body like a cascade of blood. Don't be late tomorrow. Maybe I should be, I grinned at her. You are lucky you pleasured me, or you would be dead. No male has ever handled me like that. She walked away from me, her bare ass flashing temptingly from behind her curtain of hair, and I couldn't think for a moment. You loved it, I said to her perfect ass. What? She hissed as she spun around to glare at me. You loved me fucking your brains out, I continued. My cum is dripping like a creek down both of your legs. You begged for it. When was the last time anyone made you come like that? Maybe never. I'll do it to you tomorrow. You just have to ask. You! She growled as her eyes turned to fire, but then she spun around with a wave of her crimson hair and stomped out of the room. Yep, you are my woman now. I smirked to myself as I got dressed, and then I walked toward the waterfall entrance. The spray of the water was cool on my face, and I paused for a moment before I took a running leap and transformed into my draconic body. As I flew back toward Hatra, I caught sight of a group of blue tree guild warriors near the aqueducts. Within the group of dark-haired wolf demi-humans, I caught sight of Aliona's shimmering white hair. She was kneeling in front of one of the massive aqueduct columns, with her hands clasped in front of her as if in holy prayer. Power shimmered all around her as she knelt in the sand, like she was surrounded by stars. I flew closer to the group and touched down a few meters away from them. Even then, Aliona didn't react to me, but this was a perfect situation. I could get one of the Blue Tree Guild warriors to contact the airship to get Blue Willow ready for me. Evan, how was your patrol? Lyka called out as she jogged toward me. Nothing much to tell. I rolled my eyes as I nudged Lyka's shoulder. Valera is just the same as ever. I've been trying to convince her to come live in Hatra. That will be quite the day. Lyka smiled as her tail wagged slightly behind her. Though, if she ever does come to Hatra, the city will be all the stronger for it. Exactly. I nodded and sent a glare of annoyance back in the direction of the canyons. Good luck wooing her, then. Lyka had a slight smirk on her face as she followed my line of sight. You're definitely going to need it to keep up with her. I'm making progress. I'm sure you are, the wolf woman said to me, and then her lips curved into a slight smile. I squinted at Lyka for a moment, unsure if she knew what had just happened in the canyons. The demi-human was hard to read, though, so I decided to change the subject. So, Aliona's enchanting the aqueducts? I asked as I glanced down the length of the waterways. When did you guys start? We got here about an hour ago, Lyka explained as she stroked my snout. And she's been like that ever since. Considering those demonic harpies attacked the mine, we thought it would be best to get the aqueducts completely protected before they're targeted by anything or anyone. Smart. I nodded as I closed my eyes and focused on the exquisite sensation on my snout. I don't think those harpies would aim for the aqueducts, though. They would have to fly around the city for that, and they'd be easily spotted. Still, that doesn't mean our enemies don't have a few more tricks up their sleeves. Exactly. Lyka replied as she continued scratching the scales along my muzzle. We're keeping guard in case something happens, so Milady can focus entirely on the enchantments. Good. I reluctantly opened my eyes as I remembered the reason I had touched down to begin with. Lyka, I need you to have Blue Willow prepared for me and a group of warriors to come with me, preferably those who have experience fighting against aerial combatants. You're going after the harpies? Now? Lyka blinked for a moment, and her stormy gray eyes glinted fiercely. Why today? I found a clue as to where their nest is. I shook my head as I stretched out my wings in preparation for flight. Or rather, where they were tormented. I don't want to lose this lead. And if we wait, I feel like something could happen to it. I'll have the message passed on, 
Laika took a few steps backward and placed her hand on the gorget at her throat. Anton is still in the city, so he'll have Blue Willow out and ready for you. He's one of our best pilots, and he'll make sure Blue Willow stays in the air no matter what. Be safe. I always am, I replied with a fanged grin before I took to the skies again and flew toward Hatra. As I reached the walls of my city, I turned in the direction of the Blue Tree Guild airship. I didn't know how long it would take Anton to have Blue Willow ready for departure, but I wanted to leave as soon as possible. Nothing would stop me from finding that mountain castle today. I was going to tear that castle apart, stone by stone if I had to, in order to find answers. Olivier had dogged the steps of my people for far too long. It was like he was some sort of malevolent shadow who only lived to destroy Hatra and cause the ruin of my beloved home. The bluestone buildings of my city blurred underneath me as I flew, and my mind was solely focused on the destruction of Olivier and exactly what it was he wanted from Hatra. At first, we all thought he'd wanted either something from the underground library, or maybe he was after Aliona's divine body. But now? I was starting to think all he wanted was the absolute ruination of Hatra el Shamash. That was the only theory I could possibly come up with until I was able to rip the answers from Olivier's mind. In fact, the mind invasion the mages from the Blue Tree Guild had used on the prisoners would be the perfect treatment for him. I didn't care if his mind was completely and utterly destroyed, so long as we had answers and revenge. Besides, we were researching ways to put back together shattered minds. What better test subject for such an experiment than Olivier? The Blue Tree Guild's massive airship came into view before me, and I could see the much smaller and sleeker Blue Willow docked near it. My blood ran hot through my veins as I shifted from my dragon form into my human body, and then I dropped down in front of the giant airship and stalked toward Blue Willow. Twenty warriors from the Blue Tree Guild stood in formation in front of the smaller airship. They were fully armored, and many of them had broadswords slung on their backs. I could see Leon and Dagon in their ranks, and their youthful faces stood out from the stern expressions of the wolf demihumans. "'I'll come with you,' Nikolaus said as he broke apart from the guild warriors and walked toward me. "'You are going to hunt down the harpies, are you not?' "'There's a castle!' I murmured back to him as I drew in a calming breath. In the mountains, at the eastern edge of the forest, it has existed there in secret for at least a thousand years. According to the Lord Prior, children were disappearing from Hatra and our vassal villages, all of them last seen near the forest. Graves belonging to children and cultivators were also desecrated. On the day Hatra was attacked by demons, the Lord Prior had just returned from scouting the forest and had found a fully functional castle instead of the ruins that were supposedly there. And he met a scholar who perfectly matches what we know Olivier to look like. There's too much coincidence here, Nikolaus. Children disappeared, and graves were desecrated. Nikolaus's silver eyes narrowed, and his jaw clenched. There are many things that can be done with such ingredients. None of them pleasant, or even anything we would want to happen. Not even the sects that dabble in the darker arts would kidnap children and desecrate graves. What do you think they were being used for? I asked as I turned to face him, and anger coursed through my veins. You have to understand, Evan, Nikolaus began to explain. I have served on the front lines of the breach for as long as I can remember. And when I am not fighting in the breach, I am fighting any instance of the demonic scourge outside of the breach. There are demonic and fallen mages, people who have given themselves over to the demons and their twisted promises. Some of them have been known to kidnap and mutilate children in order to extend their own lifespan. We don't know if this Olivier is a cultivator, but we know he caused the corrupted corpses to fall into Hatra. Thus, we can deduce he is a fallen mage, and it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to consider he's been extending his lifespan using children. That bastard! I clenched my fist so tightly, my claws cut through the flesh of my palm, and blood dripped onto the ground between us. Evan! Anton called out as he jogged over to my side. Blue Willow is prepared for launch at your command.
Good. I nodded and walked to stand in front of the warriors. This is a mission of the utmost importance. Harpies have already attacked our people once, and we have good reason to believe we've found their possible base of operations. They have a castle in the mountain range beyond the forest's edge. We will go and wipe out every trace of their existence. A loud cry went up, and I closed my eyes as I reveled in their shared anger. We will follow you to death! Dagon cried out as his ears stood up straight on his head. The other warriors around him joined in on the shout, and their faces were set with rage and the willingness to follow me anywhere. Although I hadn't met all of them, and I didn't even know their names, I knew they trusted me with their very lives. No one is going to die, I promised as I walked past them to board the airship, except for the green glass sect. Another clamor rose up behind me. My words had only riled them up even more. It would be wonderful if we could wipe them out in one go today, Nikolaus said as he strode beside me. That way we can get rid of this rot altogether. As wonderful as that would be, I muttered back, I doubt it'll be that easy. Olivier and his people are like maggots, always wriggling. With that, the warriors of the Blue Tree Guild climbed into the ship and loaded into the cabin. Two or three of the warriors went into a different section of the airship, and the ship's ramp disappeared into the hull. Then, the airship rose smoothly into the air without a hitch. Hatra disappeared beneath us, and we headed in the direction of the forest. Blue Willow sailed through the skies above the forest, and the green canopy beneath us floated away as if ocean waters were underneath the airship's hull instead of air currents. The warriors were inside the cabin, ready at any moment to burst out and fight. I didn't stay inside, though. I was out on the deck, watching for the green glass sect's castle. Nikolaus stood next to me, and his silver eyes searched non-stop in the air before us for any disturbance or attack from more demonic harpies. None of us had felt anything in the surrounding area, but one couldn't be too prepared. I haven't sensed any of those harpies. Nikolaus murmured to me with more than a hint of suspicion in his voice. Why haven't they noticed our presence? Maybe they can't sense us, I answered as I looked at the clouds above us. Maybe whatever is controlling them has to be constantly acting as their senses. They were already dead. They couldn't act without being controlled. Or they've already left. Nikolaus tapped his hand along the railing and scowled. They could be anywhere in Rama, wreaking havoc. No, they haven't left. My gut told me they were just ahead of us. They aren't going to leave without destroying Hatra and the Orakala mine first. Neither of those two have been destroyed, so they're going to be here still. We fell silent as Blue Willow moved into a large cloud and cold wind brushed against our faces. The air shifted minutely, and it was as if we'd entered a different area. There were no sounds of any animals or even wind. It was a completely dead space. Then we came through the other side of the cloud and saw it. The fortress came into view before us, and it was an impressive sight. The castle was built right into the side of the mountains, and it reached up into the sky like fingers trying to poke the gods. It was just as impressive as the magical rendering Tristan had created, but there was a festering stench of miasma and the nearly overwhelming sensation of pure evil coming from the castle's carmine-colored walls. What a disgusting place, Nikolaus muttered to me. You can feel as if even the air itself is rotting away. That's because it's nothing but evil, I replied as I tightly gripped the railing in front of us. It belongs to Olivier's people. Of course it's going to have a hideous presence. Something like this would be better off no longer existing. This was it. We'd reached the seat of where the green glass sect's attacks on Hatra had originated from. After today, there would be no more attacks launched from this castle. It would be nothing more than crumbled stone, and would go back to being the forgotten ruins everyone had thought it was. I was going to tear it down with my own claws, and my warriors would set it on fire. Absolutely nothing but a smoldering ruin would be left. Chapter 13 Dark purple clouds of miasma drifted along the base of the castle, right where it merged into the mountainside. It was strange. 
the poisonous smog seemed almost peaceful, and it mulled around the carmine stone walls as if it wasn't even there. I couldn't trust this false sense of calm. My gut instinct screamed the miasma was just waiting for the right moment to attack us, and when it did, it would be a desperate fight. This was more miasma than I'd ever seen attack the city of Hatra, and I was almost suspicious there was a demon gate somewhere underneath the castle. We knew miasma came from portals to the demon world, but there were no portals in the area that I could sense. It was like the miasma had always been here, surrounding the castle as if it were a moat. Why isn't it attacking us? Anton asked as he stepped out of the cabin and peered at the malevolent clouds. The wolf ears on his head swiveled constantly, and I could tell he was as unnerved as I was. I don't know, I admitted to him as I concentrated on bringing my healing power to the surface. But we'll be ready when it attacks. There's no if about it. Next to me, Nikolaus kept a keen watch on the miasma, and it was clear in his silver eyes that he was thinking the same thing I was. Just because the miasma was docile for now didn't mean it wouldn't attack us the moment it had the opportunity. The miasma in the breach often behaves the same way, Nikolaus remarked as he tapped the hilt of his sword. It lay dormant for a long while, almost as if it's nothing but mist. But the moment one attempts to sneak past it and is surrounded, well, the miasma attacks, and you're left fighting your comrades if you have no defense against its corruptive power. Good thing we have something that's going to make things easier, I smirked back at him as I let my healing power seep into the bodies of everyone aboard Blue Willow. I can heal everyone faster than the miasma will be able to corrupt them. While having Aliona and her purity here would be the best defense and offense against vanquishing the miasma, nothing would happen to my comrades as long as I kept them covered with my power. But what if there was an easier way to get rid of the miasma? I glanced over to my fellow noble of the sword. If I remembered right, Aliona had called him the Prince of Light. If his strengths lay in light magic, then there was a possibility his power could clear out the miasma in the same manner Aliona's power could. Impressive. None of the healers on the front lines are capable of doing such a thing. Nikolaus kept his eyes on the miasma, but there was a faint smile on his face. I'm nothing like the healers you've met. I laughed as I shook my head. Speaking of which, can you do anything about that miasma? Just as Nikolaus was about to reply, there was a barely noticeable shift in the miasma. He and I both exchanged glances as we reached for our swords. I hadn't been able to practice fighting with Mariah, but there was no time like the present. Do not worry. Mariah's voice echoed inside of my head. The memories of the previous lords and ladies of Hatra el Shamash flow through me. Their power will be yours. I gritted my teeth and only tightened my grip on the sword's hilt. The power I felt in the air was somewhat like the demonized harpies from the attack on the Orichalum mine. Beside me, Nikolaus seemed to glow. His silver eyes were almost pure white at this point, and the sword in his hands was nothing more than a ray of light. There's something strange about what's coming, Nikolaus murmured as his silver-white eyes fixated on a point beneath us. Something half dead and half gone. Sounds like the harpies we fought before, I replied as I took a breath to center myself. I knew exactly what he meant by those words, since the demonized harpies weren't living by any standard definition of the word, nor were they dead. They were trapped in some unholy existence between the two planes. As we watched, out from the miasma came what looked like a flock of hundreds upon hundreds of black and tan birds. We knew better, though. Those were demonized harpies, except they looked nothing like the ones I'd fought before. These were almost rotting in mid-air, yet still held together as if they had been mummified before they were sent after us. As they approached, pieces of their bodies fell off, and their wings were featherless and bony appendages. By all rights, they shouldn't even be able to fly. What pitiful creatures they are! Nikolaus drew his sword and slashed in their direction. I shall put you all to rest! An almost blinding arc of light exploded from his swing, and the harpies in its path disappeared. 
there was a great sigh, almost in relief, that filled the air around us and the sound of ringing bells. How did you do that? I glanced over at him with wide eyes. Was that your power or the sword? Both, Nikolaus replied as he nodded at me. Your sword would be able to put them to rest if your blade touches them. Well, that changed the story. Nikolaus continued to vaporize the harpies with the light from his sword, and we drove the flock toward the ground. Leave some for me, I cried out as my heart pounded in my chest. I wanted to face these harpies head on, and I wanted to be the one to defeat them. Not out of hatred or anger, but out of pity. These creatures didn't ask for this, and I would put them to rest. As the blue willow descended through the sky, the castle's courtyard rose up to meet us. Dozens of harpies screeched in the skies as they swarmed the ship, and I finally had enough of standing around. When the airship was thirty feet from the ground, I grabbed onto the railing and swung myself over. Then I was in freefall. Evan! Nikolaus screamed after me, but I bared my teeth in a feral grin as the harpies dove for me. I swung the sword of Hatra left and right, and three harpies exploded into nothing more than dust and debris. I finally reached the ground and barrel rolled, and then I popped up on my feet as I brandished my blade. The blue willow was still hovering in the air, but now the harpies' attention had been split. Half of the flock dove from me while the other half continued to swarm the airship, and their screeches reached a new fevered pitch. Come on, come on, I muttered as I tightened my hands around the hilt of my sword. Then the first harpy reached me, and I ducked out of the reach of its talons. As the beast careened past me, I swung my blade at its back, and the harpy screamed as it crumbled into dust. The blue willow touched down behind me, and the blue tree warriors rushed across the courtyard with howls and battle cries. The warriors' weapons weren't as effective as my and Nikolaus's swords, but the guild members did a good job of corralling the harpies so Nikolaus and I could take care of groups at a time. Between the Sword of Healing and the Sword of Light, we laid waste to the crumbling forces attacking us. Keep pushing forward! I yelled as Nikolaus and I cut through the lines of decrepit harpies. The Blue Tree Guild members howled in response, and I was in awe of how the wolves and other demi-humans flowed across the battlefield, almost like dancers. I gritted my teeth as I pulled up my stone power, and a moment later, a dozen pillars of rock shot into the sky. Some of them struck a few harpies that then tumbled to the ground with ear-splitting screeches. The Guild members jumped forward to pin the bony creatures to the ground with their blades. Then Nikolaus and I alternated between putting the harpies out of their misery. Within minutes, my skin was coated in dust and sweat, and the taste of ash was heavy in my mouth. I watched a harpy dive from the sky and tackle a demi-human wolf to the ground, and the wolf yipped in pain as the harpy's talons raked his chest. I leapt forward as the harpy pinned the wolf to the ground, but I realized I wouldn't make it in time, so I summoned up my stone power again. A moment later, a rock spear launched through the air and impaled the harpy through the gut. The momentum of the projectile knocked the harpy off the guild warrior, and I sprinted toward the fallen opponent before I put my sword through its skull. The harpy's grimace of pain dissolved into dust, and then I turned back to the wolf still panting on the ground. Dark red blood stained his tunic, and he whined as his hand felt along his sliced-up chest. Don't move, I instructed as I walked over and placed my hand on his forehead. Glittering energy enveloped the demi-human, and when it faded, his chest was whole once more. Thank you, Lord Evan, the wolf grunted as I helped him to his feet. Don't mention it, I said and clapped him on the shoulder. You good to get back into it? The wolf bared his fangs and brandished his blade in response. <laughs> Sounds good, I laughed before the two of us jumped back into the fray. Although, as the fight wore on, something strange began to happen. The harpies were completely disorganized. There was no rhyme or reason to their attacks. But as more and more harpies faded into dust and ash, the remaining force seemed to become less zealous. 
They hovered in the air for longer periods of time and were more focused on fighting Nikolaus and me. It was as if the harpies realized we were setting them free, like when I'd fought the other flock at the Oracala mine. Still, there were dozens of harpies between us and our prize, and the longer we dragged this fight out, the more likely it was that someone could get hurt. We need to finish this! I shouted as I ducked beneath a set of sweeping talons. Then I spun around and drove my sword through the harpy's chest, and it shrieked as it disintegrated into nothing. I glanced to the large door that led to the inside of the castle and then back at Nikolaus. He nodded and reversed his grip on the sword of light. Follow my movements, Evan! Nikolaus lifted his sword into the air and poured power into it. Focus your power into your sword! When you stab it into the ground, visualize it exploding around you. Wait, won't that harm our comrades? I asked as I glanced over at my fellow noble of the sword. Despite my confusion, though, I mimicked his movements. No, our swords will never harm those we protect, he replied, and there was a softness in Nikolaus's voice that was out of place with the violence around us. But I was going to trust him. The demonized harpies clamored in the air above us, confused that the attacks had suddenly stopped. Then they watched on as Nikolaus and I both lifted our swords into the air. I pushed my power into the sword of healing and felt its pulse in time, almost as if Mariah was holding onto my hand. Then Nikolaus moved, and I moved simultaneously as I slammed my sword into the stone courtyard. There was an explosion of power from both swords, and everything around us looked as if it had been covered with glittering white light. When the light faded, the miasma vanished, and there was no trace of it in the air. The demonized harpies were also gone. What was that? I asked as I turned to Nikolaus, excited but confused by what had happened. The sword of healing and the sword of light working together. Nikolaus grinned as he pulled his sword from the ground. They are perhaps the two most compatible blades out of all the swords in existence. Now I know why the king sent you. I laughed as I pulled my own sword from the courtyard before I turned my attention to the large door. Let's get inside that castle. Anton pushed open the door, and even though we were ready for any attack from the inside, nothing happened. Cautiously, we moved into the castle and remained on high alert. There was absolutely no one in the castle, though. It was almost eerily silent, as if the fortification was completely abandoned. There was no sign of life, not even anything left behind by the soldiers we knew had been there. Dust covered the floors and debris from crumbled portions of the wall, and cobwebs hung thick from the rafters and corners. Each step I took tossed motes of dust into the air, and a few of the demi-humans behind me coughed and sniffled. My own sensitive nose twitched, so I started to breathe in only through my mouth. I didn't want to sneeze anymore, but now my tongue felt coated in decay and ruin. Soon enough, we came to a point in a corridor that made me think we'd reached the great hall of the castle. A moth-eaten and worn-down carpet ran the length of the hall, and my enhanced eyesight could pick up that the fabric had once been red a very long time ago. There was a heavy wooden door along one section of the wall, and the passageway continued down on either side of the door. I walked toward the door and placed my hand on it, but I couldn't sense any miasma on the other side of it. Well, there was nothing for it. I pushed on the heavy wooden door, and a thick smell of dust and decay rushed out, making all of us gag on the horrid smell. It was almost an earthy stench, but there was something more to it, something decrepit and rotting. But it wasn't like the pungent odor of the corruptive miasma. It was more like the smell of the slowly decaying demons we'd fought in the Crimson Canyons. However, what was inside was something far worse than the demons we'd fought. The great hall was full of piles upon piles of mummified child corpses, some of them so old they had already turned to stone. Others still had their leathery flesh intact and almost seemed as if they were only sleeping. Even more wretched than those were the fresh corpses that had been dumped on top of the older bodies. It was the fresh scent of death that came from the other corpses, 
and I realized they couldn't be older than a few days at most, and at the very least a few hours. I could see all manner of demi-humans in the mass grave in front of me, from foxes to snakes to wolves. There were even mummified harpies in the midst of all this death. The bodies only had one thing in common, and that was what made the blood in my veins boil. Children. They were all children, and none of them were even close to adulthood. I couldn't see any child older than fifteen, and some of them were even as young as infants. My lord, Dagon began, but his voice failed him as he looked upon the tragedy in front of us. I didn't blame him. There was truly no words for what we'd found. But I had to hope. I had to hope there were some survivors left inside of this nightmarish castle. Hoping there were survivors was the only thing keeping me calm. I wanted to rant and rage, but this wasn't the time for that. I needed to store that hatred growing inside of me and keep it aside for the day I was able to sink my claws into the green glass sect and Olivier. Search the castle, I ordered calmly as I hid my rage. Search for more victims and see if there are any survivors at all. Dagon and the warriors from the Blue Tree Guild didn't respond, but there was no need for words. They had a mission, and they would see it through. If there was someone left alive in this hellhole, they would be found. As for me, I would search through the mummified remains and fresh bodies to see if there was someone alive. There was always the slight possibility of someone hiding underneath the corpses of their companions. Searching for survivors! Nikolaus matched my pace as I walked deeper into the Great Hall. I understand hoping, but whoever is capable of such a systematic slaughter would never have left someone alive. Still, I doubt anyone who is capable of killing innocents would have remained sane. Exactly. Only a madman could have done all of this, I explained as I carefully sifted through the bodies. And a madman is always careless. He's going to make mistakes even if they're not going to be obvious at first glance. There's a thousand years for him to have fucked up. There has to be something left behind, and we'll find it if we search long enough. I was ignoring the already mummified remains. There was obviously no way any of those victims could have survived. Instead, I focused only on the fresher corpses and shifted the bodies of the murdered children. I didn't want to miss a single child, so I carefully let my healing power seep over the mummified corpses and search for any survivors. I could have just left the search to my magic, but I couldn't just stand around and watch. Even so, I didn't find any survivors with either my hands or my magic. So many lives lost, all at the whims of a madman, Nikolaus murmured as he gently moved the corpses. It's a tragedy this happened, but he couldn't have gained all of these children from the areas surrounding Hatra alone. No, Hatra hasn't had enough children for this to happen. My eyes narrowed when I came across an Azurin child, and I took another breath to calm my anger. The green glass sect seems to have a longer reach than we ever accounted for them having. The web they have woven will be a tough one to cut. My fingers trailed over the features of the Azurin child and they were remarkably similar to the survivors of the Azurin village we'd taken in. Delicate features and a pair of horns on their head. Instead of appearing as if they were simply sleeping, though, the child's jaw was broken and left open in a mocking parody of a smile. Nikolaus, I broke the silence between us. I want to take these children back to Hatra. They deserve to rest in peace and not spend the rest of eternity in the place where they died so cruelly. It is only right, Nikolaus agreed with me and stretched out one of his hands. We will get vengeance for their souls, and they will rest easy with the knowledge that they will have their retribution. You will not be forgotten, I promised the corpses around us. I don't care how long it takes, but each one of you will have your deaths paid back tenfold. The green glass sect has been running rampant, but their time is running short. The air in the great hall shifted, as if sighing in relief, and I could almost imagine the souls of thousands of children looking on as we promised them their vengeance. There were a lot of things I could forgive. 
Even after becoming a dragon, I was still an easygoing person, and it wasn't simple to anger me. But when it came to harming children, well, I never had any control over my temper when it came to a child being in danger, and turning into a dragon had only heightened that part of me. I watched in silence as Nikolaus stored the bodies of the children into his spatial space and thought about the grave I would make for them. There was no way I was going to dump them all into a mass grave. They deserved more dignity than that. No, I would make them a monument that would last for thousands of years to come. They'd been brutally murdered, and their names would never be spoken again. But they would never be forgotten. These children would stay alive in the heart of Hatra, and I would make sure that all of Rama, no, all of Inati, knew the suffering they had been put through. All of this cruelty and injustice would be brought to light by my hands. It wasn't long before the sound of running feet filled the hallway outside the chamber. For a moment, I wondered if we were under attack again, but a quick sniff at the air proved me wrong, and I realized it was just Leon running down the corridor. I could sense the waves of agitation wafting off him, though, and Nikolaus could apparently sense it, too. What in heaven's name did they find? Nikolaus wondered aloud as he leaned against a nearby column. Well, we're about to find out, I replied, as I started walking toward the open doors. My lord, you have to come take a look at this! Leon gasped as he skidded into the threshold and motioned me over to the entrance of the great hall. What did you find? I glanced down at the pile of scrolls in his arms and gritted my teeth. Something worse than these poor children? Perhaps, Leon replied reluctantly as he extended a scroll toward me. If I read these papers right, there are more than just these children and what happened to them. What? I grabbed one of the scrolls Leon had in his hands and read through it. What kind of abomination is this? At first, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. It was a diagram of what looked like a human body, and there were notes along the side that referenced certain areas. The notes detailed how the body reacted to increasing amounts of miasma. Further down the scroll were different bodies sketched, and I noticed a number at the side of each figure. The figures weren't being numbered, but rather, those were the ages of the body when it was experimented on. It seems unimaginable if you're only reading the scrolls. Leon tightened the vice-like grip he had on the scrolls and took in a calming breath. But from everything we've seen here, it has to be true. There's no way what's written down on there is lies. And my lord, we found even more scrolls like this one and more rooms full of children, all of them dead. Rage filled me, and it was burning hot as it seared through every blood vessel in my body. The anger I'd tried so hard to control was beginning to break free. Collect everything in this damned castle, I gritted out as I began to see red. Leave absolutely nothing here. We're taking it all back to Hatra. Of course, I'll spread the word to the others, Leon nodded before he ran down the corridor. May I see it? Nikolaus asked from beside me with his eyes on the scroll. Take it. I pushed the scroll against his chest. I don't want to look at it for another moment. I wanted to burn this whole castle down. That's all I wanted to do. But I didn't have any fire magic, and simply tearing down the stone walls of the castle wouldn't satisfy me. I wanted to see the castle in flames, as if part of me wanted to purify it from all the darkness and cruelty that had lived here for a thousand years. But how? How was I going to do that? Dagon was here, and he had fire powers. If I constantly healed him, then he might be able to break through and burn down the castle. Even as the thought came to mind, though, I knew it wasn't a good idea. Dagon was too young, and pushing him beyond his limits could potentially cripple him. That was the last thing I wanted. Even through the red haze of my rage, I knew I would never hurt my people. Evan! Nikolaus spoke calmly as he drew my focus back to him. What? I growled, a bit irritated I'd been interrupted from my thoughts. Look at your hands, the Prince of Light replied with an amused smile on his face. Why the hell are you smiling? I frowned, just as I looked down at my hands. Oh. 
Crimson flames licked at my fists, and they rose and curled up around my forearms as they gave off a savage heat. I was holding fire in my hands. The fire I had been wanting and desiring for so long. The fire I'd inherited when I'd been adopted by Ruslan as his heir to the house of Hatra El Shamash. A brutal grin stretched across my face. Now, I really was going to burn this castle to the ground. Chapter 14 Crimson flames licked at my flesh, but they didn't burn me. The enchanted fire just drifted over my skin as if it were a glove, and it fit me perfectly. Although the fire mimicked the deep rage I felt, it wasn't out of control. It was eager, but well-behaved. All I had to do was think of it being extinguished, and the fire disappeared. It was almost odd to think of it as a well-trained dog, but that's what it was. A part of me knew it behaved like this because of the sword that hung from my hip, since in that sword lay the knowledge of all the previous rulers of Hatra El Shamash. But it was still pretty awesome. Let's go! I waved for my fellow noble of the sword to follow me out of the hall. We should see what we can get our hands on before we leave this wretched place. It's the darkness and cruelty of everything that happened here, Nikolaus explained as he fell into step next to me. The walls will always remember the death that plagued this castle. Is there a way to wash away those stains? A part of me didn't want to destroy the castle. If we can, it could serve as a perfect outpost for Hatra in the mountains. There's a thousand years' worth of innocent blood shed here, Nikolaus replied softly as he stopped in front of a column and placed his hand on it. To completely purify this castle would take centuries, and even then I'm afraid the evil wrought here has sunk into its bones. It would haunt whoever would inhabit this place. Then destroying it is our only choice, I gritted my teeth as we came back to my original desire. This castle is going to go up in flames, and the green glass sect will never be able to use it again. To purify this place with fire, Nikolaus sighed, as he stepped away from the column with a melancholic expression. An apt end for such a place as this. Perhaps then the gods will take pity upon this land and put a stop to this pointless suffering. What's wrong? I stopped Nikolaus and glanced at his depressed face. Are you thinking about the children we found? If you are, we will get justice for them, and they will rest in peace. It's not just the children. Nikolaus's silver eyes glittered with suppressed anger, and exhaustion lingered behind the rage. I've spent my whole life fighting the seeds of corruption left by the demons. I've held back the expansion of the breach, and I've fought the poison of the miasma. Even so, through all of that effort I put into protecting our people, it wasn't enough. The poison of the demon world has somehow seeped past our defenses and into our very homes. Nikolaus felt the burden of it on his shoulders. I wasn't going to let him shoulder it by himself, though, no matter how many times I would have to remind him. Hey, listen to me, I began as I placed my hands on his shoulders. If you weren't at the breach and fighting the demons, there might not be an Anadi left. You all did everything feasibly possible to protect our people. You did absolutely nothing wrong. Besides, you have me on your side now. Those demons and the sick assholes who were behind this have another thing coming to them. You have wrought miracles in the city of Hatra, Nikolaus shook his head, and a faint smile appeared on his youthful face. Things won't remain the same in our world. Exactly. I smirked as I pulled him to walk alongside me. You guys have another ace up your sleeves with me on your side. Things are going to get interesting from now on, and it's just like I promised the king. I'll purge Rama of the poison festering underneath the surface. I won't let a single guilty person get away. No one thought the Sword of Healing would ever return. Nikolaus fell into an easy step beside me, and the anger in his silver eyes slowly faded away. But now even the city of Hatra has returned to us thanks to you. Evan? Yeah? I glanced at Nikolaus from the corner of my eyes. What's up? 
Called me Nike, Nikolaus replied quietly. You're going to be family to me soon enough, and I couldn't have asked for a better comrade in arms. I blinked at Nikolaus for a moment, surprised by the sudden request for me to call him by his nickname. Apparently, it seemed like it was a big deal, especially since this was the first time I'd even heard a nickname be mentioned in this world. But if Nikolaus wanted me to call him Nike, I'd do it. Nike. I tested the nickname and tilted my head to the side and thought, doesn't that mean victory? There was a loud burst of laughter from Nike and he brought up his hand to cover his mouth in an attempt to stop his laughter. I guess he wasn't expecting my comment about his name, or it had somehow diffused the rest of his tension. It does. Nike laughed into his hand as he closed his eyes. Victory on swift wings is what my name is meant to be. The light that will ensure victory in battle no matter what. Well, now that light has a mighty dragon by his side. I teased as we came to the door leading to the courtyard. Our enemies will cower before the mighty Prince of Light and the Black Dragon of Hatra. What, you're going to let them run away? Nike shook his head in amusement as we walked into the castle courtyard. Of course not, I corrected him easily. I said they would cower before us. While they're cowering, we wipe them out like we're stepping on bugs. Just like the castle, Nike added. It'll be gone before the sun falls tonight. Damn straight it'll be gone, I nodded before I frowned. Everyone should be done getting everything out of this place. I'll check up on them. I'll keep watch, Nike replied, and his power washed all over the courtyard. Thanks, I said absently as I turned my focus to my own power. I poured my magic into my hand and watched as it took a solid shape before my very eyes. A tiny crystalline dragon formed in my open palm, and it tilted its head up at me. Every time I created these dragons, I couldn't help but marvel at how beautiful they were. I nodded at the little dragon, and it flew off into the castle in search of our comrades. There was nothing to do but wait for everyone to come back out, so I closed my eyes and let out a soft sigh. There was no way I could have expected to find mountains of mummified children. Never in a million years could I have thought there would have been that many children kidnapped and then killed. Originally, I'd thought about leaving some of the green glass sect alive when we found them, since there had to be scholars and researchers who could be of use to Inati. But now, there was no way I was going to leave even a single one of them alive. My lord! Dagon's voice reached my ears. Yes? I blinked open my eyes to see my comrades filing out of the entrance to the courtyard and toward Blue Willow. We have everything stored away, Dagon replied quietly as he came to stand in front of me. We're ready to travel back to Atra on your command. Get everyone on board and let's get in the air. My expression hardened as I nodded. I'll destroy the castle once we're up there. My command carried throughout the courtyard and it didn't have to be repeated. Nike and I were the last to board the airship, and when we did, Blue Willow shot straight up into the sky. The castle grew small beneath us, and I concentrated on my anger. It was a righteous anger that had first made my fire come to life, and I knew my current fury would be what would bring it back again. And I was right. Bright, crimson flames came to life in my hands and around the base of the castle. They slithered all along the walls of the structure I wanted to destroy, following the path of my intent. Burn it all down, I commanded the flames as they curled up around the castle. Leave nothing behind. The enchanted fire responded to my words, and it shot up around the walls. It licked furiously at the stones and stained them black with ash with every passing moment. The strength of the fire also continued to rise until it almost melted the beige rock of the fortress. Only almost, though, they weren't strong enough yet to do that. I had to keep pouring power into the flames, and I would until the castle was nothing but a soot mark. Strangely, it wasn't exhausting, and I knew I was tapping into that additional well of power provided to me by the Sword of Healing. The flames spread around the castle, and it was like my senses were spreading out around the fortress. 
I could sense the way the wood inside of the castle was being consumed, and I grinned. Should we continue back to Hatra? Anton asked as he leaned on the railing and looked down at the flames. No, I replied quickly. We're going to stay until the castle is burned to the ground. I wasn't going to be satisfied if I didn't see this castle reduced to ash with my own eyes. It was a primal urge inside of me, like the need to breathe in order to live. Soon enough, the castle began to crumble in on itself. The weight of the stone wasn't enough to hold the fortress up anymore without its wooden supports. I pulled at the rock surrounding the castle with my stone magic, and the mountain began to swallow up what remained of the structure. The stone shifted as if it was malleable clay, and then it merged into the mountain range. Nothing was left behind. There was no trace there ever was a castle there, let alone a ruin. I'd erased all evidence of the green glass sect left on this mountain, just like I wanted. Now, all that was left was to erase the green glass sect entirely, and I couldn't wait for their blood to bathe my claws. I nodded to Anton, and then Blue Willow ascended higher up into the air. We flew back the same way we came, only this journey was much quieter. While we had accomplished what we'd set out to do, we were coming back with a much heavier burden. There was no way we could joke around and laugh. Not until we got the children back to Hatra. When Blue Willow landed next to the massive Blue Tree Guild airship gently, I was the first one to get off, and I didn't even wait for the ramp to be lowered. I simply jumped off the railing, happy to have the earth of my city underneath my feet again. I rubbed the back of my neck as everyone got off Blue Willow and couldn't help but wrinkle my nose. Somehow, the smell of mummified harpies had clung to our clothes. There wasn't much gore or ash on our clothing, surprisingly, but the overpowering smell was still there. Everyone! I called out to get the attention of my comrades as they milled around me. Don't worry about dropping off what you recovered. Go take a bath and get some food in you. Are you saying we stink, my lord? Anton called out from where he leaned against Blue Willow's hull. Yes, you smell disgusting. I pinched my nose as I mock glared at the wolf. Especially you, Anton. I could smell you half a country away. Hey! Anton sputtered in pretend shock and acted as if he was wounded by my words. How can I live if my lord talks about me like that? I can't go on like this anymore. Then go take a bath! <laughs> Leon laughed as he shoved the pouting wolf demi-human. Yeah, you stink too, Dagon added as he nudged Leon. You should both go take a bath. Meanwhile... I am pristine. Pristine, my ass! Anton growled as he locked his arm around Dagon's neck and ruffled the younger boy's hair. You look a right mess! I couldn't help but snicker at the sight, and next to me, Nike shook his head. Are they always like this? Nike asked with a slight smile. They seem to be getting along quite easily. Honestly, I admitted to him, this is the first time I've seen the three of them together like this. There's a first time for anything, though. I would have added more, but just then I sensed someone running towards us. It was strange, considering it was late in the afternoon and there wasn't anyone milling around outside of the Blue Tree Guild airship. Who is that? Nike nodded to the entrance where a blue-haired fox girl ran in. That's Afra, I replied absently as I waved her over to us. She works in the farms. My lord! Afra came to a skidding stop in front of us and panted as she tried to catch her breath. You've returned just in time. Something terrible happened. I tried to stop him. Afra, calm down and take a deep breath. I brushed her hair away from her face and froze at the sight of the blossoming bruise on her cheek. Who did this to you? Who hurt you? My lord, I couldn't. Afra glanced up at me and she broke down into sobs as she fell to my feet. It's okay, I whispered as I knelt in front of her. I've got you. All at once, I noticed there was more than one bruise on her cheek, so I quickly scanned her for more injuries. Wounds, broken rib cage, two left ribs, bruised cheek, minor poisoning. My magic pinpointed exactly where she was harmed without any of the extra information I usually got, probably because I was only focused on her physical injuries. 
I poured my healing magic into her and concentrated on those exact spots. While I healed those wounds, I changed a bit of my power from healing her to comforting her. Afra needed to be calmer if she was going to be able to tell me what had happened and who had hurt her. One of the lords from Lady attacked us! Afra sniffled as she blinked away angry tears. The one called Alexi. He stole the Orcalum weapons and armor Natalia made. Some of us got hurt stopping his escape. We didn't know he was so strong. Alexi did this? I asked, and then I took in a breath to calm the anger that was threatening to rise up again. Okay, start at the beginning. Truth be told, I didn't like the implications of what little Afra had already said. Stealing the Orichalum, even if it belonged to Hatra, would be considered as treason against the royal family. A loyal subject of King Rodion wouldn't do such a thing. So what was Alexi thinking? I haven't... I haven't learned all of their names yet. Afra confessed as she fiddled with her hands. The architects were just outside of the main gate and doing experiments with the earth. I was curious, so I joined them, especially since they were making terraces for the farms. We were talking, and they asked to see the farms we have right now inside of the city. I was leading them to the farms when we passed the smithy, and... And... And, I prompted her gently, what happened when the three of you got to the smithy? Natalia was unconscious and tied up, and there was so much blood, I thought she was dead. Tears threatened to fall from her eyes again, but Afra held herself together. We made sure she was fine, and that's when I realized everything was gone from the smithy and its storehouse. All the weapons and armor and beautiful things she'd made, they were all gone. I glanced over at Nike to see how he was taking this accusation, but instead of only anger, there was also concern in his eyes. All of the concern was directed toward the fox demi-human in front of us, and I could sense the anger wasn't for anyone here. No, the anger in his eyes was for Alexi. How did you know it was Alexi and not someone from the outside? I asked Afra softly. Was there something left behind, or did he attack someone else? The others who came from Lady? Afra replied quietly as her blue hair hid her eyes from view. He attacked them when we tried to stop him. Lady Julia and Lord Ruthlin managed to wound him, but he was so powerful. It was almost like he was a demon. He had these strange skeletons he summoned, but they looked as if they were almost alive. Those things still had flesh on them. They were so terrible to look at. There's also more wounded than just the people from Lady and your parents. Lord Moskal and Maxim are tending to them in the infirmary right now. The rage inside me rose to furious heights the moment she said Alexi hurt my people, but I wasn't far enough gone to miss what she didn't say. My parents had fought against him and ended up being wounded from the fight, but she didn't say how badly injured they were. That worried me more than I wanted to admit. I didn't think we would be faced with a traitor so soon, Nike breathed out harshly as he ran his hand through his hair. Alexi has defended the city of Leti and Rama for years. I don't know what could have brought about this change in him to abandon his duties and morals. He was an asshole when we first met, I added as I gritted my teeth. But even I didn't think he was some kind of traitor. More like a stuck-up noble with a stick shoved up his ass. I'm sorry, Afra cried out suddenly, and her shoulders shook as she did so. Why are you apologizing? I brushed the hair from her eyes and noticed tears dripping down her cheeks again. This isn't your fault, Afra. He said we were trash. The fox whispered out. He said Hatra should have died and that we don't deserve anything we've been given. Trash like us should just lay down quietly and die. We shouldn't be allowed to even have something so treasured like Orichalum near us. I clenched my fists and almost heard the nerves snap inside of my hands when Afra said those words. Someone said my people were trash? Someone said my people should have quietly waited to die? Yeah, fuck that. I was going to find Alexi and rip his tongue out. First, though, I needed to take care of my people. 
There were wounded who needed to be healed, but vengeance would soon be mine. Chapter 15 I left Aphra in the care of Leon and Dagon. Even though she'd calmed down considerably, she was still frightened. Anton also stayed behind to check in with the Blue Tree Guild members in the main airship and see what had happened to the guards along the perimeter of the city. Nike was the only one to accompany me to find the wounded. I didn't want to risk there being an ambush and anyone getting caught in the crossfire, not to mention the risk of someone stealing Blue Willow to use as a getaway vehicle. Afra had only mentioned there being one traitor, but there was nothing wrong with being too careful. Have there been any changes in Alexei, even anything small? I asked Nike as we made our way to the infirmary. Anything you can think of that would help, or maybe something that was out of place? Not a single thing, Nike replied with a sigh. During our journey here to Hatra, he behaved exactly the same as I remembered. Wait, as you remembered? I glanced over to the noble, more than a little confused. You haven't been around him much? I've spent the last few years guarding the breach, remember? Nike shrugged and there was heavy exhaustion evident in that one movement. If Alexei changed during the time I was away, well, I wouldn't really know. He had a valid point, but that made me wonder who picked Alexei to accompany Nike and the others here. King Rodion wasn't all-knowing. There had to be something and someone who'd slipped through the holes in his net. Between King Rodion, Aliona, Nike, and myself, we knew there was corruption within the kingdom of Rama. The question was, just who was the mole? Nike, do you know who picked your entourage? I asked, and picked up the pace. The infirmary was only a few more minutes away from us. No, everyone was already selected by the time I'd reached Leyte. Nike glanced at me with curiosity in his eyes. I had assumed King Rodion was behind those selected. Well, other than my two aides, they didn't have a chance to introduce themselves. They were the ones who looked like twins, both with golden hair and blue eyes. It's a given they would have come with me. But Alexei wasn't one of those aides? I asked him, just to make doubly sure. If I remember right, he didn't introduce himself as an aide. Alexei most definitely wasn't an aide, Nike shook his head, almost as if amused by the thought. He's too proud to bend his head to anyone he thinks doesn't deserve it. He was one of the scholar warriors of Leti. He split his time between studying the portals to the demon realm that were opening all over Rama and defending Rama from any demons who managed to slip through those cracks between our worlds. So by all accounts, a decent enough man, I murmured back as the infirmary came into view. Do you think he could have been under the control of the miasma? No. There was no room for misunderstandings in Nike's voice. I would have sensed the miasma inside of him, even for the short amount of time we were so close in the floating palace. It wouldn't have been able to escape anyone's notice, that is, if it wouldn't have been purified already by my power. Then he's doing this by his own free will, or he's being controlled in some other manner, I replied with a frown, as I stopped in front of the infirmary's entrance. You know what that means, don't you? You have no need to fear, Evan. Nike's pale eyes hardened, and it was like staring at diamonds. Traitors will be given no ground, and while establishing whether he did this of his own volition is important, capturing him takes precedence. I can't promise I'll go easy on him, I said as I placed my hand on the door and pushed it open. But we do need him alive. Thank you. Nike nodded and followed me into the infirmary. That is all I can ask for. The infirmary was filled to the brim with wounded. Every bed was occupied by someone, and there were more people propped up against the walls as they slumped to the floor. Moskal and Maxim, the two herbalists of Hatra, moved efficiently from one patient to the next. I could tell they had already spent some time stabilizing everyone in the room since I didn't sense anyone in mortal peril, and their clothes were stained with blood. A tangible sense of relief went through the infirmary when my wounded comrades noticed me in the doorway. I could hear as they murmured my name, and the tension faded from their faces. I was hope incarnate to them, and I wasn't going to let them down. In two beds toward the back of the infirmary were my parents, 
Ruslan was awake, but Julia was unconscious on the bed next to him. I made my way to them immediately. Even though there were no wounds on Julia, I was still worried, and my father was suffering from some minor head trauma. There was a large cut along the side of his head, and his hair was crusted with dried blood. Evan, thank the gods you're back, Ruslan grimaced as he propped himself up on his elbows. You came just in time. Stay down, Pops, I frowned as I pulled at my healing power and let it drape over everyone in the infirmary, healing all of their injuries. That's a nasty cut and concussion you had there. Well, he was fighting dirty, Ruslan snorted and leaned back down. The bastard took us all by surprise. At this point, we're going to have to suspect everyone who comes into our city. We're not going to have to go that far, I murmured as I grabbed a nearby chair and sat down in it. We'll figure things out once we get our claws into him. Afra caught me up on as much as she could, by the way. Well, what else is there to say? Ruslan sighed, shifted in the bed, and crossed his arms over his chest. That lord from Leyte decided our holy metal was better off in his hands. He knocked out Natalia and stole it all from us. We tried to stop him, and we almost did, but... What happened? I leaned closer at those words, curious as to exactly what had happened while I was tearing down the enemy's castle. Suddenly, there was the sound of shuffling feet, and the door leading to the infirmary's roof opened. Piotr stepped out from it, and there was a dark look on the older wolf demihuman's face as his ears laid flat on his head. It wasn't dark magic. Not exactly. It was closer to demonic power, he reported, and the muscles in his jaw twitched as he clenched his fists. It drained us all of our power and vitality, as if we were nothing more than sickly infants. As such, we were obviously no match against the skeletons he'd summoned to fight us. If it drained all of you, that power had to go somewhere, I remarked as I glanced back over the infirmary. It made sense, but at the same time, it didn't. I mean, all of that power can't just disappear. Oh, it didn't disappear, Ruslan replied darkly. It just went back into him so he could use it against us. Otherwise, he never would have defeated all of us. But the more we kept throwing at him, the stronger he got, and the weaker we became. Everything was rigged against us from the start. This is treason, punishable by imprisonment and death. Nike's silver eyes nearly darkened to an intense black from the depths of his rage. The use of demonic magic is outlawed throughout all of Rama and the other nations in our alliance. To use it is to betray all of humanity. Considering what we found at the castle, I added, this isn't looking so good for Alexei. Asshole is about to get fucked up. What castle? Ruslan frowned, and he seemed more than a little confused at my words. Did something happen, and I just missed it? I took a moment to think. With all of the events of the past few days, I wasn't sure if I'd filled my father in on finding the enemy's castle. Actually, now that I thought about it, I was sure I didn't. I went straight from finding out the castle even existed to meeting up with Valera and then straight to attacking the compound. Well, turns out the Green Glass Sect had a base nearby. I launched into a quick explanation. It was a castle in the mountains, and it was there for at least a thousand years. Was? Pyotr questioned with a quirk of his eyebrows. We destroyed it, I smirked back viciously. A little housewarming present for our enemies. They won't be bothering us for a while since their base is gone. This wasn't the time to mention the corpses of all the children we'd found. I'd leave that for after we came back with the missing Oracallum and the traitor. There'd been enough lost today. I wouldn't have expected anything less, Ruslan laughed as he relaxed in the bed. Now that we've settled that, I switched the topic back to the matter at hand. Does anyone know in which direction Alexei escaped to? He couldn't have gotten far, but that's a loose end we need to tie up. We can't let the Oracallum fall out of our hands, and I'd hate for demons to get their claws on it. Matching shudders went through everyone who heard me, and a quick look of terror flashed through Piotr's eyes as he shook his head. The background noise in the infirmary grew quieter, as if all the wounded were listening in on our conversation. I wouldn't be surprised if they were. 
He took off to the west. I don't know why, Pyotr frowned, and his ears twitched. It doesn't make any sense to go through the desert like that, even if he was trying to lose us. Going through the desert is too dangerous, and he's risking losing not only his life, but his spoils. Even the average cultivator and trained warrior would have a difficult time crossing it without any supplies. Who knows what demonic power he'll use to cross it, though? If we're lucky, the desert creatures will take care of him for us. To the west, my mind froze for a moment. Have Aliona and Laika come back from the aqueducts? No, Pyotr frowned before his face paled. We haven't heard any news from them since before Alexei stole the weapons and armor. Shit, I cursed under my breath as I stood up. Nike, come with me. You're going after them? Ruslan glanced up at me. Well, if it's the two of you, I'm sure he won't be able to escape. But what are you going to do about that power he used on us? I didn't really know what I was going to do about that, but I knew whoever struck first was going to win. So that was exactly what I was going to do. I wasn't going to give him even a single opening. I promise you, Pops, I said with a cocky salute in his direction. He's never going to see us coming. You can rest easy, Nike added as he moved toward me. Alexei will pay for his crimes, and Hatra will have justice. I vowed this on my honor as a noble of the sword. He will not escape. I slipped out of the infirmary before anyone could stop us, and I sensed Nike follow me quietly. He'd just sworn a rather heavy oath, and I was impressed by the depth of his dedication to Hatra. My instincts kept telling me I could trust Nike unconditionally, and I wondered if it was because of our duel the moment we'd met. Or perhaps it was because he was a fellow noble of the sword. Aliona had told me once that all the nobles of the sword were bonded together by their duty to protect Rama and humanity. If it was because of some unknown power, or because we got along like we were cut from the same cloth, I didn't care. At the moment, I was glad to have him with me. Nike, where do you think all those harpy children came from? I asked once we were out of earshot of the infirmary and there was enough space for me to change forms. I don't think there would be enough harpies in the mountains for them to have come from just there. It doesn't make any sense. Ska is the kingdom of harpies, Nike began slowly. But even so, it would be difficult to imagine so many would have gone missing without anyone noticing. But somehow that's exactly what has happened. Maybe the green glass sect is involved with merchants, I proposed as I changed from my human body into my draconic form. They'd be able to cross the country borders easily that way. My, Nike murmured, and excitement gleamed in his silver eyes as they trailed over my scales. We'd known you were a dragon before we made it to the city, but I must say this alternate form of yours is rather impressive. Granted, I've never seen a dragon up close, but if I were our enemies, I'd be intimidated. This is my true form. I was once a human, but now I am a dragon that just wears a human form when it's convenient. You'll have to explain to me how that works sometime soon, he chuckled. It sounds amazing. I flashed him a fanged grin. It is a pretty awesome perk. Now, hop on. We don't have any time to waste. I could see Nike was almost vibrating with boyish curiosity, but he forced it down as he took in a breath. My apologies, Nike said and took a step toward me. What you said about the merchants would make sense, though. They could hide the children within cargo or even disguised as slaves for the foreign countries who still participate in that practice. There could be a paper trail left for us to find if we dig deep enough, I added as I scowled at the ground. Nike... What are you waiting for? Just jump on. We can figure this out after we have Alexei. Ah, you're right. Nike shook his head and leapt onto my back in a swift movement. I got distracted thinking about the demonic power Pyotr mentioned Alexei had used against them. Their power went straight to Alexei, but I think I found a flaw in that ability. Oh yeah? I launched myself into the sky and flew over the buildings of Hatra. How about you share that theory? It's simple if you think about it, Nike called out, and his voice carried easily to me. There's only so much power Alexei will be able to contain before his body cracks under the pressure. 
If you aren't prepared to handle a wave of power, it'll come crashing down on you. Like what happened to me when we were at the walls with the architects. I grew excited as I followed his train of thought perfectly. If we overload him with power, he'll shut down and won't be able to fight back. Exactly. Nike's grin could almost be heard in his voice. Even if he isn't struggling with the amount of power he's absorbed so far, once we hit him with our strongest attacks, it'll be over for him. Alexei is strong, there's no mistake about that. Even so, he can't hold a candle to a noble of the sword, let alone two. So, a bit of revenge before we even interrogate him? I couldn't help but snicker as I flew over the walls of Hatra. He's definitely bitten off more than he can chew. The crystalline waters of the river came to view just as soon as I passed over the bluestone walls of Hatra, and the immense aqueduct system appeared quickly after. It was already late afternoon, and the air had begun to grow cooler. The change was more evident the moment we left the city because of how close we were getting to the river. Hopefully, Aliona and the others would be perfectly fine. They were probably at the end of the aqueducts by now, or should have already been on their way back if nothing had happened. Evan, there's fighting in the distance, Nike called out to me just as we passed one of the bends in the river. That fucker, I growled out since there was only one reason they would be under attack. I could see the Blue Tree Guild warriors fighting in a circle around Aliona. They were defending her from what looked like mummified skeletons that were disgustingly similar to the demonized harpies we'd fought back at the mountain castle. Just how many of those creatures are there? Disbelief colored Nike's voice as he unsheathed his sword. It's like they have a never-ending army prepared to fight us at every turn. Why hasn't Aliona moved to join the fight? I was confused as I realized my princess was still amidst the battling warriors. Her power should be able to get rid of those skeletons quickly. Aliona was kneeling in the very center of the circle, and her hands were clasped in front of her. A faint glow emanated from her body, and, even from this distance, I could see beads of sweat drip down her forehead. She's still enchanting the aqueducts, Nike groaned out. She won't be able to stop until the enchantments are finished. Fucking hell, I snarled. It's always the timing of everything we try to do. It's like these fuckers know exactly when we can't fight back at maximum strength. I flew faster toward the fight. Alexei would have to wait. I needed to save my people and my princess. Just as I closed in on the battle, a wave of skeletons went crashing into the desert sands, crushed to dust by the strength behind Laika's broadsword. My shadow fell over Laika, and when she glanced up at me, her beautiful face was covered in dust and ash. Evan! She cried out, and relief was clear in her eyes. Thank the gods you and Lord Nikolaus are here. What happened? Was it Alexei? I sat down near Laika and lashed out at some advancing skeletons with my tail. How did you know? Laika asked as she rested against my foreleg for a moment and closed her eyes. He betrayed us all, Nike explained as he jumped down from my back and pulled out his sword. He stole the Orakalum weapons and attacked the people of Hatra. Alexei even attacked his sworn comrades from the city of Leyte. He has turned his back on all of humanity. What? Laika's eyes snapped open as she glanced between us. It's true, I confirmed grimly as I scanned the approaching skeletal monsters. He drained every one of their power back in the city. Even my parents were left weakened by his treason. I glanced over at the two tight rings of warriors surrounding Aliona as she poured her power into the aqueducts. The first ring of warriors kept a majority of the skeletal creatures at bay, and the second ring cut off any stragglers from reaching her. It was obvious to anyone watching that the monsters were aiming for Aliona. Nike looked over at me, and I nodded. We were going to cut this attack down before anything happened to our comrades or my women. I dove into the horde of skeletal warriors and thrashed about, breaking them into pieces even as I poured my healing power into my allies. Next to me, Nike slashed at the skeleton creatures with his sword and turned them to ashes. Laika joined in with a savage yell. She cut through the advance of the creatures and broke their joints with her massive sword. 
Part of my draconic instincts wanted to snatch up my two lovers and fly them away from here and out of harm's way. But I knew Laika could handle herself, and I knew every last guild warrior would lay down their lives before they let anything befall the princess. So my job was to wipe out these monsters, and I took to it with relish. I could have switched back into my human form and dealt with the skeletons with my sword, like Nike was doing, but the bloodlust of battle had taken over my senses, and nothing could wreak havoc like a stampeding, pissed-off dragon. I let out an earth-shaking roar as another wave of skeletons tried to surge past the guild members to get to Aliona. Then I bounded forward, and my massive legs cut through the distance in seconds. My jaws snatched up a skeleton that had bowled over a wolf demi-human, and the creature's bones snapped between my sharp fangs as I shook my head back and forth. I spat out the brittle and dusty remains, and then I snarled as I swiped my tail to the side and took out another several opponents. Thank you, my lord, the demi-human I'd saved grunted as he pulled himself to his feet. There were bloody scratches scored down his face, and one of his ears hung on by a thread as blood matted his silver fur. Hold still, I growled as I bent down and touched my snout to his shoulder. Instantly, my healing power flowed through me and settled like a film of glitter against his skin. A moment later, he was completely healed. The wolf bared his fangs in a savage grin of gratitude, and then he leapt back into the fray with a furious howl. I crouched closer to the sand as I surveyed the battle in front of me. There were still hundreds of skeletons ambling across the sand, but my skilled comrades were making short work of them. I watched as Nike let out a primal scream and held his sword up into the air, and then a moment later a blinding white light flashed in the desert. When the light faded, fifty skeletons had been reduced to ash, and Nike was already on to his next victim. Well, I couldn't be outshone like that, could I? I gnashed my fangs as I lunged at the next passing skeleton, and I stomped the creature into the sand until nothing remained. Who's next? I snarled before I set my sights on my next target. Slowly but surely, the tide of the battle was beginning to turn, and the hundreds of mummified skeletons began to dwindle down to a more manageable number. Go after Alexei! Laika called out over the clamor of battle, and then she swung to hack at another group of mummified skeletons. We can protect Milady. My eyes immediately snapped to Aliona. The priestess had not yet moved. She was still kneeling behind the ring of guild warriors with her hands clasped, but now her brow was furrowed, and sweat dripped down her throat in rivulets. The primal draconic instincts in me wanted to argue. They wanted to stay and rip apart every enemy that threatened my lovers. But I knew Laika was right. The longer I delayed the hunt, the further Alexei got away. Nike! I roared out before I snapped up another skeleton and crushed it into nothing in my jaws. My fellow noble of the sword ran toward me and jumped onto my back without me having to say another word. Then he clung onto one of the spikes along my spine as I took to the air. Head back to the safety of the city the moment this is over, I growled to my people as I left a glittering wave of healing magic around them. Of course, my lord, a voice cried out, but I wasn't sure if it was Laika or one of the other warriors. We'll exterminate these vermin. I knew I could trust them to survive. The Blue Tree Guild were a hardy bunch. It'd take more than a horde of decomposing mummies to take them down, and once Aliona finished enchanting the aqueduct, she'd turn those mummies to dust in the blink of an eye. I know you will, I snarled as I turned toward the desert. You won't put Hatra or the Blue Tree Guild to shame. The desert's golden sands were inviting, and although the shifting winds had hidden any traces of Alexei, we didn't need footsteps in the sand. There was an imperceptible trail of leaking power in the air, and it was a heady mix, as if someone had poured out an entire liquor cabinet into one bottle. I realized this was the mixture of everyone's power, and I bared my teeth as I remembered what he'd done to my family. Following Alexei was going to be far easier than we had first thought, but there was something to take care of first. Nike! I called out my fellow noble. In case Alexei really is under someone else's control, they could be using him as their eyes and ears. 
We can't let them know we suspect he might be under someone's control. The game would be up if that happened, Nike agreed immediately. Cruelty and harshness it is. Well, it's not like I'll be faking that, I grunted, and there was the promise of pain in my voice. I'm going to be far from gentle with him. We traveled through the desert dunes and followed the trail of the power as it led us on a chase throughout the endless golden sands. But there was something strange about this hunt. It was like no matter how much we traveled or how fast I flew, there was no end to the trail. It kept lengthening and shifting in front of us, almost as if the trail was alive. Evan, we're going in circles! Nike called out to me as he pointed to a large stone half exposed by the desert wind. We've already passed that stone twice already. What the fuck is going on? I roared as I reared higher into the sky and looked for a better vantage point. I thought he was going to be weak from the power overdose. Why is it so difficult to find him? He might have something to help him, Nike replied as his energy pulsed out in front of us. It wouldn't be too much of a stretch. Alexei has already betrayed humanity as it is. Who knows what other demonic magic he may be using? We're never going to find him like this, I snarled. This desert is too vast, and I don't know it well enough to... I broke off as an idea suddenly hit me, and then I angled my wings to take us slightly to the west. Where are you going? Nike called out. Have you found him? No, I growled but I know someone who can. Chapter 16 The Crimson Canyons looked blood red in the light of the fading sunset, and I pumped my wings faster. This idea of mine was crazy, but perhaps it was just crazy enough to work. Evan, I don't understand, Nike shouted over the wind. Alexei's trail is faint here. He has not come in this direction. Good, I growled back. That means he's still alive for me to tear to pieces. What does that mean? The Prince of Light began to ask before he was cut off by an ear-splitting roar. I snapped my head up at the sound, and then bared my teeth at the sight of Valera in her dragon form perched on one of the reddish-hued cliffs. I angled my trajectory to land beside her, and crimson sand billowed in my wake. What is the meaning of this? Valera demanded the moment I touched down, and her golden eyes narrowed at Nike on my back. You might be welcome in my canyon, Evan, but I never said anything about filthy- Humans, yeah, whatever, I cut off the irate dragon. That doesn't matter now. I need your help. Oh? The other dragon sneered, and she tilted her head at me. And why should I care about that? Because this concerns you too. I snarled and gnashed my teeth. Now are you going to listen to me or not? This is about the man who tried to steal your sister's egg. Valera's nostrils flared at the mention of Olivier, and her pupils narrowed into cat-like slits. Go on, she grumbled, but I didn't miss the final glare she tossed at Nike. A man has attacked Hatra, I began. He was one of the scholars King Rodion sent to help rebuild the city. I was away on a mission, but when I returned, I discovered this man had attacked my people and stolen our weapons and stores of Oracalum. Petty human disputes, Valera scoffed. You said this had to do with the man who foolishly tried to steal from me? I'm getting there, I gritted out. Now, I don't have any definitive proof just yet, but this can't be a coincidental attack. I believe this man works for or is somehow tied to Olivier, the man who attacked you and the Green Glass Sect. And where is this man now? Valera asked as she flexed her talons against the stone beneath her feet, and I knew she was envisioning ripping this man to shreds. Hell, I was too. He's somewhere in the desert, I explained. After he attacked my people in Hatra and siphoned off their powers, he fled into the desert. We've been trying to track him, but... He's somehow been able to throw us off his scent. We suspect some kind of demonic magic is in play. We were flying in circles with no leads, but then I thought to myself, who knows this desert better than anyone? Say, someone who has lived here for 3,000 years. Valera huffed and flashed me her fangs. You came to me so I would be your hunting dog? Is that it? Look, 
I snapped as I took a step toward the larger dragon. I don't have the time to mince words with you. Every second we stand here is another second Alexi has to get away. I came to you for your expertise, and because we share common enemies and goals. Remember, if Hatra falls to the Green Glass Sect, or to demons, where are they going to look toward next? I jerked my head to motion to the canyons around us. Valera narrowed her eyes and opened her maw to respond, but I cut her off to add one last thing. And if Hatra falls and I am dead, I said as I met her gaze, who will be around to help you? The demons got to your sister's egg once, and it was only because of me and my people that you both survived. If we perish, so do you. So it's really in your best interest to put aside your pride and fucking help me. I panted after I finished my rant, and I felt Nike shift uncomfortably on my back. A long silence stretched between Valera and me, and not once did I look away from her golden eyes. I actually wanted to bring up the fact that I'd fucked her brains out recently, and if I died then she'd never get any more of that, either. But it wasn't the right point to bring up when Nike was listening. Then the massive crimson dragon huffed, and it may have been my imagination, but I thought I saw something almost like a smirk drift over her snout. We might make a dragon of you yet, Valera said as she trailed her eyes across me. Does that mean you'll help? I demanded. Fine, she sighed, and then she closed her eyes. A second of silence ticked by. What are you... I started to ask, but I was cut off as an enormous wave of power crashed into me. I stumbled under the onslaught, and I heard Nike groan on my back. Before I could ask if he was okay, the crush of energy suddenly abated, and I gasped at the absence. There, Valera said decidedly as she opened her eyes. I have found him. He is at the oasis I showed to you, Evan. You found him? I gaped. Are you sure? Valera snarled and snapped her fangs at me. You ask for my help, and then you doubt me? It was just a question, I retorted. How did you do that? That power was... Impressive, Nike chimed in over my shoulder, and Valera's golden eyes shot to the noble on my back. I am a three-thousand-year-old dragon, she sniffed. Impressive is the least of my attributes. Then her gaze snapped back to me. If you did not sully yourself with these humans, you could obtain this power too, little dragon. Of course, it would take you a few centuries. I rolled my eyes at her bigotry. Thanks for the advice. Hm. Valera grunted, and then she began to turn away and spread her wings. Wait! I called out after her. Where are you going? You asked for my help, and I have given it to you. The crimson dragon replied as her eyes narrowed at me. I have told you where this traitorous human is located. I never said I would aid you in apprehending him. You do what you must for your people, and I'll do what I must for mine. Before I could reply, Valera buffeted her wings and shot up into the sky. The fading light of the sun glinted off her crimson scales as she wheeled overhead for a moment, and then she glided in the direction of her cave. Well, she's charming, Nike muttered on my back. She's not all bad, I replied as I watched her massive form disappear. I knew she was going back to her cave to check on her sister's egg, and as much as her presence would help us on this hunt, I couldn't begrudge her decision. As she said, she would do whatever it took to protect her people, and now it was my turn to do the same. You know where this oasis is? Nike questioned. Yeah, I said, so hold on. Then I spread my own wings, took to the air, and directed myself toward the oasis. Alexi, here we come. I flew faster than before and ignored the trail of power we'd been following through the desert dunes. There was nothing leading to the oasis but I had a theory. Nike, I think I figured it out, I exclaimed. That power trail is leading us away from where Alexi is actually located. It's a false lead. And we were meant to chase it into the heart of the desert while he recuperates at the oasis. Nike growled back, and his power flared all around us. Exactly, I laughed darkly as I soared over the desert dunes in the direction of the oasis. And that's where we'll catch him and make him pay for everything he's done. Be careful not to kill him, Nike added. Why? 
I asked, as I crested over a particularly large dune. I mean, I wasn't going to since death would be too merciful for him. We still need to recover the orichalum from him, Nike explained quickly. If he dies before we do, we might never get it back. We don't know if he's already handed it over to someone or if he's hidden it somewhere. Even if it's hidden away in his spatial storage, it would take us days, if not weeks, to break into it. Well, fuck! I groaned as my power lashed out around me at those words. That just makes things more complicated now! Just then, we came to the same oasis Valera had brought me to once before. The sun had finally set, and the moon glittered off the pool of water like a diamond hung in the sky. Right on a small dune in the oasis was Alexi. With my enhanced eyesight, I could see his face was pale and his eyes bloodshot from the power overdose. Nike was right. He was already suffering the after-effects of absorbing all of that power from my family back in Hatra. The question was whether or not he'd be able to fight against us, but no matter what happened, we had to recover him. What a coincidence, I growled as I flew toward Alexi. Were you just out for a stroll in the desert? Alexi slashed his hand in the air between us, as if summoning something from the sky. All that happened was a fizzle of power, like an outlet had short-circuited in a thunderstorm. It was really quite underwhelming. I swooped down lower toward the lone man, and I felt Nike shift higher up on my back. Nothing to say in your defense, Alexi? Nike shouted and I could feel his rage like a fire between my shoulder blades. "'Go ahead and die!' Alexi snarled angrily, and then he made another gesture that formed a bolt of poisonous-looking lightning. The purple and putrid beam of energy shot straight toward us, as if it was a GPS-guided missile. "'Well, now that's just rude!' Nike said over my shoulder as I dodged the bolts of magic. "'You okay back there, Nike?' I asked." But before he could respond, Alexi shot another bolt of lightning at us. I bared my fangs and pulled up my own lightning power from the depths of my spiritual sea. A black beam of energy shot out from me, and it collided with Alexi's lightning with a clap of eardrum-shattering thunder. I gritted my teeth as I poured even more magic into my attack. He was much more powerful than we'd anticipated, and I realized that first aborted attack was a ploy to draw me in closer. He was clever, I'd give him that, and because he had siphoned energy from the most dangerous people in Hatra, I knew he was not someone to be underestimated. But slowly, my lightning began to overtake the traitor's own spell, and I watched with a dark glee as his attack was shoved further and further away. Alexi might have the backing of some demonic power, but I had not only the Sword of Healing to rely on, but even Asher's power to back mine up. Not to mention, it was two against one. He thinks he's quite clever, but he's a clawless cat, Nike laughed, and then he leapt from my back and landed gracefully on the sand. Nevertheless, a cat we'll put down, I replied back with a thunderous growl. I'll watch your back. In one smooth movement, Nike unsheathed his sword and went on the attack. His power exploded around him, and he looked like a silver sun to my eyes. While I doubted Alexi would be able to overcome Nike in combat, I still poured healing magic into my brother-in-arms to prevent any power drain. We didn't know what other tricks the traitor had up his sleeves, after all. As if he could read my thoughts, Alexi started to laugh maniacally, and the bright light that surrounded Nike began to fade. I could see a scowl etched across Nike's face as Alexi siphoned his power, but he hefted up his sword regardless and lunged at the crazed noble. There was another ear-splitting crack of thunder, and then a bolt of white and purple energy exploded out of Alexi. Nike dove out of the way just in the nick of time, and he barrel-rolled across the sands. A moment later, Alexi's attack disappeared, and in its wake was blackened sand and sparkling glass. If Nike had been hit by that bolt, he would have been vaporized. Fuck this guy! I snarled, and rage boiled up in my gut like an erupting volcano. A moment later, a torrent of crimson flames shot from my open maw, and a fireball half my size tore across the sands toward Alexi. 
The bastard dodged the attack at the last second, but I wasn't going to let him get away. I bunched up my legs, spread my wings, and shot up into the sky. With two strokes, I was already several stories overhead, and I pinwheeled through the air as I closed in on Alexei. I could see the noble bare his teeth as he squared his stance and turned to face me. And as much as I hated him, I had to say he had balls. But I was still going to melt the flesh from his bones. As I soared over Alexei, I strafed the ground around him with crimson fireballs. The heat felt like a warm summer day on my scales, but I could tell by the way the sand was melting that the flames were searing. Alexei attempted to dodge a few of the attacks, but he was too slow on the last one, and he let out a blood-curdling scream as the bottom of his left leg caught on fire. He tumbled into the sand, and another fireball crashed down on top of him. I grinned in victory and swooped down for the kill, but then the smoke cleared and I saw Alexei snarling up at me from the ground. His hand was singed, and it looked like he was impaled by molten glass in multiple places. But I didn't have the time to be sure, because then he made a motion with his hands, and a fireball shot toward me at the speed of light. I barrel-rolled out of the way at the last second, and the tip of my wing nicked the top of a dune. I began to spiral, but I managed to right myself before I could slam into the sand. My landing was a little bumpy, but as I skidded across the soft sand, an idea came to me. Absorb this, you piece of shit! I snarled. Then I pulled up my stone power from deep beneath my spiritual sea. The sand before me began to ripple like water, and I shoved all my energy and rage into this attack. The dunes exploded as a wall of sand arched up into the sky, at least fifty feet tall, and I watched as Alexei looked up at the encroaching wave. I let out a roar, and the sand shot toward the noble like a force of nature. The desert shook, and a boom split the air, and the sand smashed back into the ground, and I bared my teeth as I imagined Alexei broken to pieces under the half-ton of desert I'd just dropped on him. It's not over yet, Nike said as he suddenly appeared at my side. What are you talking about? I asked and glanced at him from the corner of my eye. He might have been able to siphon our powers, but he can't absorb a wall of sand. I wouldn't be too sure, Nike muttered, and then he lifted a hand to point. I followed his line of sight and gaped at what I saw. The sands had resettled, though some of the vegetation around the oasis had been churned up in my attack. But that's not what I was staring at. Alexei stood hunched over in the same place he'd been before, and his shoulders heaved up and down as he panted for breath. He definitely didn't look smashed to pieces, and I snarled in anger. He's a fucking weasel, I spat. He keeps wiggling out of everything we throw at him. I believe he has help, Nike replied with a considering tilt of his head. But it looks like this help comes at the price. I was about to ask what he meant. But then Alexei moved, and I zeroed my sights in on him again. Nike was right. Alexei was looking worse for wear. His skin was pale and wan, even in the bright moonlight, and he was drenched in sweat. His eyes were wild and crazed, and blood leaked from their corners, as well as from his nose and the corners of his mouth. Whatever enabled him to absorb our powers has a limit, I realized. Okay, new plan. We attack in tandem, pour everything into one blow. We overload him like a circuit board. Eh, what? Nike asked with a confused frown. Nothing, I replied quickly. We just need to overload him with power. Do we still want him alive? Nike inquired as he lifted his sword again. I bared my fangs in a soundless snarl. Honestly, I said, I don't care at the moment. I'm just fucking tired of this guy. If we can get some answers from him, fine. If not, we'll find them some other way. Agreed, Nike murmured darkly, and I felt the air go supercharged as he began to summon his power once again. On the count of three, I growled as I pulled at my own spiritual sea. One, two, three! As I shouted the last number, the night sky was split by blinding light. 
Nike had once again turned into a silver sun, and my black lightning arced through the air as it raced toward Alexei. Come on! I heard the crazed noble shout, and then our attacks slammed into him with the sound of the world cracking in two. I screamed as I dumped more and more power into my attack, and I could feel Nike do the same beside me. I couldn't see him since the desert was nothing but pure white glow now, but I could feel his energy press down on me like an oppressive weight. The moment seemed to stretch on forever, but then the light disappeared in the blink of an eye. It took a moment for my sight to adjust, but when it did, the three moons of Anati glowed in the sky, outlined by a million stars, and Alexei lay crumbled in a blackened crater of sand and molten glass. I went to take a step forward, but my talons stumbled in the sand, and the sky pinwheeled overhead. Careful, I heard Nike grunt beside me. We just unleashed a considerable amount of power. No shit, I huffed, before I jerked my massive head at the crater we'd created. Think he's alive? Only one way to be sure, he said. Yup, I agreed. But we can't go stumbling over there like drunkards. I'm not letting him pull a fast one. Just give me a moment. I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and sent out a call into my spiritual sea. You summoned me, my lord? Mariah's voice echoed in my mind. I'm a little tapped out at the moment, I explained to the spirit sword. Would you mind lending me your power so I can heal myself and Nike? Of course, the spirit purred. I only live to serve you. As my wielder, you may have all that I am. Thank you, I replied, and then I opened my eyes as I felt a warm rush flow through me. Within moments, I felt completely rejuvenated. I glanced to my side, and Nike was enveloped by a film of silver glitter. He looked up to me as it faded, and an easy smile split his face. Tell Mariah she has mine and Anya's gratitude, he said, and I dipped my head in response. Anything to help my dear sister Anya, Mariah said. She says you're welcome, I relayed before I turned back to the blackened crater twenty yards away. Now I think we have some unfinished business to attend to. Nike nodded silently, and then the pair of us stalked across the sands toward our prey. As we approached the crater, I sent out a tendril of my healing power to see if Alexei was even still alive. Surprisingly, I found a heartbeat but the rest of his vitals didn't look too great. We reached the edge of the blackened hole, and Alexei glared up balefully at us from its center. I smirked at the pitiful sight, and then I stomped one of my massive forelegs into the ground. A pillar of stone shot up directly beneath Alexei, and it propelled him into the sky like a rocket. He shot up for about a hundred feet before gravity grabbed a hold of him again, and then he crashed into the sand several yards away. Damn, it felt good to be an overpowered dragon with a magic sword of ass-kicking. Nike strolled toward his traitorous comrade at a leisurely pace. I made to follow him, but then a flash of movement caught my eye. Watch out! I tried to warn, but Nike was several moves ahead of me. His power rushed out of him in another wave of pure white light, and Alexei stumbled and nearly dropped the dagger in his hands. Before the mangled noble could recuperate, Nike was on him in a flash. Alexei managed to clumsily parry one of Nike's attacks before he stumbled backward underneath the weight of Nike's power. Then he sent out another fizz of power, barely more than sparkles of electricity toward us. None of that, I snarled. Then I jumped into the air, swooped down, and slammed Alexei into the sand as I pinned him between my front talons. I felt his collarbone and much of his upper back snap under my weight, but I pumped a tendril of healing power into him so he wouldn't die. My instincts were screaming at me to tear out his throat and rip his body to shreds. All I had to do was just dig my talons into his body. His soft flesh would give way to crimson blood, and the desert sands would be stained by it. With barely a twitch of my claws, all of his sins would bleed out of him but I wouldn't be able to get my revenge on him. He would die quickly rather than live on in pain and torment. 
I pride myself off him so I wouldn't do anything rash and press down on Alexei with my power instead. Alexei, really? Nike sounded almost disappointed as light seeped from him and swirled around Alexei. I only snorted as I allowed my power to encase Alexei and push him down further into the sand. It was like pressing down on a pillow. There was absolutely no resistance, and I was certain that if I just added a little more power, Alexei's neck would snap. I did nothing wrong! Alexei cried out and gasped under the pressure of our power. He coughed, and blood dripped from his lips. The divine metal deserves to be in worthier hands! Oh, really? I hissed as I used my power to press him down further into the sand. If I'm not wrong, you not only stole from a dragon, but you just committed treason against Rama. Both are very stupid mistakes. Am I right, Nike? I am a lord, a noble! Alexei tried to stand up, but he only shuddered more underneath my power. You can't harm me without a trial. If you hurt me, everyone will call you a tyrant or worse. Be quiet, Nike growled at Alexei. You explicitly ignored King Rodion's command, and you've stolen from our future prince. You're lucky to have kept your head. By all rights, we should kill you right here and now for all your crimes. The only reason we won't, I added coldly, is because there's answers you can provide us. So remember that the only reason you're still alive is because you're useful to us. You should be ashamed of yourself. Nike walked toward the trembling Alexei and frowned at him. The sword in Nike's hand shined brightly, as if it were a star come down from the heavens, and it pulsed angrily with every step he took. My lord, Alexei began as his body continued to shake from the overdose of power. This is a mistake. You're right, Nike nodded before he slammed the hilt of his sword into Alexei's temple. Bringing you here was the first mistake. Alexei slumped to the ground, and I knew he was knocked unconscious. There was a minute trace of power interwoven with that hit, and as I studied it, I realized its intent was to keep Alexei asleep. A rather nice show, if I do say so myself. I took another step forward and nudged him with one talon. How long will he stay asleep like that? For as long as we need him to, Nike replied as he turned to face me. For days or hours. Perfect, I growled loudly, and then I picked Alexei up none too gently with one of my clawed limbs. It would be annoying if he woke up and started screaming mid-flight. More than a little annoying, I'd say, Nike agreed as he climbed onto my back, though he'd probably faint if he woke up to find himself in your claws. I wonder why. I chuckled darkly before I stretched out my wings. I rose into the air with Nike on my back, and Alexei clutched tightly in my claws. I was careful enough not to crush him to death, but other than that, it wasn't a tragedy if he ended up with bruises and cuts all over his body. I'd heal him before he died, just so the process could start all over again. The sands of the desert rushed underneath us as the river and aqueduct slowly came into view. I scanned its banks in search of my fiancé and lover, but they were nowhere to be seen. I hoped they had made their way back to the city by now. As we grew closer to the walls and columns of aqueducts, I saw the remains of the battle sprawled out on the riverbank. Scorched and shattered bones littered the shore, and there was no trace of any fallen warriors from the Blue Tree Guild. It was evident they had won the battle, just as I knew they would. So I angled my body in the air, and we continued on toward my city. The river was a blur of blue, and all I could focus on was the blue stone walls of Hatra. My claws minutely tightened around Alexei's body, and I couldn't find it in myself to care. He had put my people and my city in danger. There was no way I could imagine myself ever forgiving him. Once I got all the information I wanted out of him, well, Nike did say the punishment was imprisonment or death, and I was definitely going to choose the latter. I crested over the top of Hatra's defensive walls and turned in the direction of the Blue Tree Guild airship. Dropping Alexei off in the brig was the first thing I was going to do. Or rather, dropping him onto the ground, period. 
He should be fine if he fell thirty or so feet. It's not like it would kill him, but it would make his stay in the brig that much more uncomfortable. As we neared where the airship was docked, I could see a group of warriors waiting stoically for us. Anton was at the forefront, and his arms were crossed over his chest tightly. I dove down until there were only thirty or so feet between the ground and me. Then I let go of Alexei's limp body, and he fell to the ground in front of the Blue Tree Guild airship. It was satisfying to see him crumble in front of all the warriors who wanted nothing more than to sink their claws into his flesh. Take him to the brig, I commanded, as I pointed at the traitor with one of my talons. We're going to pry all of his secrets out of him, and then I am going to kill him. Chapter 17 I stood in front of the Blue Tree Guild airship, surrounded by their warriors, and in front of me was the crumpled form of the traitor who had put my beloved city of Hatra at risk. My anger toward him had cooled down considerably, and I tilted my head to the side as I thought about what needed to be done now. Interrogating Alexei was the first order of business, but I wasn't going to be the only witness. It was a given that Nike was going to accompany me, but I wasn't sure who else from the council should be there, all things considered. All of the leaders couldn't be out of the public eye, especially since we'd just been attacked. We needed to maintain our people's morale. Get whoever can be spared from the council, I rumbled as I lowered my head to the ground. And bring my father from the infirmary. If you find Princess Aliona and Laika, bring them here too. Nike jumped down from my back and walked toward the unconscious Alexei. He nudged him with his foot and seemed satisfied when Alexei didn't react. And Lady Julia, shall we bring her here as well? Anton asked as he stepped forward and picked up the limp Alexei with one hand. I don't think she's awoken yet, but Lord Moskal should be able to wake her up. I couldn't help my wide smile at the sight of Anton carting Alexei around. The traitor dragged along the ground as if he was nothing more than a rag doll. He really didn't deserve any better treatment than that. No, he deserved the absolute worst treatment possible, and I was sure the Blue Tree Guild would be more than happy to oblige. No, let her rest. I took a step forward as I changed from my massive dragon body into my smaller human body. She can come visit him when she's fully rested. I'm sure she'll have a long list of grievances, and it would be better if she was at her best. Of course, my lord. Anton agreed with me before he nodded his head at two nearby warriors. You heard him. Go find the council members. The two Blue Tree Guild warriors, two young wolf demihumans, nodded before they took off at a sprint in the direction of the infirmary. Their gray tails wagged behind them as they ran, and they quickly disappeared from view. Anton, wait a moment. I frowned at Alexei's prone body and pulled forth stone to shackle his wrists together. That's better. Nothing wrong with taking another set of precautions, even if he won't wake up any time soon. Even if we accidentally bash his head against a doorframe? Anton glanced at Alexei with a dark grin on his face. He won't wake up, I reassured him, as I could already see the countless doorways Anton would bash Alexei's head against. Just try not to kill him before we interrogate him. That would be a waste of time and energy for everyone involved. Of course not, Anton called out as he glanced at me over his shoulder. He has far too much to pay for before he's allowed to die. This asshole hurt all of us, and he's not getting away with it. I lifted an eyebrow at the bloodthirstiness displayed by the usually relaxed Anton. It was like he was feeling all the rage and hatred I had felt earlier. Still, when I thought about it, his visceral reaction made sense since he was a wolf. A wolf could be just as vicious as a dragon was, and this wolf was loyal to a dragon. Wouldn't a bit of the master rub off on the servant after some time? Evan, bringing Aliona into the interrogation isn't a good idea. Nike stopped me just as I was about to walk forward. We can't let her join in. Why not? I frowned as I glanced over at him. It's not like she'll be frightened by it. She's fought in battles already, and she traveled half of Rama by herself. He is a traitor, and we don't know what he'll do. Nike's silver eyes darkened again, and now they were nearly pitch black. 
Just because he hasn't done anything to her in the time we've been here doesn't mean anything. We don't know yet if he was truly after the Oracallum, or if all of this was an intricate plot. You're right. I didn't think about that possibility. I drew in a sharp breath as my eyes narrowed. Even if he's chained and imprisoned, we don't know what he's capable of. But I don't think he would orchestrate all of this just to get caught like that in the desert. Doesn't make any sense. Neither does betraying humanity for the demons, Nike pointed out coldly. We have to operate on the assumption that he's had a plan for every eventuality, especially since he used demonic magic to fight against Hatra el Shamash. Demons have always been crafty and used convoluted plans to fight against humanity. Even when you think you have the upper hand, you could have been lured into the perfect ambush point by the demons. You have a valid point there. I conceded to his knowledge of how demons operated, since Nike had spent his entire life fighting them and knew them better than I did. Let's just get inside and get this interrogation started. Anton has already dragged Alexei into the airship. We aren't going to wait for the council to start? Nike tilted his head to the side as he glanced at me. Oh, we are. We're just going to get him a bit loosened up for the main event. I nodded for him to follow me up into the airship, and smirked darkly as we caught up to Anton. Also, is there a separate room we can use? I don't really want to do this in the brig in front of the other prisoners, even if they're still unconscious. Of course. We have separate rooms alongside the brig which would work perfectly, Anton replied. We can drop this sack of shit in there and break him down for however long it'll take, and no one in the brig will be disturbed by his screams. Absolutely perfect, I breathed as I wondered just what secrets Anton was keeping from us. Lead the way. My pleasure. Anton smiled darkly as he turned around quickly and smashed Alexei's head against the wooden hull of the airship. Quite the violent one, isn't he? Mariah laughed into my mind. I wonder if he was that violent before he met you, or if this is your influence on him. I only shook my head as I followed Anton into the airship and through the maze-like corridors of the floating base the Blue Tree Guild called home. The brig was in the deepest part of the airship, far away from the living quarters and entrance. This was maybe the third time I was heading to the brig, and even though the hallways of the airship were well-maintained and nearly identical, I was sure I would be able to find my way to it alone. Once we arrived in the corridor leading to the brig, Anton came to a stop in front of an inconspicuous door I hadn't seen before. It nearly blended in perfectly with the wall, and there were no door seams or even a handle. One moment there was just a wall, and then the next moment a door slid open to reveal a darkened room. Well, isn't this inviting? I followed Anton into the room and sat down at the wooden table shoved up against one of the walls. Quite cozy, perfect for our noble guest here. The Blue Tree Guild only provides the best for our patrons. Anton smirked back as he let Alexei's body fall limp onto the ground. And this is our number one room for our most honored guest. I can see, I laughed as I leaned back in my chair. Shall we begin? Just then, there was a knock on the door, and we all turned to face it. None of us had expected for the council members to arrive so quickly, but it only meant everyone would be involved in the breaking of the traitor we'd caught. Everyone except Aliona. I'll get it. Anton moved toward the door. I guess no one wanted to miss even a second of this. They must have rushed here, or a milady made a portal for everyone to pass through. No, I'll fill them in. I stopped him as I stood and walked toward the entrance. The two of you get started. Wake Alexi up and start making him as comfortable as possible. We will. Nike's voice was dark as he stepped toward Alexi's prone body. I nodded as I opened the door to see my father, Pyotr, and my two lovers standing in the hallway. Ruslan looked better than he did back in the infirmary. There was still a tiredness in his stance that would take time to go away, but fiery determination filled his gaze. I hear we've got a friend back in Hatra, Ruslan grinned darkly, and his fangs gleamed. We couldn't stay away and just had to be part of his welcome back party. Glad to see you're feeling better, 
I couldn't help the smirk that slid across my face at his words. Nike is waking him up. You got here just in time. Perfect. Ruslan practically purred as he stepped past me and into the room. I don't want to miss a single moment. Besides, I have to make sure he pays for what he did to not only Hatra, but to Julia as well. You did an amazing job capturing him so quickly. Pyotr patted me on the shoulder and nodded his approval. A dragon's nose is truly incomparable when it comes to hunting someone down. Alexei didn't do himself any favors either, I snorted. That siphoning power trick of his is neat, but it seems he bit off more than he could chew. Nike and I gave him a little power overdose and it was all over. Suddenly, a strangled scream echoed from inside the room, and Pyotr chuckled as he walked past me. The door slammed shut behind him, and I was left alone with Laika and Aliona. They were both covered in dust and dirt, but there were no visible wounds on their bodies. It was evident to me they had defeated the skeletons without anything going wrong or anyone getting hurt. A power overdose? Laika lifted an eyebrow in my direction before she glanced at the closed door. That sounds rather painful. How was he even alive? I'd say sheer luck, I admitted to them. I wanted to kill him when we found him. Even Nike was out for blood and ready to chop his head off. Nike is an honorable man. Aliona spoke softly as she clasped her hands behind her back. He upholds the laws of Rama. He is immovable when it comes to loyalty and integrity. Yeah, I noticed. I rubbed the back of my neck as I glanced at Laika. We're not going to go easy on Alexei. All we need is for him to be able to speak. If he's almost beaten to death, I'll just heal him enough so he won't die. That's more than he deserves. Laika muttered back as she crossed her arms over her chest. He betrayed not only our goodwill, but all of humanity. He should be torn apart by monsters and his corpse left to the elements. Took the words right out of my mouth. I laughed darkly as I nodded toward the door. Feel free to rip into him. No one is going to miss him. From what Nike said about his crimes, no one is going to be able to call us out on it, if we do kill him after everything's said and done. I do have to thank him for those skeleton creatures he sent after us. Laika growled as she walked toward the door and entered the room. For the few moments the door was open, more blood-curdling screams could be heard, and I wondered just how messy the interrogation was getting. Still, I wouldn't be surprised if they had gotten that far without physically harming him. The Blue Tree Guild's interrogators had managed to destroy one prisoner's mind through the use of magic already. Alexei has to face me for what he has done. Aliona added as her gemstone eyes sparkled with well-controlled rage. He's committed high treason before two nobles of the sword and his princess. There is nothing he can say to excuse his actions. Aliona, you aren't going in there. I stopped the Divine Princess from following after Laika. We need you to stay outside. You won't be involved with this. For a moment, I thought my princess was going to argue with me about my decision. Her eyes sparked with fire, and it was like an explosion had gone off inside of her. But the emotion disappeared quickly. Instead, she smiled brightly at me as she dropped into a shallow curtsy. If the Lord of Hatra El Shamash bids this princess to stay outside, she shall. Aliona closed her eyes for a moment and took a step back from me. It was your people and your city, after all, who were harmed during this situation. Aliona, wait! I grabbed her wrist and tugged her toward me. It's not like whatever you're thinking. I didn't explain myself properly. I just don't want you to get hurt. We still don't know who he's working for, or if he's doing this by his own will. Either way, he committed treason not only against Hatra, but against Rama. You're the princess of this kingdom, and a perfect target. I know. Aliona replied softly as she rested her head on my chest. I just hate not being able to do anything. You've done more than enough already. I pressed a kiss to her head as I wrapped my arms around her. You made sure the aqueducts were enchanted against everything, even while you were under attack by those skeleton mummy things coming out of the desert. I was only doing my duty. Aliona took a step back from me and smiled softly. Protecting my people, no matter what, is what I must do. And I will do it for as long as I live. 
For that to happen, you have to stay safe. I ran my hand through my hair and smiled down at her. So go back to the underground library, curl up with your research, and wait for me there. I promise I'll tell you what we find out myself. I'll hold you to that. Aliona nodded as she turned and walked down the corridor. I kept my eyes on her until she was far out of sight. I hadn't been lying when I said she needed to be protected because she was a prime target, but after thinking it over, I didn't want her to be present for this. My gut told me we were going to find out some pretty nasty things, and I didn't want her to hear them from Alexei's poisonous mouth. You made the right choice, Mariah's voice echoed inside of my mind. He is a poison that would only serve to torment her mind. What? I replied as I closed my eyes. Do you know something about Alexei you haven't told me? No, I don't know anything about him. There was the hint of a growl in Mariah's voice. But I don't have to know anything about him to know a traitor will always be cruel and speak words that will cut to the bone. He would have used her own honor against her, and perhaps even tricked her into doing something dangerous. Take his words with a grain of salt, Evan. I know this kind of traitor. They will do whatever it takes to weasel their way out of their punishments and end up in a position of power and comfort. I didn't reply, since it was easy to figure out what Alexei would use against Aliona. King Rodion, Aliona, and I had talked about this once. The nobles of the land wouldn't approve of me unless I showed them it was their only choice. It was just a pity this was going to be the first instance of that. I hadn't wanted to start this campaign with blood and violence, but if that was the way it was going to be, I was going to start it off with the bloodiest show these nobles had ever seen. With a sigh, I turned around and entered the room to see Alexei panting on his knees. His clothes were ripped and blood poured from angry cuts on his flesh. It was clear to see my family had already started his welcome party. As I was about to go back to my prior seat, I noticed something strange on his back. It was right underneath the blood and nearly looked like a bruise, but there was something wrong about the shape. I just couldn't pinpoint what exactly was off about it. Wait a minute, what's that? I pointed at the smudge of green on Alexei's back. Is that a stain or something? It can't be a bruise. My lord? Anton paused and glanced at me, and his ears shifted on his head as he wiped his bloody hands on his pants. There's something on his back! I walked closer to Alexei and squinted at the green shape. Right below his shoulder blade! It's a green tattoo in the form of a leaf. Lyka narrowed her eyes as she stepped toward Alexei. It's like the charms we found by the Orichalum mine. It's not to just die. There's power mixed in with the pigment. Nike frowned as he joined in on the study of the leaf tattoo. The structure of it is similar to the enchantments on the Blue Tree Guild's gorgets. I suspect he can communicate with people through that tattoo. And there's an enchantment so someone, possibly his immediate leader, will know where he is at all times. Want to tell us why you have the symbol of the Green Glass Sect tattooed onto your back? I frowned as I walked back to my previous seat and sat down. I'm only going to give you one chance. I won't tell you anything. Alexei's eyes were nearly red with anger, and his once handsome face was distorted by a scowl. You're only a lord from a destroyed city. You have no power over me. You're wrong there. I leaned back in my chair as I smirked at his words. I have your life in my hands, remember? So right now, I'm the one person you don't want to piss off any more than you already have. If I were you, I'd start talking. I nodded at Anton, and he started hitting the traitorous noble with rapid-fire punches. Laika also walked around him and lashed out periodically. Each hit left a nasty bruise on Alexei's flesh, and there were even some bruises where blood had broken the surface of the skin. Alexei was at the point of bleeding all over the room. Fine! Alexei cried out in between the strikes. I'll tell you! It's about time! I leaned forward as I waved Laika and Anton away from him. So, what are you fuckers planning to do with my city? This isn't just about your little city... Alexei laughed through the blood. We're playing the long game here, and there's a much bigger prize we're betting everything on. 
Then what's this big prize? I frowned as I went through the possible options in my head, but couldn't figure out what their end goal was. Can't you figure it out? Alexei mocked as he winced because of the pain he was in. You're the mighty dragon of Hatra el Shamash, wielder of the Sword of Healing. Listen, I don't really have a lot of patience right now. I rolled my eyes and leaned back into my chair. In fact, pretty much everyone in this room doesn't have a single iota of patience for you. So if you're smart, you'll just tell us instead of us having to beat it out of you, word by word and hit by hit. I think he's a glutton for punishment. Anton spoke up as he glanced over to us. Since we don't usually get this far, I have an idea that could make him speak. Yeah? I nodded for him to continue. Why don't you share it with the rest of us? Maybe one of us could add on to it and make it just perfect. Sounds like a plan. Anton grinned viciously for one moment. So here's what I was thinking. Instead of ripping the nails off his fingers, we'll start by removing all the veins from one of his fingers. Slowly, of course. Ah, like deveining a shrimp. I nodded along with Anton's idea. Fingers and shrimps tend to be of roughly the same size, so the process could be similar. Except, perhaps, this would be far more dangerous than preparing some shellfish. Exactly! Anton's tail wagged behind him. See? It's like you're reading my mind, Evan. We go finger by finger until all of them no longer have veins. Ruslan nodded from where he sat across opposite me. I have a question. Pyotr's gray eyes glimmered with violent mischievousness. What do we do once we've deveined all his fingers? Isn't it obvious? Laika shrugged her shoulders and poked at Alexei. Evan will heal him, and then we'll start the process all over again. Or, and this is just a suggestion, I offered up with a smirk, once we finish with his fingers, we move on to his limbs, maybe his arms, and then his legs. What do you think, too much? Are you all psychotic? Alexei cried out as he tried to shuffle away from us. You can't do that to me! We aren't psychotic, but we're very angry. I leaned forward again in my chair with a vicious smile on my face. So, why don't you just tell us what this big prize is, and you'll be able to keep all of your veins intact and in your body. What do you say? Alexei shuddered, but he gave me the information I'd asked for. The Green Glass Sect is planning on taking over Rama while the king is at the breach. It was like the whole room inhaled sharply at once. This most definitely wasn't the information I wanted, and I was happy I had stopped Aliona from coming in. I had no idea how this would affect her, or if she would go into shock from the knowledge. Risking the stability of her spiritual sea wasn't worth this. Are you stupid? Pyotr scoffed as he shook his head. King Rodion is like a god. What are you going to do when he comes back from the breach? Our master will kill him, and we will rule this world. Alexei's eyes took on a maniacal gleam. That man isn't worthy of the title of king. Instead of expanding and ruling the whole world, he's content to protect weaklings. You're wrong on so many counts, I don't even know where to begin. I stood up and walked toward Alexei. King Rodion being at the breach is the only reason your pathetic self is even alive to begin with. With that knowledge, you've somehow gotten it into your thick skull that he's a useless king? Not to mention, he's the most powerful man in the world, and you're just planning on killing him? Our master is growing stronger. Alexei continued to rant as he glared at me. With every passing day, his strength grows. This is more than a bit troublesome, Nike sighed as he paced in the room. I didn't think this could have been the cause behind Alexei's treason. To think they're planning on killing the king, it's unimaginable. We'll stop them before that happens. I glanced over at my brother-in-arms and threw him a confident smirk. Rama won't fall to the green glass sect. It'll just remain as a dream for them. You'll never be able to defeat the green glass sect. Alexei spat at me, and blood dribbled down his lips. We are everywhere, hidden among you. Our people are buried so deep, you'll never be able to uproot all of us. You've lost this war before it's even begun. 
That's where you're wrong. I shook my head as I rolled my eyes. By my count, I've already beaten you guys at least five times. And catching you, well, that's another win for me. Alexei had betrayed us, but his betrayal had opened up so many possibilities for us. There was a potential treasure trove of information inside of that poisonous head of his, and I wasn't going to let him die until we extracted all of it. Even if he was begging for death and half mad from pain, I would decide when he died and when we killed him. Well, I was going to toss his head at the feet of his precious master. I didn't care how powerful this supposed master of the green glass sect was. Hatra was mine, and they'd harmed my city and my people. Rama was going to be mine too, and they'd plotted not only against my country, but also against my future father-in-law. The green glass sect had hit three strikes already with this dragon, and I was going to tear them out of my world, root and stem, no matter what it took. I was going to destroy them all. End of Book 3 This has been Dragon Emperor 3, Human to Dragon to God, written by Eric Vall, narrated by Alex Perone and Marissa Parness. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.